Book One, Part Three of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume Five, Part Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume Five, Part Four, by François René de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book One, Part Three. At the time of the plague of Athens, in the year 431 before our era, already twenty-two great plagues had ravaged the world. The Athenians imagined that their wells had been poisoned, a popular fancy renewed in all contagions. Thucydides has left us a description of the Attic scourge, which has been copied among the ancients by Lucretius, Virgil, Ovid, Lucan, among the moderns by Boccaccio and Manzoni. It is a remarkable thing that, when writing of the plague of Athens, Thucydides does not say a word of Hippocrates, in the same way as he does not name Socrates, in connection with Alcibiades. This pestilence first attacked the head, descended to the stomach, thence to the bowels, lastly to the legs. If it went out by the feet, after passing through the whole body, like a long serpent, the patient recovered. Hippocrates called it the divine evil, and Thucydides the sacred fire. They both regarded it as the fire of the heavenly wrath. One of the most dreadful plagues was that of Constantinople, in the 5th century, under the reign of Justinian. Christianity had already modified the imagination of the peoples, and given a new character to a calamity, even as it had changed poetry. The sick seemed to see ghosts hover around them, and to hear threatening voices. The Black Plague of the 14th century, known by the name of the Black Death, took rise in China. It was imagined that it moved rapidly in the shape of a fiery vapour, while spreading a noxious smell. It carried off four-fifths of the inhabitants of Europe. In 1575, descended upon Milan the contagion which immortalised the charity of St. Charles Borromeo, Fifty-four years later, in 1629, that unfortunate city was again exposed to the calamities of which Manzoni has made a painting far superior to the celebrated picture by Boccaccio. In 1660, the scourge was renewed in Europe, and in those two pestilences of 1629 and 1660 were reproduced the same symptoms of delirium as in the plague of Constantinople. Marseille, says Monsieur Le Monti, was in 1720 concluding the festivals which had signalised the passage of Mademoiselle de Valois, married to the Duke of Modena. Beside the galleys still decorated with garlands and filled with musicians lay some vessels which brought from the ports of Syria the most terrible calamity. The fatal ship of which M. Le Monti speaks, having exhibited a clean bill, was for a moment admitted to pratique. That moment was enough to poison the air, a storm increased the evil, and the plague spread to the crash of thunder. The gates of the city and the windows of the houses were closed. In the midst of the general silence, sometimes a window was heard to open, and a corpse to fall. The wall streamed with its cankered blood, and dogs without a master waited below to devour it. In one quarter, all of whose inhabitants had died, they had been walled up at home, as though to prevent death from leaving the house. From these avenues of great family tombs, one came to open places in which the pavement was covered with sick and dying persons, stretched on mattresses and abandoned without aid. Carcasses lay half-rotten with old clothes mixed with mud. Other corpses stood upright against the walls, in the attitude in which they had expired. All had fled, even the doctors. The bishop, Monsieur de Belsens, wrote... They ought to abolish the doctors, or at least to give us abler and less timorous ones. I have had great difficulty in having one hundred and fifty half-rotten corpses, which were lying around my house, removed. One day the galley slaves hesitated to fulfil their funeral functions. The apostle climbed into one of the tumbrils, sat down on a heap of corpses, and ordered the convicts to proceed. Death and virtue went off to the cemetery drawn by vice and crime, filled with dread and admiration. On the Esplanade de la Tourette, beside the sea, bodies had been lying for three weeks, and these, exposed to the sun and melted by its rays, 
offered merely an infected lake to the sight on this surface of liquefied flesh only the worms imparted some movement to crushed vague forms which might possess human shape when the contagion began to relax m de belsens at the head of his clergy repaired to the church of the Acoul. mounting on an esplanade commanding a view of marseilles the harbours and the sea he gave the benediction even as the pope in rome blesses the city and the world what braver and purer hand could there be to bring down the blessings of heaven upon so many misfortunes it was thus that the plague devastated marseilles and five years after these calamities the following inscription was placed upon the frontage of the town hall resembling the pompous epitaphs which we read on a sepulchre massilia facensim filia romae soror carthaginis terror athenarum emula paris read on fair may 1832 the cholera starting from the delta of the ganges in 1817 has spread over a space measuring two thousand two hundred leagues from north to south and three thousand five hundred leagues from east to west it has wasted fourteen hundred towns and mowed down forty million inhabitants we have a chart tracing the conqueror's march it has taken fifteen years to come from india to paris this means going as fast as bonaparte the latter occupied almost the same number of years in passing from cadiz to moscow and he caused the death of only two or three millions of men what is the cholera is it a mortal wind is it insects which we swallow and which devour us what is this great black death armed with its scythe which crossing mountains and seas has come like one of those terrible pagodas worshipped on the shores of the ganges to crush us under its chariot wheels on the banks of the seine if this scourge had fallen in the midst of us in a religious age if it had spread amid the poetry of manners and of popular beliefs it would have left a striking picture behind it imagine a pole waving by way of a flag from the top of the towers of notre dame the cannon firing single shots at intervals to warn the imprudent traveller to turn back a cordon of troops surrounding the city and allowing none to enter or leave the churches filled with a growing multitude the priests by day and night chanting the prayers of a perpetual agony the viaticum carried from house to house with bell and candle the church bells incessantly tolling the funeral knell the monks crucifix in hand in the open places summoning the people to repentance preaching the wrath and judgment of god made manifest by the corpses already blackened by hell's fires then the closed shops the pontiff surrounded by his clergy going with each rector at the head of his parish to fetch the shrine of st genevieve the sacred relics carried round the town preceded by the long procession of the different religious orders brotherhoods corporations congregations of penitents associations of veiled women scholars of the university ministers of the almshouses soldiers marching without arms or with pikes reversed the miserere chanted by the priests mingling with the hymns of girls and children all at certain signals prostrating themselves in silence and rising to utter fresh complaints there was none of all this with us the cholera came to us in an age of philanthropy of incredulity of newspapers of material administration this scourge devoid of imagination came upon no old cloisters nor monks nor cellars nor gothic tombs like the terror of seventeen ninety three it stalked abroad with a mocking air in the light of day in a quite new world accompanied by its bulletin which recited the remedies that had been employed against it the number of victims that it had made how matters stood the hopes that were entertained of seeing it come to an end the precautions that had to be taken to ensure oneself against it what one should eat how one ought to dress and every one continued to attend to his business and the theatres were filled i have seen drunkards at the barrier seated outside the pot-house door drinking at a little wooden table and saying as they raised their glasses here's your health morbus morbus out of gratitude came running up and they fell dead under the table the children played at cholera calling it nicholas morbus and morbus the rascal and yet the cholera had its terrible side the brilliant sunshine the indifference of the crowd the ordinary course of life which was continued everywhere gave a new character and a different sort of frightfulness to those days of pestilence 
You felt uncomfortable in every limb. You were parched by a cold, dry north wind. The atmosphere had a certain metallic flavour which hurt the throat. In the Rue de Cherche Midi, wagons of the artillery depot were used to cart away the dead bodies. In the Rue de Sèvres, which was completely devastated, especially on one side, the hearses came and went from door to door. There were not enough of them to satisfy the demand. A voice would shout from the window, Here, hearse, this way! The driver answered that he was full up and could not attend to everybody. One of my friends, M. Pouqueville, on his way to dine at my house on Easter Sunday, was stopped at the boulevard du Montparnasse by a succession of beers, nearly all of which were carried by bearers. He saw in this procession the coffin of a young girl, on which was laid a wreath of white roses. A smell of chlorine spread a tainted atmosphere in the wake of this floral ambulance. On the Place de la Bourse, where processions of workmen used to meet, singing the Parisienne, one often saw funerals pass by towards the Montmartre cemetery, as late as eleven o'clock at night, by the light of pitch torches. The Pont Neuf was blocked with litters laden with patients for the hospitals, or dead, who had expired on the road. The toll ceased for some days on the Pont des Arts. The booths disappeared, and, as the northeast wind was blowing, all the stall-holders and all the shopkeepers on the quays closed their doors. One met tilted conveyances preceded by a crow, or mute, with a registrar of births, deaths and marriages, walking in front, dressed in mourning and carrying a list in his hand. There was a dearth of these tabellions, or registrars, and they had to send for more from Saint-Germain, the Villette, Saint-Cloud. For the rest, the hearses were piled up with five or six coffins, kept in place with ropes. Omnibuses and hackney coaches were employed for the same purpose, it was not uncommon to see a cab adorned with a dead body stretched across the apron. A few of the dead were laid out in the churches. A priest sprinkled holy water over those collected faithful of eternity. In Athens, the people believed that the wells near the Piraeus had been poisoned. In Paris, the tradesmen were accused of poisoning their wine, spirits, sugar plums and provisions. Several individuals had their clothes torn from their backs, were dragged in the gutter, flung into the Seine. The authorities were to blame for these stupid or guilty opinions. How did the scourge, like an electric spark, pass from London to Paris? It cannot be explained. This fantastic death often fixes on a spot of the ground, on a house, and leaves the neighbourhood of that infested spot untouched. Then it retraces its steps and picks up what it has forgotten. One night I felt myself attacked. I was seized with a shivering, together with cramp in my legs. I did not want to ring for fear of frightening Madame de Chateaubriand. I got up, I heaped all I could find in my room on the bed, got back under the blankets, and a copious perspiration pulled me through. But I remained shattered, and it was in this condition of discomfort that I was obliged to write my pamphlet on the twelve thousand francs of Madame la Duchesse de Berry. I should not have been too sorry to go, carried off under the arm of the eldest son of Vishnu, whose distant glance killed Bonaparte upon his rock at the entrance to the Indian Sea. If all mankind stricken with this general contagion came to die, what would happen? Nothing. The world, depopulated, would continue its solitary course, without need of any other astronomer to count its steps than him who has measured them from all eternity. It would present no change to the eyes of the inhabitants of the other planets. They would see it fulfilling its accustomed functions. Upon its surface our little works, our cities, our monuments, would be replaced by forests restored to the sovereignty of the lions. No void would manifest itself in the universe. And nevertheless, there would be lacking that human intelligence which knows the stars and rises to a knowledge of their author. What art thou then, O immensity of the works of God, in which, if the genius of man, which is equal to the whole of nature, came to disappear, it would be no more miss than the smallest atom withdrawn from creation? Paris, Rue d'Enfer, May 1832. Madame de Berry has her chamber council in Paris, as Charles X has his. Paltry sums were collected in her name to succour the poor of the royalists. I propose to distribute among the cholera patients a sum of 12,000 francs on behalf of the mother of Henry V. We wrote to Massa, and not only did the princess approve of the disposition of the funds, but she would have liked us to apportion a more considerable sum. Her approval arrived on the day on which I sent the money to the mayor's offices. Thus everything is strictly true in my explanations concerning the gift of the exile. 
On the 14th of April, I sent the whole sum to the prefect of the Seine to be distributed among the indigent class of the cholera-stricken population of Paris. M. de Bondy was not at the Hôtel de Ville when my letter was taken there. The secretary-general opened my missive and did not consider himself authorised to receive the money. Three days elapsed. M. de Bondy replied at last that he could not accept the 12,000 francs because people would see in it, beneath an apparent benevolence, a political combination against which the entire population of Paris would protest by its refusal. Then my secretary went to the twelve mayor's offices. Of five mayors who were present, four accepted the gift of the thousand francs, one refused it. Of the seven mayors who were absent, five kept silence, two refused. I was forthwith besieged by an army of paupers, benevolent and charitable societies, workmen of all kinds, workmen and children, Polish and Italian exiles, men of letters, artists, soldiers, all wrote or all demanded a share in the bounty. If I had had a million, it would have been distributed in a few hours. M. de Bonny was wrong in saying that the entire population of Paris would protest by its refusal. The population of Paris will always take money from everybody. The sacred attitude of the government was enough to make one die of laughing. One would have thought that this perfidious legitimist money was going to stir up the cholera patients, to excite an insurrection among the men dying in the hospitals, to march to the assault of the Tuileries with coffins rolling, with tolling of funeral knells, with winding sheet unfurled under the command of death. My correspondence with the mayors was prolonged through the complication of the refusal of the prefect of Paris. Some of them wrote to me to send me back my money or to ask for the return of their receipts for the gifts of Madame la Duchesse de Berry. I sent these back loyally, and I handed the following receipt to the office of the mayor of the Twelfth Ward. I have received from the mayor's office of the Twelfth Ward the sum of one thousand francs, which it had at first accepted, and which it has returned to me by order of Monsieur the Prefect of the Seine. Paris, 22nd April, 1832. The mayor of the Ninth Ward, Monsieur Cronier, was braver. He kept the thousand francs and was dismissed. I wrote him this note, 29th April, 1832. Sir, I hear with keen sorrow of the disgrace of which Madame la Duchesse de Berry's benevolence has in your case been the cause or the pretext. You will have for your consolation the esteem of the public, the sense of your independence, and the happiness of having sacrificed yourself to the cause of the unfortunate. I have the honour, etc., etc., the mayor of the fourth ward is a very different man. M. Cadet de Gassicourt, a poet apothecary, composing little verses, writing in his time, in the time of liberty and the empire, an agreeable classical declaration against my romantic prose and that of Madame de Stael. M. Cadet de Gassicourt is the hero who took the cross of the front of saint germain l'Auxerrois by assault and who, in a proclamation on the cholera, gave us to understand that possibly those wicked Carlists were the wine poisoners to whom the people had already done ample justice. And so the illustrious champion wrote me the following letter. Paris, 18th April, 1832. Sir, I was not at the mayor's office when the person sent by you called. This will explain to you the delay in my reply. Monsieur the Prefect of the Seine, when declining to accept the money which you undertook to offer him, seems to me to have traced the line of conduct which the members of the municipal council must follow. I shall imitate Monsieur the Prefect's example the more readily, inasmuch as I think that I know, and as I share the sentiments which must have prompted his refusal. I will refer only in passing to the title of Her Royal Highness, given with some affectation to the person whose mouthpiece you constitute yourself. The daughter-in-law of Charles X is no more a Royal Highness in France, than her father-in-law is king. But, sir, there is no one who is not morally convinced that this lady is very actively at work, and that she is spending sums of money very much more considerable than that of which she has entrusted the employment to yourself to stir up trouble in our country and bring about civil war. The alms which she pretends to make are but a means for drawing upon herself and her party an attention and a kindly feeling which her intentions are far from justifying. You will therefore not think it extraordinary that a magistrate, firmly attached to the constitutional royalty of Louis-Philippe, 
should refuse a relief which comes from such a source and should look to true citizens for purer bounties addressed sincerely to humanity and the country i am sir with a very distinguished regard etc f cadet de gassicourt this is a very proud revolt on the part of monsieur cadet de gassicourt against this lady and her father-in-law what a progress in enlightenment and philosophy what indomitable independence messieurs fleurant and Pergon dared not look people in the face except upon their knees he m cadet says with the cid then we rise up his liberty is the more courageous inasmuch as that father-in-law in other words the descendant of st louis is an outlaw m de gassicourt is above all that he despises equally the nobility of time and of misfortune with the same contempt for aristocratic prejudices he takes away my dare and assumes it for himself as though it were a conquest snatched from the petty gentry but could there not have been some ancient historical quarrels between the house of cadet and the house of capet henry the fourth the ancestor of that father-in-law who is no more king than that lady is the royal highness was one day passing through the forest of st germain eight lords were lying in ambush there to kill the bearnese they were taken one of those gallants says l'etoile was an apothecary who asked to speak with the king of whom his majesty having inquired of what condition he was he answered that he was an apothecary what said the king is it the habit to perform the condition of an apothecary here do you lie in wait for the wayfarers to henry the fourth was a soldier modesty troubled him but little and he ran away from a word no more than from the enemy i suspect m de gassicourt because of his ill-humour towards the descendant of henry the fourth of being himself the descendant of the apothecary leaguer the mayor of the fourth ward had doubtless written to me in the hope that i would engage him in mortal combat but i do not care to engage m cadet in anything i hope that he will forgive me for leaving him this little token of my remembrance since the days when the great revolutions and the great revolutionaries passed before my eyes everything had shrivelled greatly the men who caused the fall of an oak replanted when too old to take root applied to me they asked me for a portion of the widow's mite to buy bread the letter from the committee of the decoré de juillet or knights of july is a document worth noting for the instruction of posterity paris twentieth april eighteen thirty two please address your reply to m gibert arnaud manager and secretary to the committee three rue saint nices monsieur le vicomte the members of our committee approach you with confidence to ask you kindly to honour them with a gift in favour of the knights of july any benevolence shown to these unhappy fathers of families at this time of plague and misery inspires the sincerest gratitude we venture to hope that you will consent to allow your illustrious name to figure beside those of general bertrand general exelmans general lamarck general lafayette and several ambassadors peers of france and deputies we beg you to honour us with a word in reply and if contrary to our expectation our request should meet with a refusal be good enough to return us the present letter with the gentlest sentiments we beg you monsieur le vicomte to accept the homage of our respectful salutations the active members of the constitutive committee of the knights of july four visiting member cyprien desmarais special commissary gibert arnaud manager and secretary tourelle assistant member i was too wise not to take the advantage which the revolution of july here gave me over itself by distinguishing between persons one would create helots among the unfortunate who because of certain political opinions might never obtain relief i lost no time in sending a hundred francs to these gentlemen with this note paris twenty second april eighteen thirty two gentlemen i am infinitely grateful to you for applying to me to come to the assistance of some unhappy fathers of families i hasten to send you the sum of one hundred francs i regret that i am not able to offer you a more considerable gift i have the honour etc chateaubriand the following receipt was sent to me by return monsieur le vicomte i have the honour to thank you and to acknowledge the receipt of the sum of one hundred francs devoted by your kindness to the succour of the unfortunates of july greetings and respects gibert arnaud 
manager and secretary to the committee. 23rd April. And so Madame la Duchesse de Berry gave charity to those who had driven her from the country. The transactions show things in their true light. How can one believe in any reality in a country where no one looks after the invalids of his party, where the heroes of yesterday are the destitute persons of today, where a little gold makes the multitude hurry to one, like pigeons in a farmyard, flocking to the hand that flings grain to them? Four thousand francs of my twelve remained. I addressed myself to religion. Monseigneur, the Archbishop of Paris, wrote me this noble letter. Paris, 26th April, 1832. Monsieur le Vicomte. Charity is Catholic, like faith, foreign to men's passions, independent of their movements. One of its chief distinguishing characteristics is that, as St. Paul says, it worketh no evil, non cogitat malum. It blesses the hand that gives and the hand that receives, without attributing to the generous benefactor any other motive than that of doing good, and without asking of the indigent poor any other condition than that of need. It accepts with deep and feeling gratitude the gift which the august widow has charged you to confide to it, to be employed for the relief of our unfortunate brothers, the victims of the plague which is devastating the capital. It will distribute with the most scrupulous fidelity the four thousand francs which you have handed me on her behalf, and for which my letter is a new receipt. But I shall have the honour to send you an account of the distribution when the intentions of the benefactress have been fulfilled. Be so good, Monsieur le Vicomte, as to present to Madame la Duchesse de Berry the thanks of a pastor and a father, who daily offers his life to God for his sheep and his children, and who calls on every side for help capable of levelling their wretchedness. Her royal heart has already doubtless found within itself its reward for the sacrifice which she has devoted to our misfortunes. Religion ensures to her, moreover, the effect of the divine promises set forth in the book of the Beatitudes for those who are merciful. The money has been divided without delay among the rectors of the twelve principal parishes of Paris, to whom I have addressed the letter of which I enclose a copy. Receive, Monsieur le Vicomte, the assurance, etc. Hyacinthe, Archbishop of Paris. One is always amazed to realise in how high a degree religion suits even style, and gives an immediate gravity and seemliness to commonplaces. This forms a contrast with a heap of anonymous letters, which have become mixed with the letters I have quoted. The spelling of these anonymous letters is fairly correct, the handwriting neat, they are properly speaking literary, like the Revolution of July. They display scribbling jealousies, hatreds, vanities, safe in the inviolability of a cowardice which, refraining to show its face, cannot be made visible by a blow. Here are some samples. Will you let us know, you old Republicanquist, the day on which you would like to grease your moccasins? It would be easy for us to procure you some chance fat. And should you want some of your friends' blood to write their history in, there is no lack of it in the Paris mud, its element. You old brigand, ask your rascally and worthy friend Fitzjames if he liked the stone which he received in his feudal part. Pack of scoundrels that you are, we'll pull your guts from your stomachs, etc., etc. In another missive I find a very well-drawn gallows with these words. Go down on your knees to a priest and make an act of contrition, for we want your old head to put an end to your treacheries. For the rest, the cholera still continues. The answer which I might address to a known or unknown adversary would perhaps reach him when he was lying on his threshold. If, on the contrary, he were destined to live, where would his reply find me? Perhaps in that resting place of which no one can be frightened today, especially we men who have lengthened out our years between the terror and the plague, the first and last horizons of our lives. A truce. Let the coffins pass. Paris, Rue d'Enfer, 10th June, 1832. General Lamarck's funeral has brought about two days of bloodshed and the victory of the sham legitimacy over the Republican Party. This incomplete and divided party has made an heroic resistance. Paris has been declared in a state of siege. This is the censorship on the largest possible scale, a censorship in the manner of the Convention, with this difference, that a military commission takes the place of the revolutionary tribunal. 
They are shooting in June 1832, the men who achieved the victory in July 1830. That same polytechnic school, that same artillery of the National Guard, are being sacrificed. They conquered the power for those who are crushing, disowning and disbanding them. The Republicans are certainly wrong to have cried up measures of anarchy and disorder. But why did you not employ such noble arms on our frontiers? They would have delivered us from the ignominious yoke of the foreigner. Generous, if exalted heads, would not have remained to ferment in Paris, to blaze up against the humiliation of our foreign policy and the bad faith of the new royalty. You have been pitiless, you who, without sharing the dangers of the three days, have gathered their fruit. Go now with the mothers to identify the corpses of those knights of July, from whom you hold places, riches and honours. Young men, you do not all obtain the same lot on the same shore. You have a tomb under the colonnade of the Louvre and a place in the morgue. Some for snatching, others for bestowing a crown. Your names, who knows them? You sacrifices and forever unknown victims of a memorable revolution. Is the blood known that cements the monuments which men admire? The workmen who built the great pyramid for the corpse of an unglorious king sleep forgotten in the sand near the needy root that served to feed them during their labours. Paris, Rue d'Enfer, end of July, 1832. Madame la Duchesse de Berry no sooner sanctioned the measure of the 12,000 francs than she took ship for her famous adventure. The rising of Marseille failed. There remained but to try the West. But the Vendean glory is a thing apart. It will live in our annals. In any case, seven-eighths of France has chosen a different glory, the object of jealousy or antipathy. The Vendée is an oriflamme venerated and admired in the treasure of Saint-Denis, under which youth and the future will henceforth gather no longer. Madame, when she landed like Bonaparte on the coast of Provence, did not see the white flag fly from steeple to steeple. Deceived in her expectations, she found herself almost alone on shore with Monsieur de Beaumont. The marshal wanted to make her recross the frontier at once. She asked to have the night to think it over. She slept well among the rocks to the sound of the sea. In the morning, on waking, she found a noble dream in her thoughts. Since I am on French soil, I will not leave it. Let us set out for the Vendée. Monsieur de, informed by a faithful man, took her in his carriage as his wife, crossed the whole of France with her, and has put her down at... She has remained some time in a country house, without being recognised by anybody except the curate of the place. The Maréchal de Beaumont is to join her in the Vendée by another road. Informed of all this in Paris, it was easy for us to foresee the result. The enterprise has a further drawback for the royalist cause. It will discover the weakness of that cause and dispel illusions. If Madame had not gone to the Vendée, France would always have believed that in the West there was a royalist camp standing at ease, as I called it. But, however, there remained still one means of saving Madame, and casting a new veil over the truth. The princess should have left again at once, arriving at her own risk and peril, like a brave general who comes to review his army, to moderate its impatience and its ardour. She would have declared that she had hastened to tell her soldiers that the moment for action was not yet favourable, that she would return to place herself at their head when the occasion should summon her. Madame would at least have once shown a bourbon to the Vendéans, the shades of the Catalinaires, the Delbays, the Bonchamps, the La roche the Charettes, would have rejoiced. Our committee met. While we were discoursing, there came from Nantes a captain, who told us the place where the heron is staying. The captain is a good-looking young man, brave as a sailor, eccentric as a Breton. He disapproved of the enterprise. He thought it mad, but he said, Madame is not going away. It is a question of dying, and that is all. And then, gentlemen of the council, have Walter Scott hanged, for he is the real culprit. I thought that we ought to write what we felt to the princess. Monsieur Berrier, who was preparing to go to defend a case at Campe, generously offered to take the letter and to see Madame if he could. When it became necessary to draw up the note, no one thought of writing it. I undertook to do so. Our messenger set out, and we awaited events. I soon received by post the following note, which had not been sealed and which had doubtless come under the eyes of the authorities. Angoulême, 7th June. Monsieur le Vicomte, 
I have received and forwarded your letter of Friday last, when, on Sunday, the prefect of the Loire Inferior sent word requiring me to leave the town of Nantes. I was on my way and at the gates of Angoulême. I have just been taken before the prefect, who has notified me of an order from M. de Montalivet, by which I am to be taken back to Nantes under an escort of gendarmes. Since my departure from Nantes, the department of the Loire Inferieure has been placed under martial law, and by this entirely legal transfer I am made subject to the laws of exception. I am writing to the minister to ask him to have me taken to Paris. He will receive my letter by the same post. The object of my journey to Nantes seems to have been utterly misinterpreted. Decide, therefore, whether, in the light of your prudence, you will think it right to mention the matter to the minister. I apologise for addressing this request to you, but I have no one to whom to apply but yourself. Pray believe, Monsieur le Vicomte, in my old and sincere attachment, and in my profound respect. Your most devoted servant, Berrier the Younger. P.S. There is not a moment to lose if you are willing to see the minister. I am going to tour where his new orders will still find me on Sunday. He can dispatch them either by telegraph or express. I inform M. Berrier in the following reply of the decision to which I came. Paris, 10th June, 1832. I received your letter, Monsieur, dated Angoulême, the 7th instant. It was too late for me to see Monsieur the Minister of the Interior as you wished, but I wrote to him at once, sending him your own letter enclosed in mine. I hope that the mistake which occasioned your arrest will soon be admitted, and that you will be restored to liberty and to your friends, among whom I beg you to number myself. A thousand hearty compliments, with the renewed assurance of my sincere and entire devotion, Chateaubriand. Here is my letter to the Minister of the Interior. Paris, 9th June, 1832. Monsieur le Ministre de l'Intérieur. I have this moment received the enclosed letter. As I should probably not be able to see you as quickly as M. Berrier wishes, I have decided to send you his letter. His complaint appears to me to be justified. He will be innocent in Paris as at Nantes, and at Nantes as in Paris. This is a thing which the authorities must admit, and by writing M. Berrier's complaint, they will avoid giving a retroactive effect to the law. I venture to hope all, M. Le Comte, from your impartiality. I have the honour to be, etc., etc., Chateau Beyond. End of Book One, Part Three. Book Two, Part One of the Memoirs of Chateau Beyond, Volume Five, Part Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 5, Part 4, by François René de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book 2, Part 1. Paris, Rue d'Enfer, End of July, 1832. One of my old friends, Mr. Frizel, an Englishman, had just lost, at Passy, his only daughter, aged 17 years. I had gone on the 19th of June to the funeral of poor Eliza, whose portrait the pretty Madame de Lesset was completing when death put the finishing touch to it. Returning to my solitude in the Rue d'Enfer, I had hardly gone to bed, full of the melancholy thoughts that arise from the association of youth, beauty and the grave, when, at four o'clock in the morning, on the 20th of June, Baptiste, who had long been in my service, entered my room, came up to the bed and said, Sir, the courtyard is full of men who have placed themselves at all the doors, after compelling de Brosse to open the carriage entrance, and there are three gentlemen asking to speak to you. As he finished these words, the gentlemen entered, and the chief of them, very politely approaching my bed, told me that he had an order to arrest me and take me to the prefecture of police. I asked him if the sun had risen, as the law demanded, and if he was the bearer of a legal warrant. He did not answer for the sun, but he showed me the following judicial notice. Copy. Prefecture of Police. In the King's name. We, Council of State, Prefect of Police, in view of information, in our possession, by virtue of Article 10 of the Code of Criminal Instruction, call upon the commissary, or, if he be prevented, another, to repair to the house of Monsieur le Vicomte de Chateaubriand, or elsewhere, if need be, 
he being accused of plotting against the safety of the state in order there to seek for and seize all papers correspondence and writings containing provocations to crimes and offences against the public peace or liable to examination as well as any seditious objects or arms which may be in his possession while i perused the declaration of the great plotting against the safety of the state of which i poor i was accused the captain of the police spies said to his subordinates gentlemen do your duty the duty of those gentlemen consisted in opening every cupboard fumbling in every pocket seizing all papers letters and documents reading the same where possible and discovering all arms as appears from the warrant aforesaid after reading over the document addressing the worthy leader of those thieves of men and liberties you know sir i said that i do not recognize your government and that i protest against the violence which you are doing me but as i am not the stronger and as i have no wish to come to blows with you i will get up and accompany you pray take the trouble to be seated i dressed and without taking anything with me said to the venerable commissary sir i am at your orders are we going on foot no sir i took care to bring you a coach you are very good sir let us start but allow me to go to take leave of madame de chateaubriand will you permit me to enter my wife's room alone sir i will go with you to the door and wait for you very well sir and we went down everywhere on my road i found sentries a picket had been posted even on the boulevard outside a little gate which opens at the bottom of my garden i said to the leader those precautions were very useless i have not the smallest wish to run away from you and escape the gentleman had turned my papers topsy-turvy but taken nothing my big mameluke sabre caught their attention they whispered among themselves and ended by leaving the weapon under a heap of dusty folios in the midst of which it lay beside a yellow wood crucifix which i had brought from the holy land this dumb show would almost have made me inclined to laugh but i was cruelly distressed for madame de chateaubriand every one who knows her knows also the affection which she bears me her ready alarm the quickness of her imagination and the pitiful state of her health this descent of the police and my removal might do her a terrible harm she had already heard some noise and i found her sitting up in bed listening quite terrified as i entered her room at so unusual an hour ah dear god she exclaimed are you ill ah dear god what is happening what is happening and she was seized with a fit of trembling i kissed her with difficulty kept back my tears and said it is nothing they have sent for me to make a statement as a witness in a matter that has to do with a newspaper trial it will all be over in a few hours and i shall come back to breakfast with you the police spy had remained standing at the open door he saw this scene and i said to him as i returned to place myself in his hands you see sir the effect of your somewhat matutinal visit i crossed the courtyard with my bum bailiffs three of them got into the coach with me the rest of the squad accompanied the capture on foot and we reached the yard of the prefecture of police unmolested the jailer who was to put me under lock and key was not up they woke him by tapping at his wicket and he went to prepare my lodging while he was busy with this work i walked up and down the yard with the sieur leoteau who was guarding me he chatted and said to me in a friendly way for he was very civil monsieur le vicomte i have the great honour of remembering you i have often presented arms to you when you were a minister and used to come to the king's i used to serve in the bodyguards but what would you have one do one has a wife and children one must live you are right monsieur leoteau how much does this pay you ah monsieur le vicomte that depends on our captures the perquisites are sometimes good and sometimes poor just as in war during my walk i saw the spies return in different disguises like maskers on ash wednesday coming down from the courtille they came to report on the doings of the night some were dressed as vendors of green stuff as street hawkers as charcoal sellers as market porters as old clothesmen as ragmen as organ grinders others wore wigs under which appeared hair of a different colour others had false beards whiskers and moustachios others dragged their legs like respectable invalids and wore a dazzling red ribbon at their buttonholes they disappeared into a small yard and soon returned in other clothes without moustachios without beards without whiskers without wigs without baskets without wooden legs without arms worn in a sling all these birds of daybreak of the police flew away and vanished as the light increased my lodging was ready the jailer came to tell us and monsieur leoteau hat in hand led me to the door of my honest dwelling 
saying as he left me in the hands of the jailer and his assistants monsieur le vicomte i am your humble servant i trust to have the pleasure of meeting you again the entrance door closed behind me preceded by the jailer who carried his keys and went before his two men who followed me to prevent me from turning tail i went up a narrow staircase till i came to the second floor a little dark passage led to a door the turnkey opened it i followed him into my box he asked me if i wanted anything i answered that i would have breakfast in an hour he told me that there were a coffee-house and a tavern which supplied prisoners with all that they wanted for their money i begged my keeper to send me some tea and if possible some hot and cold water and towels i gave him twenty francs in advance he withdrew respectfully promising to return left alone i inspected my den its length was a little greater than its width and its height was perhaps some seven or eight feet the walls stained and bare were scribbled over with the prose and verse of my predecessors and especially with the scrawl of a woman who said much that was insulting about the juste milieu a pallet with dirty sheets took up half of my cell a plank supported by two brackets fastened against the wall two feet above the pallet served as a cupboard for the prisoner's linen boots and shoes a chair and a sordid article composed the rest of the furniture my faithful keeper brought me the towels and jugs of water that i had asked for i besought him to take away from the bed the dirty sheets and the yellow woollen blanket to remove the pail which was choking me and to sweep out my den after first sprinkling it all the works of the juice milieu having been carried off i shaved i poured the water from my jug over myself i changed my linen madame de chateaubriand had sent me a little parcel i set out all my things on the plank over my bed as though i were in the cabin of a ship when this was done my breakfast arrived and i took my tea on my well-washed table which i covered with a clean napkin soon they came to fetch the utensils of my matutinal feast and i was left alone duly locked in my cell was lighted only by a grated window which opened very high up i placed my table under this window and climbed on the table to breathe and to enjoy the light through the bars of my thieves cell i saw only a yard or rather a dark and narrow passage with gloomy buildings with bats fluttering around them i heard the clanking of keys and chains the noise of policemen and spies the footsteps of soldiers the movement of arms the shouting the laughter the licentious songs of the prisoners my neighbours the yells of benoit condemned to death for the murder of his mother and his obscene friend i caught these words uttered by benoit between his confused exclamations of fear and repentance ah my mother my poor mother i was seeing the underside of society the sores of humanity the hideous machines by which this world is moved i thanked the men of letters those great partisans of the liberty of the press who formerly had taken me for their leader and fought under my orders but for them i should have left this life without knowing what prison was and i should have missed this ordeal i recognised in this delicate attention the genius the goodness the generosity the honour the courage of the placed penmen but after all what was this short trial tasso spent years in a dungeon and shall i complain no i have not the mad pride to measure my vexation of a few hours with the prolonged sacrifices of the immortal victims whose names history has preserved moreover i was not at all unhappy the genius of my past grandeurs and of my thirty-year-old glory did not appear to me but my muse of former days very poor very unknown came all radiant to kiss me through my window she was charmed with my lodging and quite inspired she found me again as she had seen me in my wretchedness in london when the first visions of renee were wafting in my head what were we going to compose the solitary of mount pindus and i a song in imitation of that poor poet lovelace who in the jails of the english commons sang king charles i his master no the voice of a prisoner would have seemed to me to be of ill omen for my little king henry v it is from the foot of the altar that him should be addressed to misfortune i did not therefore sing the crown fallen from an innocent brow i contented myself with telling of another crown white also laid on a young girl's bier i remembered eliza frizzell whom i had seen buried the day before in the cemetery at passy i began a few elegiac verses of a latin epitaph but suddenly i was in doubt as to the quantity of a word I quickly sprang from the table on which I was perched, leaning against the bars of the window, and ran to the door on which I rained blows with my fist. 
The neighbouring dens rang out. The jailer came up in dismay, followed by two gendarmes. He opened my wicket, and I cried as Santoui would have done, A gradus! A gradus! The jailer opened his eyes. The gendarmes thought that I was revealing the name of one of my accomplices. They were quite ready to handcuff me. I explained. I gave them money to buy the book, and they went off to ask the astonished police for a gradus. While they were attending to my commission, I clambered up on my table again, and changing my ideas on that tripod, set myself to compose trophies on the death of Eliza. But when I was in the midst of my inspiration at about three o'clock, behold, tipstaffs entering my cell and bodily apprehending me on the banks of Permessus. They took me to the examining magistrate, who sat drawing out instruments in a gloomy office opposite my prison on the other side of the yard. The magistrate, a famous and pompous young limb of the law, put the usual questions to me as to my surname, Christian names, age and place of residence. I refused to answer or sign anything whatever, declining to recognise the political authority of a government which was able to point neither to the ancient hereditary right nor the election of the people, since France had not been consulted and no national congress summoned. I was taken back to my mousetrap. At six o'clock they brought me my dinner, and I continued to turn and turn over in my head the lines of my stanzas, at the same time improvising an air which I thought charming. Madame de Chateaubriand sent me a mattress, a bolster, sheets, a cotton blanket, candles, and the books which I read at night. I arranged my room, and still humming, Il descend le secoué, et les ronds sont tache. I found my ballad of the young girl and the young flower finished. I began to undress, a sound of voices was heard, my door opened, and Monsieur the Prefect of Police, accompanied by Monsieur Ney, appeared. He made a thousand apologies for the prolongation of my detention in custody at the police station. He informed me that my friends the Duke de Fitzjames and the Baron E. de Neuville had been arrested like myself, and that the prefect officers were so full that they did not know where to put the persons who had to be examined by the justiciary. But, he added, you shall come to me, Monsieur le Vicomte, and choose in my apartment whatever suits you best. I thanked him and begged him to leave me in my hole. I was already quite charmed with it, like a monk with his cell. Monsieur the Prefect declined my entreaties, and I had to forsake my nest. I saw again the rooms which I had not visited since the day when Bonaparte's Prefect of Police had sent for me to invite me to leave Paris. Monsieur Gisquet and Madame Gisquet opened all their rooms for me, begging me to pick the one which I would like to sleep in. Monsieur Ney offered to give up his to me. I was confused at so much politeness. I accepted a lonely little room, which looked out on the garden and which was used, I think, by Mademoiselle Gisquet as a dressing room. I was allowed to have my servant with me. He slept on a mattress outside my door, at the entrance of a narrow staircase leading down to Madame Gisquet's large apartment. Another staircase led to the garden, but this one was forbidden me, and every evening a sentry was placed at the foot against the railing which separates the garden from the quay. Madame Gisquet is the kindest woman in the world, and Mademoiselle Gisquet is very pretty, and an exceedingly good musician. I have every reason to be satisfied with the care shown me by my hosts. They seemed anxious to atone for the twelve hours of my first confinement. The day after my installation in Mademoiselle Gisquet's dressing-room, I rose quite pleased, as I remembered an Acrian song on the toilet of a young Greek girl. I put my head to the window. I perceived a small, very green garden, and a great wall concealed behind Japan varnish. To the right, at the back of the garden, offices, in which one caught glimpses of agreeable police clerks, like beautiful nymphs, amid lilac bushes. To the left, the quay along the Seine, the river, and a corner of old Paris, in the parish of Saint-André-des-Arcs. The sound of Mademoiselle Gisquet's piano reached me with the voices of the police spies calling for head clerks to receive their reports. How everything changes in this world! That little romantic English garden of the police was a ragged and queer-shaped strip of the French garden, with its closely trimmed elms, of the mansion of the first president of Paris. This old garden, in 1580, occupied the site of that block of houses which stops the view to the north and west, and it stretched to the bank of the Seine. It was there that, after the day of the barricades, the Duc de Guise came to visit Achille de Harlay. He found the first president, who was walking in his garden, who was so little astonished at his coming that he did not so much as deign to turn his head, nor discontinue the walk which he had commenced, which having finished, and being at the end of his alley, he turned, and in turning he saw the Duc de Guise, who came to him. Then that grave magistrate, raising his voice, said to him, 
It is a great pity that the varlet should drive out the master. For the rest, my soul is God's, my heart the king's, and my body is in the hands of the wicked. Let them do with it what they please. The Achille de Allais, who walks in that garden today, is Monsieur Vidoc, and the Duc de Guise is Coco Lacour. We have changed great men for great principles. How free we are now! How free was I, especially at my window, watching that good gendarme standing at sentry at the foot of my staircase and prepared to shoot me flying, if I had sprouted wings. There was no nightingale in my garden, but there were plenty of frisky, shameless, quarrelsome sparrows, which are to be found everywhere, in the country, in town, in palaces, in prisons, and which perch as gaily on the instrument of death as on a rose-bush. To one that can fly away, what matter earthly sufferings? Madame de Chateaubriand obtained permission to see me. She had spent thirteen months under the terror in the Rennes prisons with my two sisters Lucille and Julie. Her imagination, remaining under the impression, can no longer endure the idea of a prison. My poor wife had a violent attack of hysterics. On entering the prefect's offices, and this was an obligation the more which I owed to the juste milieu. On the second day of my detention, the examining magistrate, the Sieur de Mortier, arrived, accompanied by his clerk. Monsieur Guizot had obtained the appointment as Attorney General to the Royal Court at Rennes of one Monsieur Hulot, a writer and, consequently, an envious and irritable man, like all who spoil paper in a triumphing party. Monsieur Guizot's creature, finding my name and those of Monsieur le Duc de Fitzjames and Monsieur E. de Neuville mixed up in the proceedings that were being conducted against Monsieur Berrier at Nantes, wrote to the Minister of Justice that, if he were the master, he would not fail to have us arrested, and included the trial, both as accomplices and as witnesses for the prosecution. M. de Montalivet had thought it his duty to yield to the advice of M. Hulot. There was a time when M. de Montalivet used to come to me to ask my opinion and my ideas relating to the elections and the liberty of the press. The restoration which made M. de Montalivet appear was unable to make him a man of intelligence, and that is no doubt why it makes him feel sick to-day. So M. de Mortier, the examining magistrate, entered my room. A mawkish air was spread like a layer of honey over a contracted and violent face. Je m'appelle Loyal, natif de Normandie, et suis huissier à Verge en dépit de l'envie. M. de Mortier formerly belonged to the congregation, a great communicant, a great legitimist, a great partisan of the ordinances, since become a furious juste milieu man. I begged this animal to take his seat, with all the politeness of the old order. I drew up an armchair for him, I put a little table, a pen and ink, before his clerk. I sat down opposite Monsieur de Mortier, and, in a mild voice, he read out to me the little accusations which duly proved would have tenderly got my head cut off, after which he passed to his examination. I declared again that, not recognising the existing political order, I had no answers to make, that I should sign nothing, that all these judicial proceedings were superfluous, that they might spare themselves the trouble and pass on, that, for the rest, I should always be charmed to have the honour of receiving M. de Mortier. I saw that this manner of acting was throwing the sainted man into a fury, that, having once shared my opinions, he thought my conduct a satire on his own. With this resentment was mingled the pride of a magistrate who believed himself wounded in his functions. He tried to argue with me. I was quite unable to make him grasp the difference that exists between the social order and the political order of things. I submitted, I told him, to the former, because it belongs to natural law. I obeyed the civil, military and financial laws, the laws of police and of public order. But I owed obedience to the political law only in so far as that law emanated from the royal authority consecrated by the ages, or sprang from the sovereignty of the people. I was not silly enough or false enough to believe that the people had been convoked, consulted, and that the established political order was the result of a national decree. If they prosecuted me for theft, murder, arson, or other social crimes or misdemeanours, I should reply to justice, but when they instituted a political trial against me, I had nothing to reply to an authority which had no legal power and, in consequence, nothing to ask me. A fortnight passed in this way. Monsieur de Mortier, whose fury I had heard of, 
a fury which he endeavoured to communicate to the judges, used to approach me with his sugary air, saying, "'Won't you tell me your illustrious name?' In the course of one of the examinations, he read me a letter from Charles X to the Duke de Fitz James, containing a phrase complimentary to myself. "'Well, sir,' I said, "'what is the meaning of that letter?' It is a matter of common knowledge that I have remained faithful to my old king, that I have not taken the oath to Philip. As for the rest, I am deeply touched by my exile sovereign's letter. In the time of his prosperity, he never said anything of that kind to me, and this phrase repays me for all my services. Madame Ricamier, to whom so many prisoners have owed consolation and deliverance, had herself brought to my new retreat. Monsieur de Béranger came down from Passy to tell me in song under the reign of his friends, what used to happen in the jails in the time of my friends. He was no longer able to fling the restoration in my face. My fat old friend, M. Bertin, came to administer the ministerial sacraments to me. An enthusiastic woman came hurrying from Beauvais in order to admire my glory. M. Villemain performed an act of courage. M. Dubois, M. Ampère, M. Lenormand, my generous and learned young friends, did not forget me. The Republican's lawyer, M. Charles Drew, never left me. In the hope of a trial, he magnified the affair, and he would have given up all his fees for the honour of defending me. M. Gisquet, as I have told you, had offered me the run of his rooms, but I did not abuse his permission. Only one evening I went down to hear Mademoiselle Gisquet play the piano. I sat between M. Gisquet and his wife, M. Gisquet scolded his daughter and maintained that she had executed her sonata less well than usual. This little concert, which my host offered me in the bosom of his family, with myself for sole audience, was exceedingly singular. While the most pastoral scene was taking place in the intimacy of the home, policemen were bringing me colleagues from the outside, with blows of musket-butts and loaded sticks, and yet what peace and harmony reigned in the very heart of the police. I had the good fortune to obtain from M. Charles Philippon the grant of a favour exactly similar to that which I enjoyed, the favour of the jail. Sentenced, because of his talent, to some months' imprisonment, he spent them in an asylum at Chaillot. He was called to Paris as a witness in a lawsuit, and availed himself of the opportunity not to return to his lodging. But he repented of it. In the place where he lay concealed, he was no longer able to see, in comfort, a child whom he loved. Regretting his prison, and not knowing how to enter it again, he wrote me the following letter to ask me to arrange this matter with my host. Sir, you are a prisoner, and you would understand me even if you were not Chateaubriand. I also am a prisoner, a voluntary prisoner, since the proclamation of martial law, at the house of a friend a poor artist like myself. I wanted to escape from the justice of the court's martial with which I was threatened by the seizure of my newspaper on the ninth of this month. But, in order to hide myself, I have had to deprive myself of the kisses of a child whom I idolize, an adopted daughter, five years old, my happiness and my joy. This privation is a torture which I could not endure any longer. It is death to me. I am going to give myself up, and they will put me into Sainte Pélagie, where I shall see my poor child only rarely, if they allow it at all, and at fixed hours, where I shall tremble for her health, and where I shall die of anxiety, if I do not see her every day. I appeal to you, sir, to you, a legitimist, I, a whole-hearted Republican, to you, a grave and parliamentary man, I, a caricaturist, and a partisan of the bitterest political personalities, to you to whom I am quite unknown, and who are a prisoner like myself, to persuade Monsieur the Prefect of Police, to allow me to return to the asylum to which I had been transferred. I pledge my word of honour to appear before justice whenever I shall be called upon to do so, and I undertake not to flee from any tribunal whatever, if they will leave me with my poor child." You will believe me, sir, when I speak of honour, and when I swear not to run away, and I am persuaded that you will plead for me, even though profound politicians may see in this a new proof of alliance between the Legitimists and the Republicans, all men whose opinions agree so well. If to such a guest, to such an advocate, they refused what I ask, 
I should know that I have nothing more to hope for, and I should see myself parted for nine months from my poor Emma. In any case, sir, whatever may be the result of your generous intervention, my gratitude will be none the less eternal, for I shall never doubt the urgent solicitations which your heart will suggest to you. Except, sir, the expression of the sincerest admiration, and believe me, your most humble and most devoted servant, Charles Philippon, proprietor of the caricature newspaper, sentenced to thirteen months' imprisonment. Paris, 21st June, 1832. I obtained the favour which M. Philippon asked. He thanked me in a note which proves not the greatness of the service, which was limited to having my client guarded at Chaillot by a gendarme, but that secret joy of the passions which can be well understood only by those who have really felt it. Sir, I am leaving for Chaillot with my dear child. I wanted to thank you, but I feel that words are too cold to express the gratitude which I feel. I was right to think, sir, that your heart would suggest eloquent entreaties to you. I am sure that I am not deceived when I believe that it will tell you that I am not ungrateful, and that it will depict you better than I could the confusion of happiness into which your kindness has thrown me. Except, sir, I beg my most sincere thanks, and deign to believe me the most affectionate of your servants, Charles Philippon. To this singular mark of my credit, I will add this strange proof of my fame. A young clerk in Monsieur Gisquet's offices addressed to me some very beautiful verses which were handed to me by Monsieur Gisquet himself. For after all, we must be fair. If a government of literary men attacked me ignobly, the muses defended me nobly. Monsieur Viermain pronounced in my favour courageously, and in the Journal des Débats itself, my fat friend Bertin protested under his own signature against my arrest. Mademoiselle Noemi, which I presume must be Mademoiselle Gisquet's Christian name, used often to walk alone in the little garden with a book in her hand. She would cast a stealthy glance towards my window. How sweet it would have been to be released from my irons, like Cervantes, by my master's daughter. While I was assuming a romantic air, handsome young Monsieur Ney came to dispel my dream. I saw him talking with Mademoiselle Gisquet, with that air which does not deceive us creators of sylphs. I tumbled down from my clouds, shut my window, and abandoned the idea of growing my moustachios, bleached by the wind of adversity. After fifteen days, an order of non-suit restored me to liberty on the 30th of June, to the great happiness of Madame de Chateaubriand, who would have died, I believe, if my detention had been prolonged. She came to fetch me in a coach. I filled it with my little luggage, as nimbly as I had formerly left the ministry, and I returned to the Rue d'Enfer with that inexpressible finish which misfortune gives to virtue. If history were to hand Monsieur Gisquet down to posterity, Perhaps he would arrive there in a rather bad plight. I want what I have just written to serve him here as a counterpoise to a hostile renown. I have nothing but praise for his attentions and his obligingness. Doubtless, if I had been condemned, he would not have allowed me to escape. But, in short, he and his family treated me with a decency, a good taste, a feeling for my position, for what I was and for what I had been, which were not displayed by a literary administration, and by men of law who were the more brutal, inasmuch as they were acting against the weak, and had nothing to fear. Of all the governments that have arisen in France during the last forty years, Philip's is the only one that threw me into the highwayman's cell. It laid its hand upon my head, upon my head respected even by an incensed conqueror. Napoleon raised his arm, but did not strike me. And why this anger? I will tell you. I dare to raise a protest in favour of right against might, in a country in which I have asked for liberty under the empire, for glory under the restoration, in a country where, solitary that I am, I reckon not by brothers, sisters, children's joys, pleasures, but by tombstones. The last political changes have separated me from the rest of my friends. Some have gone towards fortune, and, all battered with their dishonour, pass by my poverty. Others have abandoned their homes exposed to insults. The generation so greatly smitten with independence have sold themselves. From those generations, common in their conduct, 
intolerable in their pride, mediocre or mad in their writings. I expect nothing but scorn, and I return it to them. They have not the wherewithal to understand me. They know nothing of loyalty to the sworn oath, love for generous institutions, respect for one's own opinions, contempt for success in gold, the felicity of sacrifice, the worship of what is weak and unhappy. After the order of non-suit, one duty remained to me to perform. The offence with which I had been charged was connected with that for which M. Berrier was awaiting trial at Nantes. I was unable to explain my position to the examining magistrate, because I did not recognise the competency of the tribunal. To repair the harm which my silence might have done to M. Berrier, I wrote to M. the Minister of Justice, the letter which you will find below, and which I made public through the medium of the newspapers. Paris, 3rd July, 1832. Monsieur le Ministre de la Justice, permit me to perform with reference to yourself, in the interest of a man too long deprived of liberty, a duty prompted by conscience and honour. Monsieur Berrier, the younger, when questioned by the examining magistrate at Nantes, on the 18th of last month, replied that he had seen Madame la Duchesse de Berry, that he had, with the respect due to her rank, her courage and her misfortunes, submitted to her his personal opinion, and that of honourable friends on the actual situation of France, and on the consequences of Her Royal Highness' presence in the West. M. Berrier, developing this wide subject with his accustomed talent, summed it up thus. No foreign or civil war, supposing it to be crowned with success, can either subdue or rally opinions. Questioned as to the honourable friends of whom he had spoken, M. Berrier nobly said that, grave men having manifested to him an opinion on the present circumstances agreeing with his own, he had thought that he ought to strengthen his opinion with the authority of theirs, but that he would not give their names without their consent. I, Monsieur le Ministre de la Justice, am one of those men consulted by Monsieur Berrier, not only did I approve of his opinion, but I drew up a note in the sense of that very opinion. It was to be handed to Madame la Duchesse de Berry, in the event that that princess should really be on French soil, which I did not believe. As this first note was not signed, I wrote a second, which I signed, and which I still more earnestly entreated the intrepid mother of the grandson of Henry the Fourth, to leave a country which has been torn by so many discords. This declaration was due from me to Monsieur Berrier, the real culprit, if culprit there be, is I. This declaration will serve, I hope, for the prompt deliverance of the prisoner of Nantes. It will allow the guilt to rest upon my head alone of a fact, no doubt very innocent of which, however, in the final result, I accept all the consequences. I have the honour to be, etc. Chateaubriand, Rue d'Enfer Saint-Michel, number 84. I wrote on the ninth of last month to Monsieur le Comte de Montalivet, on a matter relating to Monsieur Berrier, but Monsieur the Minister of the Interior did not think it incumbent upon him, even to inform me that he had received my letter, as it is very important to me to know what becomes of that which I have the honour to write to-day to Monsieur the Minister of Justice, I shall be infinitely obliged to him if he will instruct his office to send me an acknowledgment of its receipt. Chateaubriand. The reply of Monsieur the Minister of Justice was not long in coming. Here it is. Paris, 3rd July. Monsieur le Vicomte, as the letter which you have addressed to me contains information which may enlighten justice, I am forwarding it without delay to the King's attorney to the Nantes court, so that it may be added to the documents in the proceedings pending against M. Berrier. I am with respect, etc., Bart, Keeper of the Seals. By this reply, M. Bart graciously reserved to himself the right to institute a new prosecution against me. I remember the proud disdain of the great men of the Jus Milieu, when I allowed a glimpse to pass of the possibility of any violence exercised upon my person or my writings. What? Good heavens! Why deck myself with an imaginary danger? Who troubled about my opinion? Who thought of touching a hair of my head? Trusty and well-beloved friends of the stewpan, dauntless heroes of peace at any price, you have nevertheless had your terror of the counting-house and the police, your martial law in Paris." your thousand press trials, your military commissions to condemn the author of the Cancan to death. You nevertheless flung me into your jails. The punishment applicable to my crime was nothing less than capital punishment. With what pleasure would I yield you my head? 
if thrown into the scales of justice, it made them lean on the side of the honour, the glory, and the liberty of my country. I was more than ever determined to resume my exile. Madame de Chateaubriand, terrified at my adventure, would already have wished to be very far away. The only question was to seek the spot where we should pitch our tents. The great difficulty was to find some money with which to live on foreign soil, and pay a debt which was drawing down upon me threats of lawsuits and distress. The first year of an embassy always ruins the ambassador. That is what happened to me in Rome. I resigned on the succession of the Polignac ministry, and I went away adding to my ordinary afflictions sixty thousand francs of borrowed money. I had applied to all the royalist purses. None was open to me. I was advised to ask Lafitte. Monsieur Lafitte advanced me ten thousand francs, which I at once gave to the more pressing creditors. I recovered the sum on the proceeds of my pamphlets, and repaid it to him with gratitude. But there still remained some thirty thousand francs to be paid, over and above my old debts, for I have some that have grown a beard, so aged are they. Unfortunately, that beard is a golden beard, which has to be cut upon my chin once a year. M. le Duc de Levy, on his return from a journey to Scotland, had told me, on behalf of Charles X, that that prince wished to continue to pay me my peer's pension. I thought it my duty to refuse the offer. The Duc de Levy returned to the charge when he saw me, on leaving prison, in the most cruel difficulties, finding nothing left of my house and garden in the Rue d'Enfer, and harassed by a swarm of creditors. I had already sold my plate. The Duc de Levy brought me twenty thousand francs, nobly saying that these were not the two years' peerage pension which the king admitted owing me, and that my debts in Rome were simply a debt of the crown. This sum set me free. I accepted it as a temporary loan, and wrote the king the following letter. Sire, in the midst of the calamities with which it has pleased God to hallow your life, you have not forgotten those who suffer at the foot of the throne of St. Louis. You deigned to send word to me some months ago, of your generous intention to continue the peer's pension which I renounced, when refusing to take the oath to the unlawful power. I thought that your majesty had servants poorer than I, and worthier of your bounty. But the last writings which I have published have cost me damages and brought prosecutions down upon me. I have in vain tried to sell the little that I possess. I find myself obliged to accept not the annual pension which your majesty proposed to allow me out of your royal poverty, but a provisional succour to free me from the difficulties which prevent me from reaching a refuge where I can live by my work. Sire, I must needs be very unhappy to make myself a burden, even for a moment, on a crown which I have supported with all my efforts, and which I shall continue to serve for the rest of my life. I am with the most profound respect, etc., Chateaubriand. My nephew, the Comte Louis de Chateaubriand, on his side lent me a similar sum of twenty thousand francs, Thus rid of material obstacles, I made my preparations for my second departure. But a reason based upon honour stopped me. Madame la Duchesse de Berry was on French soil. What would become of her? And was I not bound to remain on the spot where her dangers might summon me? A note from the princess which reached me from the depths of the Vendée set me completely free. I was going to write to you, Monsieur le Vicomte, touching this provisional government, which I thought it my duty to form, when I did not know when, nor even if, I might return to France, and of which I am informed that you consented to form part. It did not exist, in fact, because it never met, and some of the members came to an understanding only to communicate to me an opinion which I was not able to follow. I do not take it in the least unkindly of them. You judged in accordance with the report on my position and that of the country, made to you by those who had reason to know better than I, the effects of a fatal influence in which I was never willing to believe, and I am sure that if Monsieur de Chateaubriand had been with me, his noble and generous heart would also have refused to do so. I rely therefore none the less on the good individual services, and even the counsels of the persons who form part of the provisional government, and whose choice had been dictated to me by their enlightened zeal and their devotion to the legitimacy in the person of Henry V. I see that it is your intention to leave France again, I should regret this greatly, if I could have you near me, but you have weapons which strike at a distance, and I hope that you will not cease to fight for Henry V. Believe, Monsieur le Vicomte, in all my esteem and friendship, M.C.R. With this note, Madame dispensed with my services, 
and did not yield to the advice which I had ventured to give her in the note of which M. Berrier was the bearer. She even seemed a little hurt by it, although she admitted that a fatal influence had led her astray. Thus restored to my liberty, and released from all engagements, on this day, 7th August, having nothing left to do but go away, I wrote my letter to M. de Béranger, who had visited me in prison. To M. de Béranger, Paris, 7th August, 1832. I wanted, monsieur, to go to say good-bye to you, and thank you for your remembrance. Time failed me, and I was obliged to start, without having the pleasure of seeing you and embracing you. I am ignorant as to my future. Is there a clear future for anybody to-day? We are living not in a time of revolution, but of social transformation. Now transformations are realised slowly, and the generations which find themselves placed in the period of metamorphosis perish obscure and miserable. If Europe, as might well be the case, has reached the age of decrepitude, it is another matter. It will produce nothing, and will die out in an impotent anarchy of passions, morals, and doctrines. In that event, monsieur, you will have sung over a tomb. I have fulfilled all my engagements, monsieur. I returned at the sound of your voice. I have defended what I came to defend. I have undergone the cholera. I am returning to the mountain. Do not break your lyre, as you threaten to do. I owe to it one of my most glorious titles to the memory of mankind. Continue to make France smile and weep, for it so happens, by a secret known to you alone, that in your popular songs the words are gay and the music plaintive. I recommend myself to your friendship and your muse, Chateaubriand. I am to set out to-morrow. Madame de Chateaubriand will meet me at Lucerne. Basel, 12th August, 1832. Many men die without losing sight of their steeple. I cannot meet with the steeple which is to see me die. In quest of a refuge in which to finish my memoirs, I am taking the road anew, dragging at my heels an enormous luggage of papers, diplomatic correspondence, confidential notes, letters from ministers and kings. It is history riding pillion with romance. At Vesoul I saw M. Augustin Thierry living with his brother, the prefect. When formerly in Paris... He sent me his Histoire de la Conquête des Normands. I went to thank him. I found a young man in a room with half-closed shutters. He was almost blind. He tried to rise to receive me, but his legs no longer carried him, and he fell into my arms. He blushed when I expressed to him my sincere admiration. It was then that he replied that his work was mine, and that it was when reading The Battle of the Franks and the Martyrs that he had conceived a new idea of writing history. When I took leave of him, he then made an effort to follow me, and dragged himself to the door, leaning against the wall. I went out quite affected by so much talent and so much misfortune. At Vessel, after a long banishment, appeared Charles X, now setting sail for the new exile, which will be for him the last. I passed the frontier without accident with all my rubbish. Let us see if, on the other side of the Alps, I may not enjoy the liberty of Switzerland and the son of Italy the needs of my opinions and my years. At the entrance to Basel, I met an old Swiss, a custom-house officer. He made me undergo a little quarantine of a quarter of an hour. My luggage was taken down into a cellar. They set in movement something or other which made the same sound as a stocking frame. There rose a vinegary fume, and thus purified from the contagion of France, I was released by my good Swiss. I have said in the itinerary, speaking of the storks of Athens, from the height of their nests, which revolutions cannot reach, they have seen the race of mortals change beneath them. While impious generations have risen on the tombs of the religious generations, the young stork has always nourished its old father. I find again at Basel the stork's nest which I left there six years ago. But the hospital in whose roof the stork of Basel has built its nest is not the Parthenon, the son of the Rhine is not the son of the Cephissus, the council is not the Areopagus, Erasmus is not Pericles. Nevertheless, the Rhine, the Black Forest, Roman and Germanic Basel are something. Louis Cateau's extended France to the gates of that city and three hostile monarchs passed through it in 1813 to come to sleep in the bed of Louis the Great, defended by Napoleon in vain. Let us go to see Holbein's Dance of Death. It will tell us a tale of human vanities. The Dance of Death, always presuming that it was not even then a real painting, took place in Paris in 1424, in the Cimetière des Annecins. It came to us from England. 
The performance of this spectacle was recorded in pictures. These were exhibited in the cemeteries of Dresden, Lübeck, Minden, of the Chaise-Dieu, Strasbourg and Blois in France, and Holbein's pencil immortalised these joys of the tomb at Basel. These dances of death of the great artist have in their turn been carried away by death, which does not spare its own follies. There remain at Basel of Holbein's labour only six pieces sawn from the stones of the cloisters and lodged in the library of the university. A coloured drawing has preserved the harmony of the work. Those grotesque figures on a terrible background partake of the genius of Shakespeare, a genius blended of comedy and tragedy. The persons bear a lively expression, rich and poor, old and young, men and women, popes, cardinals, priests, emperors, kings, queens, princes, dukes, nobles, magistrates, warriors, all struggle and argue with death. Not one accepts it with a good grace. Death is infinitely various, but always clownish, like life, which is only a serious piece of buffoonery. This death of the satirical painter goes one leg short, like the wooden-legged beggar whom it accosts. It plays a mandoline behind its backbone, like the musician whom it drags away. It is not always bald. Tufts of fair, brown or grey hair flutter on the skeleton's neck and make it more frightful by making it nearly alive. In one of the cartoons, death has almost hair. It is almost young, like a young man, and it carries off a young girl who is looking at herself in a glass. Death has in its wallet the tricks of a crafty schoolboy. With a pair of scissors it cuts the string of a dog which leads a blind man, and the blind man is at two steps from an open pit. Elsewhere, death in a short mantle, accosts one of its victims with the gestures of a pascal. Holbein may have taken the idea of this formidable gaiety in nature itself. Enter a reliquary. All the death's heads seem to grin because they uncover their teeth. That is laughter. What are they grinning at, at death or at life? I liked the cathedral at Basel, and especially the ancient cloisters. As I passed through the latter, filled with funeral inscriptions, I read the names of some reformers. Protestantism chooses its place and takes its time badly, when it sets itself in Catholic monuments. One sees less what it has reformed than what it has destroyed. Those dry pedants who thought that they would remake a primitive Christianity within an old Christianity, which had created society for fifteen centuries, were unable to raise a single monument. To what would that monument have responded? What connection would it have had with the manners of the day? Men were not made like Luther and Calvin in the time of Luther and Calvin. They were made like Leo X, with the genius of Raphael, or like St. Louis with the Gothic genius. The few believed in nothing, the many believed in everything. And so Protestantism has, as its temples, only schoolrooms, or as churches, only the cathedrals which it has devastated. It has there established its nudity. Jesus Christ and his apostles, no doubt, did not resemble the Greeks and Romans of their age. But they did not come to reform an old creed. They came to establish a new religion, to replace the gods by a god. Lucerne, 14th August, 1832. The road from Basel to Lucerne through Argau presents a series of valleys, some of which resemble the valley of Argeles, minus the Spanish sky of the Pyrenees. At Lucerne the mountains, differently grouped, shelved, profiled, coloured, end, as they withdraw one behind the other, and sink away into the perspective, in the snows bordering on the saint Gotthard. If one suppressed the Rigia and Mount Pilatus and kept only the hills, with their surfaces of grass and rabbit warrens, which run down directly to the lake of the four cantons, one would reproduce an Italian lake. The arcades of the cloister of the cemetery surrounding the cathedral are like boxes from which this spectacle can be enjoyed. The monuments of this cemetery have for standard small iron crosses bearing a gilt Christ. In the rays of the sun, these are so many points of light escaping from the tombs. From space to space there are holy water fonts, in which soaks a twig with which one can bless mourned ashes. I wept none there in particular, but I sprinkled the lustral dew upon the silent community of the Christians and unfortunates, my brothers. One epitaph said to me, Odie mihi cras tibi, another, fuit homo, a third, siste viator, abi viator. And I await tomorrow, and I shall have been a man, and a traveller I stop, and a traveller I go away. Leaning against one of the arcades of the cloister, I long contemplated the theatre of the adventures of William Tell, 
and his companions. The theatre of Helvetian liberty so well sung and described by Schiller and Johann von Müller. My eye sought in the vast picture for the presence of the most illustrious dead, and my feet trod on the most unknown ashes. When I saw the Alps again four or five years ago, I asked myself what I had come to seek there. What then shall I say to-day? What shall I say to-morrow, and again to-morrow? Woe to me who cannot grow old, and who am always growing old. End of Book 2, Part 1Book two, part two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume five, part four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume five, by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book two, part two. Lucerne, 15th August, 1832. The Capuchins went this morning, according to the custom, on the Feast of the Assumption, to bless the mountains. Those monks professed the religion under whose protection Swiss independence was born. That independence still endures. What will become of our modern liberty, all accursed by the blessing of the philosophers and the hangmen? It is not forty years old, and it has been sold and sold again, bishoped and dealt in at every street corner. There is more liberty in the frock of a capuchin blessing the Alps than in all the frippery of the legislators of the Republic, the Empire, the Restoration, and the Usurpation of July. A French traveller in Switzerland is touched and saddened. Our history, for the misfortune of those regions, is too closely connected with their history. The blood of Helvetia has been shed for us and by us. We wasted the hut of William Tell with fire and sword. We engaged in our civil wars the peasant warrior who guarded the throne of our kings. The genius of Thorwaldsen has fixed the memory of the 10th of August at the gate of Lucerne. The Helvetian lion lies dying, pierced by an arrow, and covering with its drooping head and one of its paws the escutcheon of France, of which we see only one of the fleur-de-lis. The chapel consecrated to the victims, the clump of green trees which accompanies the bas-relief sculptured in the rock, the soldier escaped from the massacre of the 10th of August, who shows the monument to strangers, the note from Louis XVI ordering the Swiss to lay down their arms, the frontal presented by Madame la Dauphine to the expiatory chapel, upon which that perfect model of sorrow has embroidered the image of the immolated Lamb of God. By what counsel does Providence, after the last fall of the throne of the Bourbons, send me to seek a refuge near this monument? At least I can look upon it without blushing. I can lay my feeble but not perjured hand upon the shield of France, even as the lion covers it with its mighty claws, now distended in death. Well, a member of the Diet has proposed to destroy this monument. What does Switzerland demand? Liberty? She has enjoyed it for four centuries. Equality, she has it. The Republic, it is her form of government. The lightening of taxes, she pays hardly any. What does she want, then? She wants to change. It is the law of beings. When a people, transformed by time, is no longer able to remain what it has been, the first symptom of its malady is a hatred of the past and of the virtues of its fathers. I returned from the monument to the 10th of August by the great covered bridge, a kind of wooden gallery hung over the lake. 238 triangular pictures, set between the rafters of the roof, adorn this gallery. They are popular annals in which the Swiss, as he passed, used to learn the story of his religion and his liberty. I have seen the tame moorfowl. I prefer the wild moorfowl of the pond at Combourg. In the town I was struck by the sound of a choir of voices. It issued from a lady chapel. I entered that chapel and thought myself carried back to the days of my childhood. In front of four devoutly decked altars, women were reciting the rosary and the litanies with the priest. It was like the evening prayer by the seashore in my poor Brittany, and I was on the shore of the lake of Lucerne. Thus did a man knot together the two ends of my life, the better to make me feel all that had been lost in the chain of my years. 
On the Lake of Lucerne, 16th August, 1832, noon. Alps, lower your crests. I am no longer worthy of you. Young, I should be solitary. Old, I am merely isolated. I would certainly depict my nature again, but for whom? Who would care for my pictures? What arms, other than those of time, would, in reward, embrace my genius with its stripped forehead? Who would repeat my songs? What muse should I inspire with any? Under the vault of my years, as under that of the snowy heights which surround me, no ray of sun will come to warm me. What a pity to drag across those heights tired footsteps which no one would care to follow! What a misfortune not to find myself free to wander anew until at the end of my life! Two o'clock. My bark has stopped at the landing stage of a house on the right bank of the lake, before entering the Bay of Uri. I climbed up to the orchard of that inn, and came to sit under two walnut trees which give shelter to a stable. Before me, a little to the right, on the opposite bank of the lake, the village of Schwitz unfolds itself among orchards and the inclined plains of those pastures called Alps in this part. It is surmounted by a rock broken into a semicircle, the two points of which, the Mithen and the Harken, the Mitre and the Hook, owe their names to their shapes. This horned capital rests upon turfy slopes, as the crown of the rude Helvetian independence rests on the head of a nation of shepherds. The silence around me is interrupted only by the tinkling of the bells of two heifers left in the neighbouring stable. They seem to ring out to me the glory of the pastoral liberty which Schwitz has given, with its name, to a whole people. A little canton in the neighbourhood of Naples called Italia has in the same way, but with less sacred rites, communicated its name to the land of the Romans. Three o'clock. We are starting. We are entering the bay or lake of Uri. The mountains grow taller and darker. There is the grass-grown ridge of the Grootli, and the three fountains at which first Arnold von Melchthal and Stauffacher swore to deliver their country. There, at the foot of the Axenberg, is the chapel that marks the place at which Tell, jumping from Gessler's bark, pushed it back with his foot to the midst of the billows. But did Tell and his companions ever exist? Might they not be only persons of the north, born in the songs of the scalds, whose heroic traditions are to be found on the shores of Sweden? Are the Swiss today what they were at the time when they won their independence? Those bare paths, see calashes roll along where Tell and his companions used to bound, bow in hand from peak to peak. Am I myself a traveller in harmony with these regions? A storm comes luckily to assail me. We are landing in a creek, at a few paces from Tell's chapel. It is always the same God that raises the winds, and the same confidence in that God that reassures men. As in former days, when crossing the ocean, the lakes of America, the seas of Greece, of Syria, I am writing on drenched paper. The clouds, the waves, the rolling of the thunder blend better with the ancient liberty of the Alps than the voice of that effeminate and degenerate nature which my century has placed in my bosom despite myself. Altdorf. I have disembarked at Fluellen and reached Altdorf, where the absence of horses will keep me one night at the foot of the Banberg. Here William Tell shot the apple from his son's head. The bow-shot was of the length that separates those two fountains. Let us believe, in spite of the fact that the same story was told by Saxo Grammaticus, as quoted first by myself in my essay sur les révolutions, let us have faith in religion and liberty, the two great things about man. Glory and power are brilliant, not great. Tomorrow, from the top of the saint Gotthard, I shall greet once again that Italy which I have greeted from the summit of the Simplon and the Mont Cenis. But of what avail is that last look cast upon the regions of the south and the dawn? The pine tree of the glaciers cannot descend among the orange trees which it sees below it in the flowery valleys. Ten o'clock in the evening. The storm is beginning again. The lightning flashes twist around the rocks. The echoes swell and prolong the sound of the thunder. The roaring of the Schurchen and the Reus welcome the bard of Armorica. It is long since I found myself alone and free. Nothing in the room in which I am locked. Two beds for a waking traveller who has neither loves to put to sleep nor dreams to dream. 
Those mountains, that storm, this night, are treasures lost for me. What life, nevertheless, I feel in the depths of my soul. Never, when the most ardent blood flowed from my heart into my veins, did I speak the language of the passions with such energy as I might do at this moment. It seems to me as though I saw myself of the Combourg woods issue from the flanks of the St. Gotthard. Hast thou come to see me again, O charming phantom of my youth? Hast thou pity for me? Thou seest I am changed only in face. Ever chimerical, devoured by a causeless and unfed fire, I am leaving the world, and I was entering it when I created thee in a moment of ecstasy and delirium. This is the hour at which I invoke thee in my tower. I can still open my window to let thee in. If thou art not satisfied with the charms which I lavished upon thee, I will make thee a hundred times more seductive. My palate is not exhausted. I have seen more beauties, and I know how to paint better than I did. Come to sit upon my knees. Do not be afraid of my hair. Stroke it with thy fairy or shadowy fingers. It will turn brown again under thy kisses. This head, which these falling hairs do not make wiser, is quite as mad as it was when I gave thee being, eldest daughter of my illusion, sweet fruit of my mysterious loves with my first solitude. Come, we will once more mount the clouds together. We will go with the lightning to plough, illumine, set fire to the precipices by which I shall pass to-morrow. Come, carry me away as in former days, but do not carry me back again. A knock at my door. It is not thou. It is the guide. The horses have arrived. We must start. Of this dream all that remains is the rain, the wind, and I. An endless dream, an eternal storm. 17th August, 1832, Amstek. From Oldorf to here, a valley between mountains close together, as one sees everywhere, the noisy rays in the middle. At the heart inn, a little German student, who has come from the wrong glaciers, and who said to me, You gone from Oldorf this morning. You go vast. He thought I was on foot, like himself. Then seeing my charabanc, Oh, horses, that's different. If the student were willing to swap his young legs for my charabanc, and my even worse car of glory, with what pleasure would I take his stick, his grey blouse, and his blond beard? I should go to the wrong glaciers. I should talk the language of Schiller to my mistress, and I should ponder deeply on Teutonic liberty. He would go his way, old as time, bored as one dead, undeceived by experience, having fastened round his neck like a bell, a fame by which he would be more wearied after a quarter of an hour than by the din of the Reyes. The exchange will not take place. Good bargains are not for my use. My scholar is going. He said to me, taking off and putting back his Teuton cap, with a little nod of the head, Per me? One more shadow vanished. The scholar does not know my name. He will have met me and will never know it. I am delighted with this idea. I yearn for obscurity with more eagerness than formerly I long for light. The latter worries me either as making my miseries visible, or as showing me objects which I can no longer enjoy. I am in a hurry to pass the torch to my neighbour. Three little boys are drawing the crossbow. William Tell and Gessler are everywhere. Free peoples retain the remembrance of the foundations of their independence. Ask a poor little boy in France if he has ever thrown the hatchet in memory of King Hlodwig or Clodwig, or Clovis. The new St. Gotthard Road, on leaving Amsteg, goes to and fro in a zigzag for two leagues, now joining the Reus, now quitting it, when the fissure of the torrent grows wider. On the perpendicular reliefs of the landscape, slopes flat or tufted with beech clumps, peaks shooting into the sky, domes topped with ice, summits bald or retaining a few stripes of snow, like locks of white hair. In the valley, Bridges, posts made of blackened planks, walnut trees and fruit trees, which gain in luxury of branches and leaves, what they lose in succulence of fruits. The alpine nature forces those trees to become wild again. The sap breaks through in spite of the grafting. A vigorous character bursts the bonds of civilization. A little higher, on the right margin of the rears, the scene changes. The stream flows with cascades in a pebbly rut, under a double and triple avenue of pines. This is like the valley of Pont d'Espagne, a cotteret. On the skirts of the mountain, the large trees grow on the sharp edges of the rock. Holding fast by their roots, they resist the shock of the tempests. 
The road and a few potato patches alone bear witness to man's presence in this spot. He must eat and he must walk. That sums up his history. The herds, consigned to the pasture lands in the loftier regions, do not appear in sight. Birds, none. Eagles, no question of them. The great eagle fell into the ocean when crossing to St. Helena. There is no flight so high or so strong, but falters in the immensity of the skies. The royal eaglet has just died. Other eaglets of July 1830 were announced to us. Apparently they have come down from their eyrie to nestle with the feather-legged pigeons. They will never carry off chamois and their talons. Weakened by the domestic light, their blinking glance will never contemplate from the summit of the St. Gotthard the free and dazzling sun of France's glory. After crossing the Pfaffensprung Bridge and passing round the pap of the village of Vassen, one again takes the right bank of the Reus. At either extremity, cascades gleam white among the sods, spread like green tapestries on the traveller's passage. Through a defile, one perceives the Rance Glacier, which joins the Furka Glaciers. At last, one makes one's way into the valley of Scholinen, where the first ascent of the St. Gotthard commences. This valley is a notch, two thousand feet in depth, cut out of a solid block of granite. The faces of the block form gigantic, overhanging walls. The mountains no longer present aught save their flanks and their ardent and reddened crests. The rays thunders down its vertical bed lined with stones. The ruin of a tower bears witness to a former time, even as nature here points to unremembered ages. Supported in the air by walls along the granite masses, the road, an immobile torrent, winds parallel to the mobile torrent of the rays. Here and there, stonework vaults form a shelter for the traveller against the avalanche. One turns for yet a few more paces in a sort of tortuous gallery, and suddenly, at one of the volutes of the shell, finds oneself face to face with the Devil's Bridge. This bridge today intersects the arch of the new bridge, which is higher, built behind it, and overlooks it. The old bridge thus debased no longer resembles anything but a short, two-storied aqueduct. The new bridge, when one comes from Switzerland, conceals the cascade at the back. To enjoy the rainbows and the leaping of the cascade, one must stand upon the bridge. But when one has seen the falls of Niagara, no waterfall remains. My memory is constantly contrasting my journeys with my journeys, mountains with mountains, rivers with rivers, forests with forests, and my life destroys my life. The same thing happens to me with respect to societies and men. The modern roads which the Simplon has taught us to make and which the Simplon effaces have not the picturesque effect of the old roads. The latter, bolder and more natural, avoided no difficulty. They scarcely deviated from the course of the torrents. They rose and descended with the ground, surmounted the rocks, plunged into the precipices, passed under the avalanches, taking nothing away from the pleasure of the imagination and the joy of danger. The old St. Gotthard Road, for instance, was adventurous in quite a different way from the present road. The Devil's Bridge deserved its reputation when, on approaching it, one saw the cascade of the rears above, and when it marked out an obscure arch, or rather a narrow path, through the gleaming spray of the fall. Then, at the end of the bridge, the road ascended perpendicularly to reach the chapel of which we still see the ruin. At least the inhabitants of Uri have had the pious thought of building another chapel at the cascade. Lastly, it was not men like ourselves who crossed the Alps in former days. It was hordes of barbarians or Roman legions, caravans of merchants, knights, condottieri, freebooters, pilgrims, prelates, monks. Strange adventures were related. Who built the Devil's Bridge? Who flung the Devil's Rock into the Vassental? Here and there rose castle keeps, crosses, oratories, monasteries, hermitages, preserving the memory of an invasion, a meeting, a miracle, or a misfortune. Each mountain tribe kept its language, its dress, its manners, its customs. It is true one did not find in a desert an excellent inn. One drank no champagne there, one read no newspapers. But if there were more robbers on the St. Gotthard, there were less cheats in society. What a fine thing is civilization! I leave that pearl to the handsome first lapidary. Suwarov and his soldiers were the last travellers in this defile, at the end of which they met Masena. After passing out from the Devil's Ridge and the Erneloch Tunnel, one reaches the Surintai, closed by Ridans, 
like the stone benches of an arena. The Reus flows peacefully in the midst of the verdure, the contrast is striking. It is thus that society seems tranquil after and before revolutions. Men and empires slumber at two steps from the abyss into which they are about to fall. At the village of hospital commences the second ascent, leading to the summit of the St. Gotthard, which is overrun by masses of granite. Those voluminous, swollen, broken masses, festoon at their tops with a few garlands of snow, resemble the fixed and frothy waves of an ocean of stone, upon which man has left the undulation of his road. Au pied du Mont Adieu, entre mille roseaux, le rein tranquille et fier du progrès de ses eaux, appuyé du main sur son urne penchante, donné au bruit flatteur de son onde naissante. Very fine lines, but inspired by the marble rivers of Versailles. The Rhine does not spring from a bed of reeds, it rises from a bed of hoar-frost. Its urn, or rather its urns, are of ice. Its origin is congenerous with those peoples of the north of which it became the adopted stream and the martial girdle. The Rhine, born of the St. Gotthard in the Grisons, sheds its water into the sea of Holland, Norway and England. The Rhone, also a child of the St. Gotthard, bears its tribute to the Neptune of Spain, Italy and Greece. Sterile snows form the reservoirs of the fecundity of the ancient world and the modern world. Two pools on the St. Gotthard tableland give birth, one to the Ticino, the other to the Reus. The source of the Reus is lower than the source of the Ticino, so that by digging a canal of a few hundred paces, one would throw the Ticino into the Reus. If one were to repeat this work in the case of the principal tributaries of those streams, one would produce strange metamorphoses in the regions at the foot of the Alps. A mountaineer can afford himself the pleasure of suppressing a river, of fertilising or sterilising a country. There is something to take down the pride of power. It is a marvellous thing to see the Reus and the Ticino bid each other an eternal farewell, and take their opposite ways down the two sides of the St. Gotthard. Their cradles touch, their destinies are separate. They go to seek different lands and different suns, but their mothers, always united, do not cease from the height of solitude to feed their disunited children. There was formerly on the St. Gotthard a hospice served by Capuchins. Now one sees only the ruins of it. There remains of religion but a cross of worm-eaten wood with its Christ. God remains when men withdraw. On the St. Gotthard upland, a desert in mid-sky, one world ends and another commences. The German names are replaced by Italian names. I take leave of my companion, the Reus, which had brought me, as I went up, from the lake of Lucerne, to go down to the lake of Lugano with my new guide, the Ticino. The St. Gothard is hewn perpendicularly on the Italian side. The road which plunges into the Val Tremola does credit to the engineer obliged to trace it in the narrowest gorge. Seen from above, this road is like a ribbon, folded and folded again. Seen from below, the walls supporting the embankments, give the impression of the works of a fortress, or resemble those dikes which are built one above the other to resist the invasion of the waters. Sometimes also the double row of milestones planted regularly on both sides of the road suggests a column of soldiers descending the Alps once more to invade unhappy Italy. Saturday, 18th August, 1832, Lugano. During the night I passed Airolo, Bellinzona, and the Val Levantina. I did not see the ground. I only heard the torrents. In the sky, the stars rose among the cupolas and needles of the mountains. The moon was not at first above the horizon, but her dawn spread before her by degrees, like those glories with which the fourteenth-century painters used to surround the head of the Virgin. She appeared at last, scooped out and reduced to a quarter of her disc, on the denticulated top of the firca. The tips of her crescent were like wings. One would have said of a white dove escaping from its nest in the rocks. By her light, enfeebled and rendered more mysterious, the hollowed-out luminary revealed to my eyes the Lago Maggiore at the end of the Val Levantina. Twice I had seen that lake, once when proceeding to the Congress of Verona, and again when going on my embassy to Rome. I then contemplated it in the sun, on the highway of prosperity. Now I caught a glimpse of it at night from the opposite bank on the road of misfortune. Between my journeys, separated by only a few years, 
a monarchy fourteen centuries old, had passed away. It is not that I bear those political revolutions the smallest grudge. By restoring me to liberty, they have restored me to my own nature. I have still pith enough to reproduce the first fruit of my dreams, fire enough to renew my connection with the imaginary creature of my desires. The time and the world which I have traversed have been for me but a double solitude, in which I have kept myself such as heaven made me. Why should I complain of the swiftness of the days, since I lived in one hour as much as those who spend years in living? Lugano is a little town of Italian aspect, porticos as at Bologna, people keeping house in the streets as at Naples, Renaissance architecture, roofs without cornices, long and narrow windows, bare or adorned with a pediment, and pierced up to the architrave. The town leans against a vine-grown hillside, commanded by two superposed mountain plains, one covered with pastures, the other with forests. The lake lies at its feet. On the topmost summit of a mountain to the east of Lugano exists a hamlet whose women, tall and fair-skinned, have the reputation of the Circassians. The eve of my arrival was the festival of that hamlet. People had gone on a pilgrimage to beauty. That tribe is doubtless some remains of a race of northern barbarians preserved unmixed above the populations of the plain. I have been taken to the different houses that had been mentioned to me as likely to suit me. I found one of them charming, but the rent was much too high. To see the lake better, I took a boat. One of my two boatmen spoke a Franco-Italian jargon interlarded with English. He told me the names of the mountains and of the villages on the mountains. The San Salvatore, from the summit of which one discovers the dome of Milan Cathedral, Castagnola, with its olive trees, of which the visitors put little twigs in their buttonholes, Gandria, the boundary of the canton of Ticino on the lake, the San Giorgio, crowned with its hermitage. Each of those places had its history. Austria, who takes all and gives nothing, retains at the foot of Monte Caprino a village enclosed in the Ticino territory. Facing this again on the other side, at the foot of the San Salvatore, she possesses a sort of promontory on which stands a chapel. But she has graciously lent this promontory to the Luganesi to execute their criminals upon and erect their gallows. Some day she will use this high jurisdiction, exercised by her permission upon her territory, as a proof of her suzerainty over Lugano. Nowadays the condemned are no longer subjected to the penalty of the rope. Their heads are chopped off. Paris has supplied the instrument. Vienna the scene of execution. Presence worthy of two great monarchies. These images were pursuing me when, on the azure water, to the breath of the breeze scented by the amber of the pines, there came to pass the boats of a brotherhood which flung bouquets of flowers into the lake to the sound of horns and oboas. The swallows sported around my sail. Among those travellers, shall I not recognise those which I met one evening, as I wandered along the ancient Tiber road and by the house of Horace? The Lydia of the Pert was not then with those swallows of the plain of Tiber, but I knew that, at that very moment, another young woman was furtively taking a rose laid in the abandoned garden of a villa of Raphael's century, seeking naught but a flower on the ruins of Rome. The mountains which surround the lake of Lugano, scarce joining their bases except on the level of the lake, resemble islands separated by narrow channels. They reminded me of the grace, the form, and the verdure of the archipelago of the Azores. Was I then going to consummate the exile of my last days under those smiling porticos, where the Princesse de Belgiorgioso allowed a few days to slip by of the exile of her youth? Was I then to finish my memoirs at the entrance to that classic and historic land, where Virgil and Tasso sang, where so many revolutions have been accomplished? Was I to recall my Breton destiny at the sight of those Ausonian mountains? If their curtain were to be raised, it would lay bare to me the plains of Lombardy, beyond that, Rome, beyond that, Naples, Sicily, Greece, Syria, Egypt, Carthage, distant shores which I have measured, I, who do not possess the extent of ground which I press under the soles of my feet. But yet, to die here, to end here, is it not what I want, what I am looking for? I cannot tell. Lucerne, 20th, 21st, and 22nd August, 1832. I left Lugano without sleeping there. I have recrossed the St. Gotthard. I have seen again what I had seen. I have found nothing to correct in my sketch. 
At Altdorf, everything was changed since twenty-four hours ago. No more storm, no more apparition in my lonely room. I came to spend the night in the inn at Fluelin, having twice covered the road the ends of which come out upon two lakes, and are held by two nations joined by the same political bond, and separate in every other respect. I crossed the lake of Lucerne. It had lost a portion of its merit in my eyes. It is to the lake of Lugano what the ruins of Rome are to the ruins of Athens, the fields of Sicily to the gardens of Armida. For the rest, it is vain for me to exert myself to attain the alpine exaltation of the mountain authors. I waste my pains. Physically, that virgin and balmy air, which is supposed to revive my strength, rarefy my blood, clear my tired head, give me an insatiable hunger, a dreamless sleep, produces none of those effects for me. I breathe no better. My blood circulates no faster. My head is no less heavy under the sky of the Alps than in Paris. I have as much appetite in the Champs-Élysées as on the mont I sleep as well in the Rue Saint-Dominique as on the mont saint gothard And if I have dreams in the delicious plain of Montrouge, the fault lies with the sleep. Morally, in vain do I scale the rocks. My mind becomes no loftier for it, my soul no purer. I carry with me the cares of earth and the weight of human turpitudes. The calm of the sublunary region of a marmot is not communicated to my awakened senses. Poor wretch that I am, across the mists that roll at my feet I always perceive the full-blown face of the world. A thousand fathoms climbed into space change nothing in my view of the sky. God appears no greater to me from the top of a mountain than from the bottom of a valley. If, to become a robust man, a saint, a towering genius, it were merely a question of searing over the clouds, why do so many sick men, miscreants and fools, not take the trouble to climb out the Simplon? Surely they must be very obstinately bent upon their infirmities. The landscape is created only by the sun. It is the light that makes the landscape. A Carthaginian shore, a heath on the edge of Sorrento, a border of dried canes in the Roman Campania are more magnificent when lit up by the rays of the setting sun or the dawn than all the Alps on this side of the Gauls. Those holes, which they call valleys, where one sees nothing at full noonday, those high fixed screens dubbed mountains, those soiled torrents which bellow with the cows on their banks, those violet-coloured faces, those goitrous necks, those dropsical bellies, a plague upon them. If the mountains of our climes can justify the panegyrics of their admirers, it is only when they are wrapped in the night of which they thicken the chaos. The effect of their angles, their protuberances, their sweeping lines, their immense projected shadows is heightened by moonlight. The stars carve and engrave them on the sky in pyramids, cones, obelisks, in an architecture of alabaster, now casting over them a gauzy veil and harmonising them with uncertain tints, faintly washed with blue now sculpturing them one by one and separating them by lines of great precision. Every valley, every reduct, with its lakes, its rocks, its forests, becomes a temple of silence and solitude. In winter the mountains offer us the image of the polar zones. In autumn, under a rainy sky, in their different shades of darkness, they resemble grey, black, beast lithographs. The tempests also suit them, as to the vapours, half mists, half clouds, which roll at their feet or hang suspended at their flanks. But are the mountains not favourable to meditations, to independence, to poetry? Do fine deep solitudes mingled with sea receive nothing from the soul, add nothing to its delights? Does a sublime nature not render us more susceptible to passion, and does passion not make us better understand a sublime nature? Is an intimate love not increased by the vague love of all the beauties of the senses, and the intelligence which surround it, even as similar principles attract and blend with one another? Does not the feeling of the infinite, entering through a vast spectacle into a limited feeling, grow and spread to the boundaries at which commences an eternity of life? I admit all this, but let us well understand one another. It is not the mountains that exist such as we think that we see them then. It is the mountains as the passions, the talents, and the muses have drawn their lines, coloured their skies, their snows, their peaks, their declivities, 
their irised cascades, their soft atmosphere, their light and tender shadows. The landscape is on Claude Lorraine's palette, not on the Campo Vaccino. Make me to love, and you shall see that a solitary apple tree, where the beaten flung crooked wise amid the wheat fields of the Beauce, the flower of an arrowhead in a marsh, a little water course in a road, a scrap of moss, a fern, a tuft of maidenhair fern on the side of a rock, a moist, smoky sky, a tomtit in a vicarage garden, a swallow flying low on a rainy day, under the thatch of a barn or along a cloister, even a bat taking the place of the swallow around a country steeple, fluttering on its gauzy wings in the last gloaming of the twilight. All these little things, attached to a few memories, will become enchanted by the mystery of my happiness, or the sadness of my regrets. On the upshot, it is the youth of life, it is the persons that make fine sights. The ice flows of Baffin's Bay can be smiling with company after one's heart, the banks of the Ohio and the Ganges mournful in the absence of all affection. A poet has said, La patrie est au lieu où l'âme est enchantée. It is the same with beauty. Here is too much about mountains. I love them as great solitudes. I love them as the frame, the border and the distance of a fine picture. I love them as the rampart and refuge of liberty. I love them as adding something infinite to the passions of the soul, equitably and reasonably. That is all the good to be said of them. If I am not to settle down on the other side of the Alps, my journey across the St. Gotthard will remain a disconnected fact, an optical view in the midst of the pictures of my memoirs. I will put out the lamp, and Lugano will relapse into darkness. Scarce arrived at Lucerne, I quickly hastened once more to the cathedral, the Hofkirche, built on the site of a chapel dedicated to St. Nicholas, the patron saint of sailors. This primitive chapel served also as a beacon, for during the night it was seen lighted up in a supernatural manner. It was Irish missionaries that preached the gospel in the almost desert country of Lucerne. They brought it the liberty which their unhappy motherland has not enjoyed. When I returned to the cathedral, a man was digging a grave. In the church they were finishing a service around a bier, and a young woman was having a child's cap blessed at an altar. She placed it with a visible expression of joy in a basket which she carried on her arm, and went away laden with her treasure. The next day I found the grave in the cemetery closed up, a vessel of holy water placed on the fresh earth, and some fennel seeds sprinkled for the little birds. Already they were alone, beside that corpse of a night. I took some walks in the neighbourhood of Lucerne, in magnificent pine woods. The bees, whose hives are placed above the farm doors, under the shelter of the overhanging roofs, live with the peasants. I saw the famous Clara Wendell go to mass behind her companions in captivity, in her prison dress. She is very common. I found in her the look of all those brutes in France who are present at so many murders, without, for that reason, being more distinguished than a fierce beast, in spite of all that the theory of crime and the admiration of slaughter would attribute to them. A simple foot soldier armed with a carbine here takes the convicts to perform their day's work and brings them back to the prison. This evening I prolonged my walk along the Reuss to a chapel built on the road. One goes up to it by a little Italian portico. From this portico I saw a priest praying alone on his knees inside the oratory, while on the top of the mountains I saw the last gleams of the setting sun. On returning to Lucerne, I heard women saying the rosary in the cottages. The voices of children made the responses to the maternal adoration. I stopped. I listened through the twining vines to those words addressed to God from within a hut. The comely and graceful young girl who waits on me at the Golden Eagle also most regularly says her angelus as she draws the curtains of the windows in my room. When I come in, I give her a few flowers which I have gathered. She says to me, gently patting her breast with her hand, Per me? I answer, for you. There our conversation ends. Lucerne, 26th August, 1832. Madame de Chateaubriand has not yet arrived. I shall take a trip to Constance. M. A. Dumas is here. I had already seen him at David's while he was being modelled by the great sculptor. Madame de Colbert with her daughter, Madame de Branca, is also passing through Lucerne. It was at Madame de Colbert's in Beauce that, nearly twenty years ago, I wrote, in these memoirs, 
the story of my youth at Combourg. The places seem to travel with me. They are as mobile, as fleeting as my life. The mail post brings me a very fine letter from Monsieur de Béranger, in reply to that which I wrote to him on leaving Paris. This letter has already been printed as a note with a letter from Monsieur Carrel in the Congress de Véron. Geneva, September 1832. Going from Lucerne to Constance, one passes through Zurich and Winterthur. Nothing pleased me at Zurich except the memory of Lavater and Gesner, the trees of an esplanade overlooking the lakes, the course of the Limat, an old crow and an old elm. I prefer this to all Zurich's historic past, with due deference even to the Battle of Zurich. Napoleon and his captains, passing from victory to victory, brought the Russians to Paris. Winterthur is a new and industrial little market town, or rather, one long clean street. Constance has an air of belonging to nobody. It is open to all the world. I entered it on the 27th of August, without seeing a custom-house officer or a soldier, and without being asked for my passport. Madame Ricamier had arrived three days earlier, to pay a visit to the Queen of Holland. I was waiting for Madame de Chateaubriand, who was coming to join me at Lucerne. I proposed to weigh whether it would not be preferable to settle first in Swabia, remaining free to go down into Italy later. In the decayed town of Constance, the inn was very gay. They were making preparations for a wedding. The day after my arrival, Madame Ricamier wanted to escape the rejoicings of our hosts. We took a boat on the lake, and, crossing the sheet of water from which the Rhine flows to become a river, we reached a strand of a park. Setting foot on land, we passed through a hedge of willows, on the other side of which we found a sanded walk, winding among thickets of shrubs, groups of trees and grassy lawns. A summer-house stood in the middle of the gardens, and an elegant villa leant against a forest of old trees. I noticed on the grass some meadow saffron, always melancholy for me because of the reminiscences of my various and numerous autumns. We strolled at random, and then sat down on a bench at the edge of the water. From the summer-house in the grove rose harmonies of harp and horn, which ceased when, charmed and surprised, we began to listen. It was a scene from a fairy tale. The harmonies did not recommence, and I read to Madame Ricamier my description of the saint Gothard. She asked me to write something on her tablets, already half filled with details of the death of J.J. Rousseau. Below these last words of the author of the Eloise, Wife, open the window, that I may see the sun again, I wrote these words in pencil. What I wanted on the lake of Lucerne, I have found on the lake of Constance, the charm and intelligence of beauty. I do not want to die like Rousseau. I want to see the sun for long, if I am to end my life near you. Let my days expire at your feet, like those waves whose murmur you love. 28th August, 1832. The blue of the lake kept watch behind the foliage. On the southern horizon gathered the summits of the Guisson Alps. A breeze passing to and fro across the willows harmonised with the rise and fall of the billows. We saw no one. We did not know where we were. As we returned to Constance, we saw Madame la Duchesse de saint lieu and her son Louis-Napoleon. They came up to Madame Recamier. I had not known the Queen of Holland under the Empire. I knew that she had shown herself generous at the time of my resignation on the death of the Duc d'Anguien, and when I tried to save my cousin Armand. Under the Restoration, when ambassador in Rome, I had had only relations of politeness with Madame la Duchesse de saint lieu Unable to go to her myself, I had left the secretaries and attachés free to pay their court to her, and I had invited Cardinal Fesch to a diplomatic dinner of cardinals. Since the last fall of the Restoration, chance had made me exchange a few letters with Queen Hortense and Prince Louis. These letters are a rather singular monument of faded grandeurs. Here they are. Madame de saint lieu after reading the last letter of Monsieur de Chateaubriand. Arenenberg, 15th October, 1831. Monsieur de Chateaubriand has too much genius not to have understood the whole extent of the Emperor Napoleon's. But his so brilliant imagination required more than admiration. Memories of youth and illustrious fortune attracted his heart. He devoted his person and talent to them, and, like the poet who lends to everything the sentiment which animates him, 
he clothed what he loved with the features which were to kindle his enthusiasm. Ingratitude did not discourage him, for misfortune was always there to draw it to him. Nevertheless, his wit, his reason, his truly French sentiments, make him the antagonist of his party in spite of himself. He loves, of the olden times, only honour which makes men faithful, and religion which makes men good. The glory of his country which makes its strength, liberty of conscience and opinion, which gives a noble impulse to the faculties of men, the aristocracy of merit, which opens up a career to every intelligence, these constitute his domain more than any others. He is therefore a liberal, a Napoleonist, and even a republican, rather than a royalist, and therefore new France, its new lights, would know how to appreciate him whereas he will never be understood by those whom he has set so near to the divinity in his heart. And, if there be now naught left for him but to sing unhappiness, were it the most interesting, high misfortunes have become so common in this age of ours, that his brilliant imagination, without any real object or motive, will die out for want of nutriment sufficiently lofty to inspire his fine talent. Hortense. After reading a note signed Hortense. Monsieur de Chateaubriand is exceedingly flattered and in the highest degree grateful for the sentiments of goodwill so gracefully expressed in the first part of the note. In the second there lurks the seductiveness of a woman and a queen, which might carry with it a self-love less sophisticated than Monsieur de Chateaubriand's. There are certainly today plenty of occasions of infidelity among such high and numerous misfortunes, but at the age to which Monsieur de Chateaubriand has attained, Reverses which reckon but few years would scorn his homage. Needs, therefore, must he remain attached to his old unhappiness, however much he might be tempted by younger adversities. Chateaubriand. Paris, 6 November, 1831. Prince Louis Napoleon. To the Vicomte de Chateaubriand. Arenenberg, 4th May, 1832. Monsieur le Vicomte. I have just read your last pamphlet. How happy the Bourbons are to be supported by a genius such as yours! You raise a cause with the same arms that have served to lay it low. You find words that send a thrill through every French heart. All that is national finds an echo in your soul. Thus, when you speak of the great man who rendered France illustrious during twenty years, the loftiness of the subject inspires you. Your genius embraces it entirely, and then your mind, naturally pouring itself out, surrounds the greatest glory with the greatest thoughts. I too, Monsieur le Vicomte, grow enthusiastic on behalf of all that contributes to the honour of my country. That is why, giving vent to my impulse, I venture to express to you the sympathy which I feel for one who displays so much patriotism and so much love of liberty. But permit me to tell you, you are the only formidable defender of the old monarchy. You would make it national, if one could believe that it would think as you do. And so, to give it any worth, it is not enough to declare yourself on its side, but rather to prove that it is on yours. However, Monsieur le Vicomte, if we differ in opinions, at least we are agreed in the wishes which we form for France's happiness. Pray accept, etc., etc. Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. The Vicomte de Chateaubriand to the Comte de saint lier Prince Louis Napoleon. Paris, 19th May, 1832. Monsieur le Comte. It is never easy to reply to praises, but when he who awards them with as much wit as propriety is moreover in a social condition to which peerless memories are attached, then the difficulty is doubled. At least, monsieur, we meet in a common sympathy. You with your youth, as I with my old days, desire the honour of France. It needed no more for either of us to die of confusion or laughter than to see the juste milieu blockaded in Ancona by the soldiers of the Pope. Ah, monsieur, where is your uncle? To others than yourself, I should say, where is the guardian of kings and the master of Europe? In defending the cause of the legitimacy, I entertain no illusions, but I think that every man who cares for public esteem must remain faithful to his oaths. Lord Falkland, a friend of liberty and an enemy of the court, got himself killed at Newbury in the army of Charles I. You shall live, Monsieur le Comte, to see your country free and happy. You are passing through ruins among which I shall remain, because I myself form part of those ruins. 
I had for a moment entertained the flattering hope of laying the tribute of my respect this summer at the feet of Madame la Duchesse de saint leu Fortune, accustomed to baffle my plans, has deceived me once again. I should have been happy to thank you by word of mouth for your obliging letter. We should have spoken of a great glory and of France's future. Two things, Monsieur le Comte, which touch you nearly. Chateaubriand. Have the Bourbons ever written letters to me similar to those which I have just produced? Did they ever entertain the idea that I rose above this versifier or that pamphleteering politician? When, as a little boy, I used to wander, the companion of the herdsman, over the heaths of Combourg, could I have believed that a time would come at which I should walk between the two highest powers on earth, powers now overthrown, giving my arm on one side to the family of St. Louis, on the other to that of Napoleon, hostile magnificences which alike lean in the misfortune which brings them together, on the feeble and faithful man, the man scorned by the legitimacy. Madame Ricamier went to fix herself at Wolfsburg, a country house occupied by Monsieur Paquin, near Arenenburg, where Madame la Duchesse de saint leu was living. I stayed two days at Constance. I saw all that there was to see. The market containing the public granary christened the Hall of the Council, the so-called Statue of Huss, the square in which Jerome of Prague and John Huss were, they say, burnt, in fine, all the ordinary abominations of history and society. The Rhine, issuing from the lake, announces itself very much like a king. Nevertheless, it was not able to defend Constance, which was, if I am not mistaken, sacked by Attila, besieged by the Hungarians, the Swedes, and twice taken by the French. Constance is the Saint-Germain of Germany. The old people of the old society have retired to it. When I knocked at a door to look for rooms for Madame de Chateaubriand, I came upon some canoness, a girl past her minority, some prince of an ancient house, an elector on half pay, which went very well with the abandoned steeples and the deserted convents of the city. Condé's army fought gloriously under the walls of Constance, and seems to have left its ambulance there. I had the misfortune to meet a veteran emigrant. He did me the honour to have known me in former times. He had more days than hairs, his words were endless, he was unable to contain himself, and allowed his years to run. End of Book 2, Part 2book two part three of the memoirs of chateaubriand volume five part four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by nicole lee the memoirs of chateaubriand volume five by francois rene de chateaubriand translated by alexander texera de matos book two part three on the twenty ninth of august i went to dine at arenenburg arenenburg stands on a sort of promontory in a chain of steep hills the queen of holland whom the sword had made and whom the sword had unmade built the chateau or if you prefer the summer-house of arenenburg from it one enjoys an extensive but melancholy view this view commands the lower lake of constance which is only an expansion of the rhine over swamped fields on the other side of the lake one sees gloomy woods, remains of the black forest, a few white birds fluttering under a grey sky, and driven by an icy wind. There, after having sat on a throne, after being outrageously slandered, Queen Hortense came to perch upon a rock. Below is the isle of the lake on which, they say, the tomb of Charles the Fat was discovered, and on which at present canaries are dying which ask in vain for the son of their native islands. Madame la Duchesse de saint leu was better off in Rome. Nevertheless, she has not descended in proportion to her birth and her early life. On the contrary, she has risen. Her abasement is only relative to an accident of her fortune. This is not one of those descents like that of Madame la Dauphine, who has fallen from all the height of the centuries. The companions, male and female, of Madame la Duchesse de saint leu were her son, Madame Sauvage, Madame, by way of visitors, there were Madame Récamier, Monsieur Vieillard, and myself. Madame la Duchesse de saint acquitted herself very well, 
in her difficult position as a queen and a demoiselle de Beauharnais. After dinner, Madame de Sanlier sat down to her piano with Monsieur Cotreau, a tall young painter in moustachios, a straw hat, a blouse, a turned-down shirt collar, an eccentric costume, who hunted, painted, sang, laughed, in a witty and noisy fashion. Prince Louis occupies a summer-house standing apart, where I saw arms, topographical, and strategical charts, industries which made one, as though by accident, think of the blood of the conqueror without naming him. Prince Louis is a studious and well-informed young man, full of honour and naturally grave. Madame la Duchesse de saint leu read me a few fragments of her memoirs. She showed me a cabinet filled with relics of Napoleon. I asked myself why this wardrobe left me cold, why that little hat, that sash, that uniform, worn at such and such a battle, found me so indifferent. I was much more perturbed when writing of the death of Napoleon at St. Helena. The reason of this is that Napoleon is our contemporary. We have all seen him and known him. He lives in our memory, but the hero is still too close to his glory. A thousand years hence it will be a different thing. It is only the centuries that have lent a perfume to Alexander's sweat. Let us wait. Of a conqueror, one should show only the sword. I returned to Wolfsburg with Madame Recamier and set out at night. The weather was dark and rainy, the wind whistled through the trees, and the wood-owl hooted, a real Germanian scene. Madame de Chateaubriand soon arrived at Lucerne. The dampness of the town frightened her, and, as Lugano was too dear, we decided to come to Geneva. We took our route over Sempach. The lake preserves the memory of a battle, which ensured the enfranchisement of the Swiss, at a time when the nations on this side of the Alps had lost their liberties. Beyond Sempach, we passed before the Abbey of St. Urban's, crumbling like all the monuments of Christianity. It stands in a melancholy spot, on the skirt of a heath which leads to a wood. If I had been free and alone, I would have asked the monks for a hole in their walls, there to finish my memoirs beside an owl. Then I should have gone to end my days in doing nothing, under the beautiful do-nothing sun of Naples or Palermo. But beautiful countries in springtime have become insults, disasters, and regrets. On reaching Bern, we were told that there was a great revolution in progress in the city. I looked in vain. The streets were deserted, silence reigned. The terrible revolution was realised without a word, to the peaceful smoke of a pipe in the corner of some coffee-house. Madame Recamier was not long in joining us at Geneva. Geneva, end of September, 1832. I have begun to take up my work again seriously. I write in the morning and walk in the evening. Yesterday I went to pay a visit to Coppet. The house was shut up. They opened the doors for me. I wandered through the deserted rooms. The companion of my pilgrimage recognised all the places where she still seemed to see her friend seated at her piano, or coming in or going out, or talking on the terrace alongside of the gallery. Madame Recamier has seen again the room which she used to occupy. Days gone by have come up again before her. It was like a rehearsal of the scene which I described in René. I passed through the sonorous apartments where nothing was heard but the sound of my footsteps. Everywhere the rooms were without hangings, and the spider spun its web in the abandoned couches. How sweet, but how rapid, are the moments which brothers and sisters pass in their youthful years, gathered under the wing of their old parents. Man's family is but of a day. God's breath disperses it like a bubble. The son has scarce time to know the father, the father, the son, the brother, the sister, the sister, the brother. The oak sees its acorn shoot up around itself. It is not thus with the children of men. I also remembered what I said in these memoirs of my last visit to Combourg before leaving for America. Two different worlds, but connected by a common sympathy, occupied Madame Recamier and myself. Alas, each of us carries within himself one of those isolated worlds. For where are the persons who have lived long enough together not to have separate memories? From the chateau we entered the park. The early autumn began to redden and to loosen a few leaves. The wind fell by degrees and let one hear a stream that turns a mill. After following the alleys along which she had been accustomed to walk with Madame de Stael, Madame Recamier wanted to greet her ashes. At some distance from the park stands a coppice mingled with taller trees, 
and surrounded by a damp and dilapidated wall. This coppice resembles those clusters of trees in the midst of plains which sportsmen call covers. It is there that death has driven its prey and shut up its victims. A burial place had been built beforehand in that wood to receive Monsieur Necker, Madame Necker and Madame de Stael. When the last of these arrived at the trysting place, they walled up the door of the crypt. The child of Auguste de Stael remained outside, and Auguste himself, who died before his child, was laid under a stone at his relation's feet. On the stone are carved these words taken from scripture. Why seek you the living with the dead? I did not go into the wood. Madame Recamier alone obtained permission to enter it. Remaining seated on a bench before the surrounding wall, I turned my back on France, and fixed my eyes now on the summit of Mont Blanc, now on the lake of Geneva. The golden clouds covered the horizon behind the dark line of the Jura. It was as though a halo of glory were rising above a long coffin. On the other side of the lake I saw Lord Byron's house, the ridge of which was touched by a ray of the setting sun. Rousseau was no more there to admire that spectacle, and Voltaire, who had also disappeared, had never cared about it. It was at the foot of the tomb of Madame de Stael that so many illustrious absentees on the same shore presented themselves to my recollection. They seemed to come to seek the shade their equal to fly away into the sky with her and escort her during the night. At that moment Madame Recamier, pale and in tears, came out from the funeral grove, herself like a shadow. If ever I have felt at one time the vanity and the verity of glory and life, it was at the entrance of that silent, dark, unknown wood, where she sleeps who had so much lustre and fame, and when seeing what it is to be truly loved. That same evening, the day after my devotions to the dead of Coppet, tired of the edge of the lake, I went, still with Madame Recamier, in search of less frequented walks. We discovered, going down the Rhone, a narrow gorge through which the stream flows bubbling under several mills, between rocky cliffs intersected by meadows. One of these meadows stretches at the foot of a hill on which a house is planted amid a cluster of elms. We several times climbed and descended, talking the while, this narrow strip of grass which separates the boisterous stream from the silent hillock. How many persons are there whom one can weary with what one has been and carry back with one on the track of one's days? We spoke of those days, always painful and always regretted, in which the passions form the happiness and the martyrdom of youth. Now I am writing this page at midnight, while all is at rest around me, and through my window I see a few stars glimmering over the Alps. Madame Recamier is going to leave us. She will return in the spring, and I shall spend the winter in evoking my vanished hours, in summoning them one by one before the tribunal of my reason. I do not know if I shall be very impartial, nor if the judge will not be too indulgent towards the culprit. I shall spend next summer in the land of Jean-Jacques. God grant that I may not catch the dreamer's malady. And then, when autumn shall have returned, we shall go to Italy. Italian, that is my eternal refrain. Geneva, October 1832. Prince Louis Napoleon, having given me his pamphlet entitled Reverie Politique, I wrote him this letter. Prince, I have read attentively the little pamphlet which you were so good as to entrust to me. I have jotted down, as you wished, a few reflections, springing naturally from yours, which I had already submitted to your judgment. You know, Prince, that my young king is in Scotland, that, so long as he lives, there can be no other king of France for me than he. But if God, in his impenetrable counsels, had rejected the house of St. Louis, if the habits of our country did not render the Republican state possible, there is no name which goes better with the glory of France and yours. I am, etc., etc., Chateaubriand. Paris, Rue d'Enfer, January 1833. I had dreamt much of that approaching future which I had made for myself, and which I thought so near. At nightfall I used to go wandering in the windings of the Arve, in the direction of Salève. One evening I saw Monsieur Berrier enter. He was returning from Lausanne, and told me of the arrest of Madame la Duchesse de Berry. He did not know any details. My plans for repose were once more upset. When the mother of Henry V believed in her success, she discharged me. Her misfortune destroyed her last note and recalled me to her defence. 
I started on the spot from Geneva after writing to the ministers. On arriving in my Rue d'Enfer, I addressed the following circular letter to the editors of the newspapers. Sir, I arrived in Paris on the 17th of this month and wrote on the 18th to Monsieur the Minister of Justice to ask if the letter which I had had the honour to send him from Geneva on the 12th for Madame la Duchesse de Berry had reached him and if he had had the goodness to forward it to Madame. I begged Monsieur the Keeper of the Seals at the same time to give me the necessary authorization to go to the Princess at Blaye. Monsieur the Keeper of the Seals was so good as to reply on the 19th that he had handed my letters to the President of the Council and that I must apply to the latter. I wrote consequently on the 20th to Monsieur the Minister for War. Today, the 22nd, I receive his answer of the 21st. He regrets to be under the necessity of informing me that the government does not consider it expedient to grant my request. This decision has put an end to my applications to the authorities. I have never, sir, pretended to think myself capable of defending unaided the cause of misfortune and of France. My plan, if I had been permitted to reach the feet of the august prisoner, was to propose to her in this emergency the formation of a council of men more enlightened than myself. In addition to the honourable and distinguished persons that have already come forward, I would have taken the liberty to suggest to Madame's choice Monsieur le Marquis de Pastoret, Monsieur Lenné, Monsieur de Villel, etc., etc. Now, sir, that I am officially turned away, I return to my right as a private individual. My memoir sur la vie et la mort de Monsieur le Duc de Berry, wrapped in the hair of the widow, today a captive, lie near the heart which Louvel made to resemble even more that of Henry the Fourth. I have not forgotten that signal honour of which the present moment asks me for a reckoning and makes me feel all the responsibility. I am, sir, etc., etc., Chateaubriand. While I was writing this circular letter to the newspapers, I found means to have the following note handed to Madame la Duchesse de Berry. Paris, 23rd November, 1832. Madame. I had the honour to address to you from Geneva an earlier letter dated the 12th of this month. This letter, in which I begged you to do me the honour to choose me as one of your defenders, has been printed in the newspapers. Your Royal Highness' cause may be taken up by all those who, without being authorised to do so, might have useful truths to make known. But, if Madame wishes that it be carried on in her own name, it is not one man but a council of men, of politicians and lawyers, that must be charged with this high affair. In that case, I would ask that Madame would consent to assign to me as coadjutors, with the persons whom she would have already selected, Monsieur le Comte de Pasteret, Monsieur E. de Neuville, Monsieur de Villel, Monsieur Lenné, Monsieur Roy Collard, Monsieur Pardessieux, Monsieur Mondarou Vertami, Monsieur de Vaufrelon. I had also thought, Madame, that one might summon to this council a few men of great talent and of an opinion contrary to ours. But perhaps it would be to place them in a false position, to oblige them to make a sacrifice of honour and principle, to which lofty minds and upright consciences do not readily lend themselves. Chateaubriand. An old disciplined soldier, I was therefore hastening up to take my place in the ranks and to march under my captains. Reduced by the will of the authorities to a duel, I accepted it, I had scarcely expected to come from the tomb of the husband to fight by the tomb of the widow. Supposing that I were bound to remain alone, that I had misunderstood what suits France, I was none the less in the path of honour. Nor is it of little use for men that a man should immolate himself to his conscience. It is good that someone should consent to ruin himself, to remain steadfast to principles of which he is convinced, and which have to do with what is noble in our nature. Those dupes are the necessary contestants of the brutal fact, the victims charged to utter the veto of the oppressed against the triumph of might. We praise the Poles. Is their devotion other than a sacrifice? It has saved nothing. It could save nothing, even in the minds of my opponents. Will that devotion be barren of results for the human race? I prefer family before my country, they say. No. Nope. I prefer fidelity to my oaths before perjury, the moral world before material society. That is all. In so far as the family is concerned, I devote myself to it because it was essentially beneficial to France. I confound its posterity with that of the country and, when I deplore the misfortunes of the one, 
I deplore the disasters of the other. Beaten, I have prescribed duties to myself, even as the victors have laid interests upon themselves. I am trying to withdraw from the world with my self-respect. In solitude we have to be careful whom we choose for our companion. In France, the land of vanity, so soon as an occasion offers for making a fuss, a crowd of people seize it. Some act from good-heartedness, others from their consciousness of their own merits. I therefore had many competitors. They begged, as I had done, of Madame la Duchesse de Berry, the honour to defend her. At least my presumption in offering myself to the princess as a champion was a little justified by former services, though I did not fling the sword of Brennus into the scale. At least I put my name there. However unimportant that may be, it had already gained some victories for the monarchy. I opened my memoir sur la captivité de Madame la Duchesse de Berry, with a consideration by which I am forcibly struck. I have often reprinted it, and it is probable that I shall reprint it again. We never cease, I said, to be astonished at events. Ever we imagine that we have come to the last. Ever the revolution recommences. Those who, since forty years, are marching to reach the goal, repine. They thought they were sitting for a few hours by the edge of their tomb. Vain hope! Time strikes those travellers gasping for breath and forces them to move onward. How many times, since they have been on the road, has the old monarchy fallen at their feet, scarce escaped from those successive crumblings? They are obliged once more to pass over its rubbish and its dust. Which century will see the end of the movement? Providence has will that the transient generations, destined for unremembered days, should be small, in order that the damage might not be great. And so we see that everything proves abortive, that everything is inconsistent, that no one is like himself or embraces his whole destiny, that no event produces what it contained and what it ought to produce. The superior men of the age which is expiring are dying away. Will they have successors? The ruins of Palmyra end in sands. Passing from this general observation to particular facts, I show in my reasoning that they might deal with Madame la Duchesse de Berry by arbitrary measures, regarding her as a prisoner of police, of war, or state, or asking the chambers to pass a bill of attainder, that they might bring her within the competence of the laws, by applying to her the Brickville law of exception, or the common law of the code, that they might regard her person as inviolable and sacred. The ministers maintain the first opinion, the men of July the second, the royalists the third. I go through the several suppositions. I prove that, if Madame la Duchesse de Berry made a descent upon France, she had been th drawn thither only because she heard men's opinions asking for a different present, calling for a different future. False to its popular extraction, the revolution proceeding from the days of July repudiated glory and courted shame, except in a few hearts worthy of giving it an asylum, liberty, become the object of the derision of those who made it their rally and cry, that liberty which buffoons bandy about with kicks, that liberty strangled after dishonour by the tourniquet of the laws of exception, will, through its destruction, transform the revolution of 1830 into a cynical fraud. Thereupon, and to deliver us all, Madame la Duchesse de Berry arrived. Fortune betrayed her, a Jew sold her, a minister bought her. If they are not willing to proceed against her by police measures, the only alternative is to indict her at the Assizes. I suppose this to have been done, and I bring on the stage the Princess's defending counsel. Then, after making the defending counsel speak, I address the counsel for the prosecution. Advocate, stand up. Establish learnedly that Caroline Ferdinand of Sicily, widow de Berry, niece of the late Marie Antoinette of Austria, widow Capet, is guilty of opposition to a man, the reputed uncle and guardian of an orphan called Henry, which uncle and guardian is said, according to the calumnious allegation of the prisoner, unlawfully to detain the crown of a ward, which ward impudently pretends to have been king from the day of the abdication of the ex-king Charles X and the ex-dauphin till the day of the election of the king of the French. In support of your argument, let the judges first call up Louis-Philippe, as evidence for or against the prisoner, 
unless he prefer to excuse himself as a kinsman. Next, let the judges confront the prisoner and the descendant of the great traitor. Let this carry it into whom Satan had entered, say how many pieces of silver he received for the bargain. Then it will be proved by those who have examined the spot that the prisoner for six hours suffered the Gehenna of fire in a space too narrow for her, in which four people could hardly breathe, which caused the tortured person contumeliously to say that they were making war upon her as though she were St. Lawrence. Now Caroline Ferdinand, being pressed by her accomplices against the red-hot slab, her clothes twice caught fire, and at each blow of the gendarme on the outside of the fiery furnace, the shock was communicated to the prisoner's heart, causing her to vomit blood. Next, in the presence of the image of Christ, they will lay on the desk, as a piece of direct evidence, the burnt garments, for there must always be lots cast upon garments in these Judas bargains. Madame la Duchesse de Berry was set at liberty by an arbitrary act of the authorities, after they thought that they had dishonoured her. The picture which I drew of the proceedings made Philip see the invidiousness of a public trial, and determined him to grant a pardon to which he believed that he had attached a punishment. The pagans, under Severus, used to throw to the lions a newly delivered young Christian woman. My pamphlet, of which only some phrases survive, had its important historical result. I am melted again as I copy out the apostrophe which ends my work. It is, I admit, a foolish waste of tears. Illustrious captive of Blay, madame, may your heroic presence in a land which knows something of heroism lead France to repeat to you what my political independence has won for me the right to say. Madame, your son is my king. If providence inflict yet a few hours upon me, shall I behold your triumphs, after having had the honour of embracing your adversities? Shall I receive that guerdon of my faith? At the moment when you return happy, I would joyfully go to end in retirement the days commenced in exile. Alas, I am disconsolate to be able to do nothing for your present destinies. My words die away in a mere waste around the walls of your prison. The noise of the winds, of the waves, and of men, at the foot of the lonely fortress, will not even allow the last accents of a faithful voice to ascend to where you are. Paris, March 1833. Some newspapers, having repeated the phrase, Madame, your son is my king, were indicted in the courts for a press offence. I found myself involved in the proceedings. This time I could not take exception to the competency of the judges. I had to try to save by my presence the men attacked for my sake. My honour was at stake, and I had to answer for my works. Moreover, the day before my summons before the court, the monitor had given the declaration of Madame la Duchesse de Berry. If I had stayed away, they would have thought that the Royalist party was retreating, that it was abandoning misfortune and blushing for the princess whose heroism it had celebrated. There was no lack of timid counsellors who said to me, Do not put in an appearance. You will be too much embarrassed with your phrase, Madame, your son is my king. I shall shout it louder than ever, I replied. I went to the very court where the revolutionary tribunal had formerly been installed, where Marie Antoinette had appeared, where my brother had been condemned. The revolution of July has ordered the removal of the crucifix, whose presence, while consoling innocence, caused the judge to tremble. My appearance before the judges had a fortunate effect. It counterbalanced for a moment the effect of the declaration in the monitor, and maintained the mother of Henry V in the rank in which her courageous adventure had placed her. Men hesitated, when they saw that the Royalist party dared to face the event, and did not consider itself beaten. I did not want to counsel, but Monsieur Le Drew, who had attached himself to me at the time of my imprisonment, wished to speak. He grew disconcerted and gave me great uneasiness. Monsieur Berret, who represented the Quotidien, indirectly took up my defence. At the end of the proceedings, I called the jury the universal peerage, which contributed not a little towards the acquittal of all of us. Nothing remarkable occurred to signalise this trial in the terrible chamber that had resounded with the voices of Fouquier, Tinville, and Danton. There was nothing amusing in it, except the arguments of Monsieur Persil. Wishing to prove my guilt, he quoted this phrase from my pamphlet. It is difficult to crush what flattens itself underfoot, and exclaiming, 
Do you feel, gentlemen, all the scorn comprised in that paragraph? It is difficult to crush what flattens itself underfoot. He made the movement of a man who crushes something under his feet. He resumed his speech triumphantly. The laughter of the audience was renewed. The worthy man perceived neither the delight of the audience at his unlucky phrase, nor the perfectly absurd figure which he cut while stamping his feet in his black robes as though he were dancing, at the same time that his face was pale with inspiration and his eyes haggard with eloquence. When the jury returned and pronounced their verdict of not guilty, applause broke out, and I was surrounded by young men who had put on barristers' robes to get in. Monsieur Carrel was there. The crowd increased as I went out. There was a scuffle in the courtyard of the palace between my escort and the police. At last I succeeded with great difficulty in reaching home, in the midst of the crowd which followed my cab, shouting, Long live Chateaubriand! At any other time this acquittal would have been very significant. To declare that it was not guilty to say to the Duchesse de Berry, Madame, your son is my king, was to condemn the Revolution of July. But to-day this verdict means nothing, because there is no opinion nor duration in anything. In four-and-twenty hours everything is changed. I should be condemned to-morrow for the fact on which I was acquitted to-day. I had been to leave my card on the juryman and notably on Monsieur Chevet, one of the members of the Universal Peerage. It was easier for that worthy citizen to find a conscientious verdict in my favour than it would have been for me to find in my pocket the money necessary to add to the happiness of my acquittal the pleasure of eating a good dinner at my judge's establishment. Monsieur Chevet arbitrated with more equity on the legitimacy, the usurpation and the author of the Génie du Christianisme than many publicists and censors. Paris, April 1833 The Memoirs sur la Captivité de Madame la Duchesse de Berry has obtained for me an immense popularity in the Royalist Party. Deputations and letters have reached me from every quarter. I have received from the north and south of France declarations of adhesion covered with many thousands of signatures. All of these, referring to my pamphlet, demand the liberation of Madame la Duchesse de Berry. Fifteen hundred young men of Paris have come to congratulate me, not without great excitement on the part of the police. I have received a cup in silver gilt with this inscription, to Chateaubriand from the loyal men of Villeneuve, Lot et Garon. A town in the south sent me some very good wine to fill this cup, but I do not drink. Lastly, legitimist France has taken as its motto the words, Madame, your son is my king. And several newspapers have adopted them as an epigraph. They have been engraved on necklaces and rings. I am the first to have uttered in the face of the usurpation a truth which no one dared to speak. And strange to say, I believe less in the return of Henry V than the most contemptible juste milieu man or the most violent republican. For the rest, I do not understand the word usurpation in the narrow sense given to it by the Royalist Party. There would be many things to say about this word as about that of legitimacy, but there really is usurpation, and usurpation of the worst kind, in the guardian who plunders his ward and prescribes the orphan. All those grand phrases that the country had to be saved, are so many pretexts furnished to ambition by an immoral policy. Truly, ought we not to regard the meanness of your usurpation as an effort of virtue on your part? Are you Brutus, by chance, sacrificing his sons to the greatness of Rome? I have been able in the course of my life to compare literary renown and popularity. The former pleased me for a few hours, but that love of renown soon passed. As for popularity, it found me indifferent, because, in the revolution, I have seen too much of men surrounded by those masses which, after raising them on the shield, flung them into the gutter. A democrat by nature, an aristocrat by habit, I would most gladly sacrifice my fortune and my life to the people, provided I need have little relation with the crowd. Anyhow, I was extremely sensible of the impulse of the young men of July, who carried me in triumph to the chamber of peers, and this inasmuch as they did not carry me there to be their leader, or because I thought as they did, they were only doing justice to an enemy. They recognised in me a man of honour and liberty. That generosity touched me. But this other popularity, which I have lately acquired in my own party, has caused me no emotion. There is an icy barrier between the royalists and myself. We want the same king. With that exception, most of our wishes are opposed one to the other. 
End of Book 2, Part 3Part 1 of Book 3 of Part 4 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 5 by François René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book 3, Part 1. Paris, Rue d'Enfer. 9th May, 1833. I have brought the sequence of the most recent facts up to this day. Shall I at last be able to resume my work? This work consists of the different portions of these memoirs which are not yet finished, and I shall have some difficulty in applying myself to them again ex abrupto, for my head is filled with the things of the moment. I am not in the mood suited for gathering my past in the calm where it is sleeping, agitated though it was when in the state of life i have taken up my pen to write what on and what about i know not on glancing through the journal in which for the last six months i have kept a record of what i do and of what happens to me i see that most of the pages are dated from the rue d'enfer the small house which i occupy near the barrier may be worth sixty thousand francs or so but at the time of the rise in the price of ground i bought it much dearer and I have never been able to pay for it. It was a question of saving the Infirmerie de Marie Thérèse, founded by the care of Madame de Chateaubriand, and adjoining the house. A company of builders was proposing to establish a café at Montagne Russe in the aforesaid house, a noise which does not go very well with the death agony. Am I not glad of my sacrifices? Certainly. One is always glad to succour the unfortunate, I would willingly share the little I possess with those in need, but I do not know that this disposition amounts to virtue in my case. My goodness is like that of a condemned man, who is lavish of that for which he will have no use in an hour's time. In London, the convict whom they are about to hang sells his skin for drink. I do not sell mine, I give it to the gravediggers. Once the house was bought, the best that I could do was to live in it. I have arranged it as it is. From the windows of the drawing-room one sees first what the English call a pleasure-ground, a proscenium consisting of a lawn and some blocks of shrubs. Beyond this enclosure, on the other side of wall, the height of a man's breast, surmounted by a white lozenge fence, is a field of mixed cultivation, reserved for the provender of the cattle of the infirmary. Beyond this field comes another piece of ground, separated from the field by another breast-high wall in green open-work, interlaced with viburnums and Bengal roses. These marches of my state embrace a clump of trees, a meadow, and an alley of poplars. This nook is extremely solitary. It does not smile to me like Horace's nook, Angulus Ridet. On the contrary, I have sometimes shed tears there. The proverb says that youth must have its fling, the decline of life also has some freaks to overlook. Les pleurs et la pitié, sorte d'amour, ayant ses charmes. My trees are of a thousand kinds. I have planted twenty-three cedars of Lebanon and two druid oaks. They make game of their short-lived master, Brevum Dominum. A mall, a double avenue of chestnuts, leads from the upper to the lower garden. The ground slopes rapidly along the field between. I did not choose these trees, as at the Vallée aux Loups, in memory of the spots which I have visited. He who takes pleasure in recollection cherishes hopes. But when one has no children, nor youth, nor country, what attachment can one bear to trees whose foliage, flowers, fruits are no longer the mysterious numerals employed in the calculation of the periods of illusion? In vain people say to me, You are growing younger. Do they think that they will make me take my wisdom teeth for my milk teeth? And even the latter have been given me only to eat a bitter loaf under the royalty of the 7th of August. For the rest, my trees are not much interested to know whether they serve as a calendar for my pleasures or as a death certificate of my years. They increase daily from the day that I decrease. They wed those of the grounds of the Foundling Hospital and the Boulevard d'Enfer, which surround me. I do not see a single house. 
I should be less separated from the world at two hundred leagues from Paris. I hear the bleating of the goats which feed the abandoned orphans. Ah, if I had been like these, in the arms of St. Vincent de Paul, born of a frailty, obscure and unknown as they are, I should to-day be some nameless workman, having no concern with men, nor knowing either why or how I entered life, or how and why I was to quit it. By pulling down a wall, I have placed myself in communication with the infirmary de Marie Therese. I find myself at the same time in a monastery, a farm, an orchard, and a park. In the morning I wake to the sound of the Angelus. I hear from my bed the singing of the priests in the chapel. I see from my window a calvary which stands between a walnut tree and an elder tree, cows, chickens, pigeons, and bees, sisters of charity in black tammany gowns and white dimity caps, convalescent women, old ecclesiastics go roaming among the lilacs, azaleas, calicanthuses, and rhododendrons of the flower garden, among the rose trees, gooseberry bushes, strawberry plants, and vegetables of the kitchen garden. Some of my octogenarian vicars were exiled with me. After mingling my poverty with theirs on the lawns of Kensington, I have offered the grass plots of my hospice to their failing footsteps. They there drag their pious old age like the folds of the veil of the sanctuary. I have, as a companion, a fat red-grey cat with black cross stripes, born at the Vatican in the Raphael Gallery. Leo the Twelfth brought it up in a skirt of his robe, where I used to watch it with envy, when the pontiff gave me my audiences as ambassador. On the death of the successor of St. Peter, I inherited the cat without a master, as I have told in writing of my Roman embassy. They called it Michetto, surnamed the Pope's cat. In this capacity it enjoys an extreme consideration among pious souls. I strive to make it forget exile, the Sistine Chapel and the son of Michelangelo's dome, on which it used to take its walks far removed from earth. My house and the different buildings of the infirmary, with their chapel and the Gothic sacristy, present the appearance of a colony or hamlet. On ceremonial days, religion hiding under my roof, the old monarchy in my almshouse form up in marching order. Processions composed of all our valetudinarians, preceded by the young girls of the neighbourhood, pass under the trees, singing with the blessed sacrament, the cross and the banner. Madame de Chateaubriand follows them, beads in hand, proud of the flock which is the object of her solicitude. The blackbirds whistle, the red breasts warble, the nightingales compete against the hymns. I am carried back to the rogations of which I have described the rustic pomp. From the theory of Christianity, I have passed to its practice. My home faces west. In the evening, the treetops lighted from behind imprint their black, serrate outlines on the horizon. My youth returns at that hour. It revives those lapsed days which time has reduced to the unsubstantiality of phantoms. When the constellations pierce through their blue arch, I remember that splendid firmament which I admired from the bosom of the American forest or the lap of the ocean. The night is more favourable than the day to the traveller's reminiscences. It hides from his eyes the landscapes that would remind him of the regions which he inhabits. It shows him only the luminaries, which look the same under the different latitudes of the same hemisphere. Then he recognises those stars which he contemplated in such a country, at such a time, the thoughts which he entertained, the feelings which he underwent in the different portions of the world, shoot up and fix themselves at the same point in the sky. We here speak of the world in the infirmary, only at the two public collections and a little on Sundays. On those days our hospice changes into a kind of parish church. The Sister Superior pretends that beautiful ladies come to Mass in the hope of seeing me. Skilful manager that she is, she lays their curiosity under contribution. By promising to show me to them, she attracts them to the laboratory. Once she has entrapped them, she forces sweet stuff on them, willy-nilly in exchange for money. She makes me serve at the sale of the chocolate manufactured for the profit of her patients, even as La Martiniere took me into partnership for the trade in the gooseberry syrup, which he used to quaff to the success of his love affairs. The sainted woman also steals stumps of quills from Madame de Chateaubriand's inkstand. She trades in them among the thoroughbred royalists, declaring that with those precious stumps were written the superb Memoirs sur la captivité de Madame la Duchesse de Berry. 
A few good pictures of the Spanish and Italian schools, a virgin by Guerin, the St. Teresa, the last masterpiece of the painter of Corinne, make us attached to the arts. As for history, we shall soon have at the hospice a sister of the Marquis de Favre and a daughter of Madame Roland. The monarchy and the republic have sent me to expiate their ingratitude and to feed their invalids. All are anxious to be received at Marie Therese. The poor women who are obliged to leave when they have recovered their health take up their lodgings near the infirmary, in the hope of falling ill again and returning to it. Nothing smacks of the hospital. The Jewess, the Protestant, the Catholic, the foreigner, the Frenchwoman, receive the cares of a delicate charity, disguising itself as an affectionate relationship. Each afflicted woman seems to have found her mother. I have seen a Spaniard, beautiful as Dorothea, the Pearl of Seville, die at sixteen of consumption in the common dormitory, congratulating herself upon her happiness, looking as she smiled with great, black, half-dimmed eyes, a pale and emaciated face, at Madame la Dauphine, who asked after her and assured her that she would soon be well. She expired that same evening, far from the mosque of Cordova and the banks of the Guadalquivir, her native stream. What are you? A Spaniard? A Spaniard, and here. We have many widows of Knights of the Holy Ghost among our frequenters. They bring with them the only thing that remains to them, the portraits of their husbands, in the uniform of a captain of foot, a white coat with rose-pink or sky-blue facings, with their hair dressed à l'oiseau royal. They are put in the lumber-room. I cannot look at the regiment of them without laughing. If the old monarchy had survived, I should today be adding to the number of those portraits. I should be acting as the solace of my grand-nephews in some deserted gallery. That's your great-uncle François, the captain in the Navarre regiment. He was a very witty man. He wrote the riddle in the Mercure, beginning with the words, Cut off my head, and the fugitive poem in the Almanac des Muses called Cri du Coeur. When I am tired of my gardens, the plain of Montrouge takes their place. I have seen that plain change. What have I not seen change? Twenty-five years ago, I used to pass by the Barrière du Main, when going to Merville, to the Marais, to the Vallée aux Loups. To the right and left of the road, one saw only mills, the wheels of the cranes at the stone pits, and the nursery garden of Cell, Rousseau's old friend. De Noyer built his rooms of a hundred covers for the soldiers of the Imperial Guard, who came to clink glasses between each battle won, each kingdom overthrown. A few public houses stood round the mills, from the Barrière du Main to the Barrière du Montparnasse. Higher up were the Moulin Janséniste and Lausanne's Pleasure House, by way of a contrast. Near the public houses, acacias were planted, the poor man's shade. Even a seltzer water is the beggar's champagne. A travelling theatre fixed the migratory population of the public house balls. A village was formed with a paved street, songwriters and gendarmes, the amphions and cecropsies of the police. While the living were settling down, the dead were claiming their place. A cemetery was fenced in, not without opposition on the part of the drunkards, in an enclosure containing a ruined mill, like the Tour des Abois. There death brings every day the corn which it has gleaned. A mere wall separates it from the dancing, the music, the nightly uproar. The sounds of a moment, the marriages of an hour, separate them from infinite silence, endless night, and eternal nuptials. I often stroll through this cemetery younger than myself, in which the worms that gnaw the dead are not yet dead. I read the epitaphs. How many women between sixteen and thirty years old have become the prey of the tomb? Happy they to have lived only in their youth. The Duchesse de Gèvres, the last drop of the blood of Du Gesclin, a skeleton of another age, dozes in the midst of the plebeian sleepers. In this new exile I already have old friends. Monsieur Lemoine lies there. He was secretary to Monsieur de Montmorin and was bequeathed to me by Madame de Beaumont. He used to bring me almost every evening when I was in Paris, the simple conversation which I like so much, when it is joined to goodness of heart and singleness of character. My sick and wearied mind finds relaxation in a healthy and restful mind. I left the ashes of Monsieur Lemoine's noble patroness on the banks of the Tiber. The boulevards which encompass the infirmary share my walks with the cemetery. I no longer dream there, having no future, I have no dreams left. A stranger to the new generations, I appear to them a dusty and very bare wallet-bearer, 
scarce am i covered now with a rag of dock days at which time gnaws even as the herald at arms used to cut the jacket of an inglorious knight i am glad to stand aside i like to be at a musket shot's distance from the barrier on the edge of a high road and always ready to set out from the foot of the milestone i watch the mail pass my image and life's when i was in rome in eighteen twenty eight i formed a plan to build in paris at the end of my hermitage a greenhouse and a gardener's cottage all to be paid for out of the savings of my embassy and the fragments of antiquities found in my excavations at torre vergata m de polignac assumed office i sacrificed to the liberties of my country a place which charmed me relapsed into poverty good-bye to my greenhouse fortuna vitrea est the evil habit of paper and ink brings about that one cannot prevent oneself from scribbling i have taken up my pen not knowing what i was going to write and have scrawled this description at least a third too long if i have time i will cut it down i must ask pardon of my friends for the bitterness of some of my thoughts i can laugh only with my lips i have the spleen a physical melancholy a real complaint whoever has read these memoirs has seen what my lot has been i was not a swimmer stroke from my mother's breast before the torments had assailed me i have wandered from shipwreck to shipwreck i feel a curse upon my life a burden too heavy for that hut of reeds let not those whom i love therefore think themselves denied let them excuse me let them allow my fever to pass between those attacks my heart is wholly theirs i had written thus much on these loose pages flung pell-mell on my table and blown about by the wind that entered through my open windows when they handed me the following letter and note from madame la duchesse de berry come let us return once more to the second part of my double life the practical part Blaise citadel seventh may eighteen thirty three i am painfully annoyed at the refusal of the government to allow you to come to me after the two requests which i have made of all the numberless vexations which i have had to undergo this is certainly the most painful i had so many things to tell you so much advice to ask of you since i must relinquish the thought of seeing you i will at least try by the only means left to me to send you the commission which i intended to give you and which you will accomplish for i rely without reserve on your devotion to my son i charge you therefore monsieur especially to go to prague and tell my kinsfolk that if i refused until the twenty second of february to declare my secret marriage my design was the better to serve my son's cause and to prove that a mother a bourbon was not afraid to endanger her life i proposed to make my marriage known only when my son came of age but the threats of the government the moral tortures driven to the utmost degree decided me to make my declaration in the ignorance in which i am left as to the period at which my liberty will be restored to me after so many frustrated hopes the time has come to give to my family and to the whole of europe an explanation which shall prevent injurious suppositions i would have liked to be able to give it earlier but absolute sequestration and unsurmountable difficulties in communicating with the outside have prevented me until now you will tell my family that i was married in italy to count hector lucchese pali of the princess of campo franco i ask you o monsieur de chateaubriand to convey to my dear children the expression of all my affection for them be sure to tell henry that i rely more than ever on all his efforts to become daily worthier of the love and admiration of frenchmen tell louise how happy i should be to embrace her and that her letters have been my only consolation lay my homage at the king's feet and give my affectionate regards to my brother and my kind sister i ask you to report to me wherever i may be the wishes of my children and my family shut up within the walls of blay i find a comfort in having such an interpreter as monsieur le vicomte de chateaubriand he can reckon on my attachment for all time marie caroline note i have felt a great satisfaction at the agreement that reigns between you and monsieur le marquis de la tour maubourg as i attach a great value to this in the interest of my son you can show madame la dauphine the letter which i am writing to you assure my sister that so soon as i have recovered my liberty i shall think nothing more urgent than to send her all the papers relating to political affairs my great wish would have been to proceed to prague so soon as i was free but the sufferings of all kinds that i have undergone have so greatly destroyed my health that i shall be obliged to stop some time in italy 
so as to recover a little, and not to frighten my poor children too much by the change in me. Study my son's character, his good qualities, his inclinations, even his faults. You will tell the king, Madame la Dauphine, and myself, what there is to correct, to change, to make perfect, and you will let France know what she has to expect from her young king. Through my different relations with the Emperor of Russia, I know that he has on several occasions very favourably received propositions for a marriage between my son and the Princess Olga. Monsieur de Chulot will give you the most precise information touching the persons who are at present at Prague. Desiring to remain French above all, I ask you to obtain leave from the King for me to keep my title of Princess and my name. The mother of the King of Sardinia continues to call herself Princess of Carignan, in spite of her marriage with Monsieur de Montléard, to whom she has given the title of Prince. Marie-Louise, Duchess of Parma, kept her title of Empress, when she married Count von Nyperg, and remained the guardian of her son. Her other children are called Nyperg. I beg you to set out as promptly as possible for Prague, as I desire more eagerly than I can tell you that you should arrive in time for my family to learn all these details, only through you. I wish the fact of your departure to be as little known as possible, or at least that no one will be aware that you are the bearer of a letter from me, so as not to reveal my only means of correspondence, which is so precious, although very rare. Monsieur le Comte Lucchese, my husband, is descended from one of the four oldest families in Sicily, the only ones that remain of the twelve companions of Tancred. This family has always been noted for the noblest devotion to the cause of its kings. The Prince de Campofranco, Lucchese's father, was first lord of the bedchamber to my father. The present king of Naples, having an entire confidence in him, has placed him with his young brother, the viceroy of Sicily. I do not speak to you of his feelings. They agree with ours in every respect. Convinced as I am that the only way to be understood by the French is always to address to them the language of honour and to make them look towards glory, I have had the thought of marking the commencement of my son's reign by joining Belgium to France. Count Lucchese was charged by me to make the first overtures in this matter to the King of Holland and the Prince of Orange, and he was of great aid in obtaining a good hearing for them. I was not so fortunate as to conclude this treaty, the object of all my wishes, but I believe that there are still chances of success. Before leaving the Vendée, I gave Monsieur le Maréchal de Beaumont powers to continue this affair. No one is more capable than he to carry it to a successful issue, because of the esteem which he enjoys in Holland. M.C. Blay, 7th May, 1833. As I am not certain of being able to write to the Marquis de la Tour Maubourg, try to see him before your departure. You can tell him whatever you think fit, but in the most absolute secrecy. Arrange with him as to the direction to be given to the newspapers. I was moved at reading these documents. The daughter of so many kings, that woman fallen from so high a station, after closing her ear to my counsels, had the noble courage to apply to me, to forgive me for foreseeing the failure of her enterprise. Her confidence went to my heart and honoured me. Madame de Berry had judged me rightly. The very nature of that enterprise which made her lose all did not alienate me. To play for a throne, glory, the future and destiny is no vulgar thing. The world understands that a princess can be an heroic mother. But what must be consigned to execration? What is unexampled in history is the immodest torture inflicted on a weak woman, alone, cut off from assistance, overwhelmed by all the forces of a government conspiring against her, as though it were a question of conquering a formidable power. Parents themselves abandoning their daughter to the laughter of the lackeys, holding her by her four limbs so that she may be delivered in public, calling the authorities from their corner, the jailers, spies, passers-by, to see the child brought forth from their prisoner's womb, even as though they had called France to witness the birth of her king. And what prisoner? the granddaughter of Henry the Fourth, and what mother, the mother of the orphan whose throne they were occupying. Do the hulks contain a family so low-born as to conceive the thought of branding one of its children with so great an ignominy? Would it not have been nobler to kill Madame la Duchesse de Berry rather than submit her to the most tyrannous humiliation? Whatever indulgence was shown in this business belongs to the century, whatever infamy to the government." Madame la Duchesse de Berry's letter and note are remarkable in more than one place. The portion relating to the incorporation of Belgium and the marriage of Henry V shows a head capable of serious things, 
the portion concerning the family in prague is touching the princess fears that she will be obliged to stop in italy so as to recover a little and not to frighten her poor children too much by the change in her what can be sadder and more sorrowful she adds i ask you monsieur de chateaubriand to convey to my dear children the expression of all my affection etc oh madame la duchesse de berry what can i do for you i a weak creature already half broken down but how to refuse anything to such words as these shut up within the walls of blay i find a comfort in having such an interpreter as monsieur de chateaubriand he can reckon on my attachment for all time yes i will set out on the last and greatest of my embassies i shall go on the part of the prisoner of blay to find the prisoner of the temple i shall negotiate a new family compact take the kisses of a captive mother to her exiled children and present letters in which courage and misfortune accredit me to innocence and virtue a letter for madame la dauphine and a note for the two children were added to the letter addressed to me there were left to me of my past grandeurs a broom in which i had once shone at the court of george the fourth and a travelling calash built in former days for the use of the prince de talleyrand i had the latter repaired in order to make it capable of going against nature for by origin and habit it is disinclined to run after fallen kings on the fourteenth of may the anniversary of the murder of henry the fourth at half past eight in the evening i set out in search of henry v child orphan and outlaw i was not without anxiety as to my passport taken out at the foreign office it bore no description and it was dated eleven months back it had been delivered for switzerland and italy and had already served to enable me to leave france and return different visas witnessed these several circumstances i did not care either to have it renewed or to ask for a fresh one the police of every country would have been warned every telegraph set in motion the police of every country would have been warned every telegraph set in motion at every custom house they would have searched my trunks my carriage my person if my papers had been seized what a pretext for persecution what domiciliary visits what arrests what a prolongation of the royal captivity for it would have been proved that the princess had secret means of correspondence outside it was therefore impossible for me to call attention to my departure by asking for a passport i place my trust in my star avoiding the too much beaten road of frankfurt and that of strasbourg which runs under the line of telegraphs i took the basel road with hyacinth pilorge my secretary used to all my fortunes and baptiste my valet de chambre when i was my lord and once more plain valet on the downfall of my lordship we get in and out of the carriage together my cook the famous montmuriel retired when i left the ministry declaring that he would not return to office till i did it had been wisely decided by the introduce of ambassadors under the restoration that any ambassador who died re-entered private life baptiste had re-entered domestic service when we reach altkirch the frontier stage a gendarme appeared and asked for my passport on seeing my name he told me that he had served in the spanish campaign in eighteen twenty three under my nephew christian a captain in the dragoons of the guard between altkirch and st louis i met a rector and his parishioners they were making a procession against the cockchafers nasty insects much multiplied since the days of july at st louis the officers of the custom house who knew me let me pass i arrived gaily at the gate of basel where i was met by the old swiss drum major who in the previous month of august had inflicted on me a little quarantine of a quarter of an hour but the cholera was over and i put up at the three kings on the banks of the rhine it was ten o'clock on the morning of the seventeenth of may the landlord procured me a travelling footman called schwartz a native of basel to act as my interpreter in bohemia he spoke german just as my good joseph the milanese tinman spoke greek in messenia when inquiring for the ruins of sparta on the same day the seventeenth of may at six o'clock in the evening i moved out of port as i stepped into the calash i was amazed to see the altkirch gendarme among the crowd i did not know if he had not been sent after me he had simply escorted the mail from france i gave him some money to drink to the health of his old captain a schoolboy came up to me and threw a paper to me with the inscription to the Virgil of the nineteenth century. It contained this passage altered from the Aeneid, Magte animo generose puer. And the postilion whipped up the horses, and I drove off 
quite proud of my high renown at Basel, quite astonished at being Virgil, quite charmed to be called a child. Generose puer. I crossed the bridge, leaving the burgesses and peasants at war in the midst of their republic, and fulfilling in their own fashion the part which they are called upon to play in the general transformation of society. I went up the right bank of the Rhine, and contemplated with a certain sadness the high hills of the canton of Basel. The exile which I had come to seek last year in the Alps seemed to me a happier life sending, a gentler lot than the affairs of empire in which I had re-engaged. Did I cherish the smallest hope for Madame la Duchesse de Berry or her son? No. And I was, moreover, convinced that, in spite of my recent services, I should find no friends in Prague. One who has taken the oath to Louis-Philippe, and who nevertheless praises the fatal ordinances, must be more acceptable to Charles X than I, who have never forsworn myself. It is too much for a king that one should twice have been in the right. Flattering treachery is preferred to austere devotion. I went, therefore, going to Prague, even as the Sicilian soldier who was hung in Paris at the time of the League went to the gallows. The confessor of the Neapolitans tried to put heart into him by saying on the way, Allegramente, allegramente. Thus sped my thoughts while the horses were drawing me onwards. But when I thought of the misfortunes of the mother of Henry V, I reproached myself for my regrets. The banks of the Rhine flying along my carriage diverted me pleasantly. When one looks at a landscape out of a window, even though he be dreaming of other things, a reflection of the picture which he has under his eyes nevertheless enters into his mind. We drove through meadows decked with the flowers of May. The green was fresh in the woods, orchards and hedges. Horses, donkeys and cows, pigs, dogs and sheep, hens and pigeons, geese and turkeys, were in the fields with their masters. The Rhine, that warlike stream, seemed pleased in the midst of that pastoral scene, like an old soldier quartered on his march on husbandmen. The next morning, the 18th of May, before reaching Schaffhausen, I was driven to the falls of the Rhine. I stole a few moments from the fall of kingdoms to improve myself at its image. I should have done well for myself to end my days in the castle overlooking the chasm. I placed at Niagara the dream of Atala, not yet realised. I met at Tivoli another dream, already passed away upon earth, who knows if, in the keep standing over the falls of the Rhine, I should not have found a fairer vision which, but now wandering on its banks, would have consoled me for all the shades that I had lost. From Schaffhausen I continued my road towards Ulm. The country presents tilled basins in which detached and wooded hillocks bathe their feet. In those woods which were then being cultivated for sale, the eye saw oaks, some felled, others left standing, the first stripped of their bark where they lay, their trunks and branches white and bare, like the skeleton of a strange beast, the second bearing the fresh green of spring on their hirsute and dark, moss-grown limbs. They combine what is never found in man, the twofold beauty of old age and youth. In the fir plantations of the plain, uprootings had left empty spaces. The land had been turned into meadows. Those circuses of grass, in the middle of the slate-grey forests, have something severe and smiling, and recall the prairies of the new world. The cottages retain the Swiss character. The hamlets and inns are distinguished by that appetising cleanliness unknown in our country. Stopping for dinner between six and seven o'clock at Moskir, I sat musing at the window of my inn. Herds were drinking at a fountain. A heifer leapt and frolicked like a roe deer. Wherever men are kind to their beasts, they are lively and love man. In Germany and England the horses are not beaten, they are not ill-treated with words, they back towards the pole of themselves, they start and stop at the least sound of the voice, at the smallest movement of the bridle rein. Of all nations the French are the most inhumane. Do you see our postilions harnessing their horses? They drive them into the shafts with kicks of their boots in the flanks, with blows of their whip-handles on the head breaking their mouths with a bit to make them go back, accompanying the whole with oaths, shouts and insults at the poor brute. Beasts of burden are compelled to draw or carry loads which are beyond their strength and, to oblige them to go on, the drivers cut up their hides with twists of the thong. The fierceness of the Gauls is with us still. It is only hidden under the silk of our stockings and neckcloths. I was not alone in gaping. The women were doing as much at all the windows of their houses. I have often asked myself, when passing through unknown hamlets, 
Would you live here? I have always answered, Why not? Who in the mad hours of youth has not said with Pierre Vidal, the troubadour, Donne me d'un poc cordeau, canari moda, medo, carré richard apetius, niab tors, niab angius. There is matter for dreams everywhere. Pleasures and pains belong to all places. Those women of Muskir, who looked at the sky or at my posting chariot, who looked at me or who looked at nothing, had not they joys and sorrows, interests of the heart, of fortune, of family, even as we have in Paris? I should have made great progress in the history of my neighbours, if dinner had not been poetically announced to the crash of a thunderclap. That was much ado about little. 19th May, 1833. At ten o'clock at night I got into the carriage again. I fell asleep to the patter of the rain on the hood of the calash. The sound of my postilion's little horn aroused me. I heard the murmur of a river which I could not see. We had stopped at the gate of a town. The gate opened, my passport and luggage were examined. We were entering the vast empire of his Württemberg Majesty. I greeted in memory the Grand Duchess Helen, the graceful and delicate flower now confined in the hot houses of the Volga. On only one single day did I conceive the value of high rank and fortune. It was when I gave the fete to the young Russian princess in the gardens of the Villa Medici. I felt how the magic of the sky, the charm of the spot, the spell of beauty and power, can inebriate one. I imagine myself both Torquato Tasso and Alphonsus of Este. I was worth more than the prince, less than the poet. Helen was more beautiful than Leonora. The representative of the heir of Francis I and Louis XIV, I had the dream of a king of France. They did not search me. I had nothing against the rights of sovereigns. I, who recognised those of a young monarch, which the sovereigns themselves failed to recognise, the vulgarity, the modernity of the custom-house and the passport formed a contrast with the storm, the gothic gate, the sound of the horn and the noise of the torrent. Instead of the lady of the castle whom I was prepared to deliver from oppression, I found on leaving the town an old simple fellow. He asked me for Zeke's Kreutzer, raising his left hand, which held a lantern, to the level of his grey head, putting out his right hand to Schwartz on the box, and opening his mouth like the gills of a hooked pike. Baptiste, wet and sick as he was, could not hold himself for laughing. And what was this torrent over which I had just passed? I asked the postilion, who cried, Donau! The Danube! One more famous river crossed by me unknowingly, even as I had descended into the bed of the oleanders of the Eurotas without knowing it. What has it availed me to drink of the waters of the Mississippi, the Eridanus, the Tiber, the Cephissus, the Hermes, the Jordan, the Nile, the Guadalquivir, the Tagus, the Ebro, the Rhine, the Spree, the Seine, and a hundred other obscure or celebrated rivers? Unknown, they have not given me their peace. Illustrious, they have not communicated to me their glory. They will be able to say only that they have seen me pass as their banks see their waves pass. I arrived at Ulm fairly early on Sunday, the 19th of May, after travelling through the scene of the battles of Moreau and Bonaparte. Iersant, who is a member of the Legion of Honour, was wearing the ribbon. This decoration obtained for us an incredible amount of consideration. I, wearing in my buttonhole only a little flower, according to my custom, passed, until they heard my name, for a mysterious being. My mamelukes at Cairo used to insist whether I would or no, that I was a general of Napoleon disguised as a literary man. They would not give in, and every quarter of an hour expected to see me put away Egypt in the sash of my kaftan. And yet it is among nations whose villages we have burnt, and whose harvests we have laid waste, that those sentiments exist. I rejoiced in this glory. But if we had done nothing but good to Germany, should we be as greatly regretted there? Oh, inexplicable human nature! The evils of war are forgotten. We have left on the soil of our conquest the spark of life. That inert mass set in movement continues to ferment because its intelligence is commencing. When travelling nowadays, we see the nations watching, knapsack on back. Ready to start, they seem to be waiting for us in order to place us at the head of the column. A Frenchman is always taken for the aide-de-camp who brings the order to march. Alm is a clean little town with no particular character, its dismantled ramparts have been converted into kitchen gardens or walks, which happens to all ramparts. 
Their fortune has something in common with that of the military. The soldier bears arms in his youth. When invalided, he becomes a gardener. I went to see the cathedral, a Gothic fabric with a tall spire. The aisles are divided into two narrow vaults, supported by a single row of pillars, so that the interior of the edifice partakes at one time of the character of the cathedral and the basilica. The pulpit has for a canopy a graceful steeple ending in a point like a mitre. The inside of this steeple consists of a newel, around which winds a helicoid vault in stone filigree work. Symmetrical spikes piercing the outside seem destined to carry candles. These used to light up this tiara when the bishop preached on feast days. Instead of priests officiating, I saw little birds hopping in that granite foliage. They were celebrating the word that gave them a voice and wings on the fifth day of the creation. The nave was deserted. In the apse of the church, two separate groups of boys and girls were receiving religious instruction. The Reformation, as I have already said, makes a mistake when it shows itself in the Catholic monuments upon which it has encroached. It cuts a mean and shameful figure there. Those tall porches call for a numerous clergy, the pomp of the celebrations, the chants, pictures, ornaments, silk veils, draperies, laces, gold, silver, lamps, flowers, and incense of the altars. Protestantism may say as much as it pleases that it has returned to primitive Christianity. The Gothic churches reply that it has denied its fathers. The Christians who were the architects of its wonders were other than the children of Luther and Calvin. 19th May, 1833 I had left Alm at noon on the 19th. At Dillingen the horses were wanting. I stayed an hour in the high street, having as a recreation the sight of a stork's nest planted on a chimney as though on a minaret at Athens. A number of sparrows had insolently made their nests in the bed of the peaceful queen with the long neck. Below the stork, a lady, living on the first floor, looked at the passers-by in the shade of a half-raised blind. Below the lady was a wooden saint in a niche. The saint would be thrown down to the pavement, the woman from her window into the grave, and the stork? It will fly away. Thus will end the three stories. Between Dillingen and Donauwurt, you cross a battlefield at Blenheim. The footsteps of the armies of Moreau over the same ground have not obliterated those of the armies of Louis Cateau's. The defeat of the great king prevails in the countryside over the successors of the great emperor. The postilion who drove me belonged to Blenheim. On coming up to his village, he blew the horn. Perhaps he was announcing his passage to the peasant girl whom he loved. She leapt for joy in the midst of the same fields where twenty-seven French battalions and twelve squadrons of cavalry were taken prisoner, where the Navarre regiment, whose uniform I have had the honour to wear, buried its standards to the mournful sound of the trumpets. Those are the commonplaces of the succession of the ages. In 1793 the Republic carried off from the church at Blenheim the colours taken from the monarchy in 1704. It avenged the kingdom and slew the king. It cut off Louis XVI's head, but it allowed only France to tear the white flag to pieces. Nothing better conveys the greatness of Louis XIV than to find his memory at the bottom of the ravines dug by the torrent of the Napoleonic victories. That monarch's conquest left our country the frontiers that still guard it. The Brian scholar, to whom the legitimacy gave a sword, for a moment enclosed Europe in his antechamber, but it escaped. The grandson of Henry the Fourth laid that same Europe at the feet of France, and it remained there. This does not mean that I am comparing Napoleon and Louis Cartaux. Men of different destinies, they belong to dissimilar centuries, to different nations. One completed an era, the other began a world. One can say of Napoleon what Montaigne says of Caesar. I excuse victory in that she could not well give him over. The unworthy tapestries at Blenheim Palace, which I saw with Pelquier, show the Maréchal de Talat taking off his hat to the Duke of Marlborough, who stands in a swaggering attitude. Talat nonetheless remained the favourite of the old lion. A prisoner in London, he conquered, in the mind of Queen Anne, the Marlborough who had beaten him at Blenheim, and he died a member of the French Academy. He was, says Saint-Simon, a man of middling height, with somewhat jealous eyes, full of fire and spirit, but with an incessant demon of restlessness in him, owing to his ambition. 
I am writing history in my calash, why not? Caesar wrote plenty in his litter. He won the battles of which he wrote. I did not lose those of which I speak. From Dillingen to Donauwurt stretches a rich plain of unequal level, in which the cornfields intermingle with the meadows. One goes closer to or further from the Danube, according to the windings of the road and the bends of the river. At that height the waters of the Danube are still yellow, like those of the Tiber. Scarce have you left the village before you see another. The villages are clean and smiling. Often the walls of the houses have frescoes. A certain Italian character becomes manifest as one goes towards Austria. The inhabitant of the Danube is no longer the peasant of the Danube. Son montant nourrissait une barbe touffue, toute sa personne velue, refusante un or, mais un or mal léché. But the sky of Italy is lacking here. The sun is low and pale. Those close-sown market towns are not the little cities of the Romagna, which brood upon the masterpieces of the arts hidden underneath them. You scratch the ground, and that tillage makes some marvel of the antique chisel shoot up like a blade of corn. At Donauwurt, I regretted to have arrived too late to enjoy a fine view of the Danube. On Monday the 20th, the same appearance of the landscape. Yet the soil becomes less good, and the peasants seem poorer. One begins again to see the pine woods of the hills. The Hersinian forest used to project as far as this. The trees of which Pliny left us a singular description were felled by generations now buried with the secular oaks. When Trajan threw a bridge over the Danube, Italy heard for the first time that name so fatal to the world of antiquity, the name of the Goths. The road was opened up to myriads of savages who marched to the sack of Rome. The Huns and the Attila built their wooden palaces opposite the Colosseum, on the bank of the stream which was the rival of the Rhine and, like the latter, the enemy of the Tiber. The hordes of Alaric crossed the Danube in 376 to overthrow the civilized Greek Empire, at the same spot where the Russians traversed it in 1828, with the design of overthrowing the barbaric empire seated on the ruins of Greece. Could Trajan have guessed that a civilization of a new kind would one day be established on the other side of the Alps, on the borders of the stream which he had almost discovered? Born in the Black Forest, the Danube goes to die in the Black Sea. Where does its chief source lie? In the courtyard of a German baron who employs the naiad to wash his linen. A geographer having taken it into his head to deny the fact, the noble owner brought an action against him. It was decided by a judicial verdict that the source of the Danube was in the courtyard of the said baron and could not be elsewhere. How many centuries were needed to arrive from the errors of Ptolemy at this important discovery? Tacitus makes the Danube descend from Mount Abnoba, Montes Abnobae. But the Hermondurian, Cheruscan, Marcomanian, Quadian barons, who are the authorities upon the Russian history relies, are not so cautious as my German baron. Eudorus did not know so much when I made him travel to the mouths of the Ister, where the Euxine, according to Racine, was to carry Mithridates in two days. Having passed the Ister near its mouth, I discovered a stone tomb, on which grew a laurel. I pulled out the grasses which covered some Latin characters, and soon I succeeded in reading this first verse of the elegies of an unfortunate poet. My book you will go to Rome, and you will go to Rome without me. The Danube, on losing its solitude, saw recurring on its banks the evils inseparable from society. Plagues, famines, destructive fires, sacks of towns, wars, and those divisions incessantly springing up from human passions and errors. After Donauwurt, one comes to Burkheim and Neuburg. At breakfast at Ingolstadt, they serve me with roebuck. It is a great pity to eat that charming beast. I have always been horrified at reading the account of the inaugural banquet of George Neville, Archbishop of York, in 1466. They roasted 400 swans singing in chorus their funeral hymn. There is also a question at that repast of 400 bitterns. I can well believe it. Regensburg, which we call Ratisbon, presents an agreeable view to one approaching it from Donauwurt. Two o'clock was striking on the 21st when I pulled up before the post office. While they were putting the horses to, which always takes long in Germany, 
I entered a neighbouring church called the Old Chapel, and painted white and gilded like new. Eight old black priests with white hair were singing vespers. I had once prayed in a chapel at Tivoli for a man who was himself praying by my side. In one of the pits at Carthage I had offered up my vows to St. Louis, who died not far from Utica, and who was more philosophical than Cato, more sincere than Hannibal, more pious than Aeneas. In the chapel at Ratisbon I had a thought of recommending to heaven the young king whom I had come to seek. But I feared the wrath of God too much to ask for a crown. I besought the dispenser of all mercies to grant the orphan happiness, and to give him a disdain for power. I hurried from the old chapel to the cathedral. It is smaller than that of Ulm, but more religious and handsomer in style. Its stained-glass windows wrap it in the darkness appropriate to contemplation. The white chapel was better suited to my wishes for the innocence of Henry. The sombre basilica made me feel quite moved for my old King Charles. I cared little for the house in which they used to elect the empress of old, which proves at least that there were elective sovereigns, even sovereigns who were judged. The eighteenth clause in Charlemagne's will says, If any of our grandsons, born or to be born, be accused, we order that their heads be not shaved, their eyes not put out, their limbs not cut off, nor they condemned to death, without fair argument and enquiry. One emperor of Germany, I know not which, on being deposed, asked only for the sovereignty of a vineyard, for which he had an affection. At Ratisbon, in former days the factory of sovereigns, they used to coin emperors, often of inferior standard. This industry has died away. One of Bonaparte's battles and the Prince Primate, the insipid courtier of our universal gendarme, have failed to resuscitate the dying city. The Regensburgers, dressed in slovenly like the people of Paris, have no particular physiognomy. The town, in the absence of a sufficient number of inhabitants, is dull. Grass and thistles are laying siege to its suburbs. Soon they will have hoisted their plumes and their lances on its turrets. Kepler, who made the earth turn, as did Copernicus, sleeps for ever at Ratisbon. We left by the bridge on the Prague Road a greatly extolled and very ugly bridge. On quitting the basin of the Danube, one climbs steep inclines. Kern, the first stage, is perched on a rough slope from the top of which, through watery mists, I discern dead hills and pale valleys. The facial aspect of the peasants changes. The children, yellow and bloated, have a sickly look. From Kern to Waldmünchen, the poverty of the landscape increases. One sees few more hamlets, only huts made of pine logs, plastered with mud, as on the more barren necks of the Alps. France is the heart of Europe. As one goes further from it, social life decreases. A man might judge the distance at which he is from Paris by the greater or lesser languor of the country to which he is retiring. In Spain and Italy, the diminution in movement and the progress of death are less noticeable. In the former country, a new people, a new world, Christian Arabs occupy your attention. In the latter, the charms of climate and art, the enchantment of love and ruins, leave you no time for depression. But in England, despite the perfection of physical society, in Germany, despite the morality of the inhabitants, one feels oneself die. In Austria and Prussia, the military yoke weighs upon your ideas, even as the sunless sky weighs upon your head. Something, I know not what, admonishes you that you cannot write, speak, nor think with independence, that you must lop off from your existence the whole of the nobler portion, leaving man's chief faculty to lie idle within you as a useless gift of God. No arts, no beauties of nature come to beguile your hours, and there is nothing left to you but to plunge into gross debauchery or into those speculative truths in which the Germans indulge. For a Frenchman, at least for me, this manner of existence is impossible. Without dignity I fail to understand life, which is difficult to understand even with all the seductions of liberty, glory, and youth. However, one thing charms me in the German people, its religious sentiment. If I were not too tired, I would leave the inn at Nittenau, where I am penciling this diary. I would go to the evening prayer with those men, women, and children whom a church calls with the sound of its bell. That crowd, seeing me on my knees in its midst, would welcome me by virtue of the unity of a common faith. When will the day come when philosophers in their temples shall bless a philosopher newly arrived by the post, and offer up a like prayer with that stranger? 
to a god respecting whom all philosophers are in disagreement the rosary of the parish priest is safer i stand by that end of book three part one Part two of Book three of Part four of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume five, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book three, Part two. 21st May, Waldmünchen, where I arrived on Tuesday morning, the 21st of May, is the last Bavarian village on this side of Bohemia. I was congratulating myself on being able promptly to fulfil my mission. I was only fifty leagues from Prague. I plunged into water cold as ice. I made my toilet at a spring, like an ambassador preparing for a triumphal entry. I set out, and half a league from Waldmünchen, Full of confidence, I accosted the Austrian custom-house. A lowered toll-gate barred the road. I got down with Iasant, his red ribbon blazing. A young custom-house officer, armed with a musket, took us to the ground floor of a house into a vaulted room. There, sitting at his desk as though in court, was an old and fat chief of German customs, with red hair, red moustachios, thick eyebrows, sloping over two greenish half-opened eyes, and a spiteful look a mixture of the Viennese police spy and the Bohemian smuggler. He took our passports without uttering a word. The young official timidly handed me a chair, while the chief before whom he seemed to tremble examined the passports. I did not sit down, but went to look at some pistols hanging on the wall and a carbine leaning against a corner of the room. It reminded me of the musket with which the Arga of the Isthmus of Corinth fired on the Greek peasant. After five minutes' silence, the Austrian barked out two or three words, which my Baselese translated thus. You can't pass. What? I couldn't pass? And why? The explanation began. Your description is not on the passport. My passport is a foreign office passport. Your passport is an old one. It is not a year old. It is legally valid. It has not been endorsed at the Austrian embassy in Paris. You are mistaken, it has. It has not the blank stamp on it. An omission on the part of the embassy, you can see besides that it has the visa of the other foreign legations. I have just passed through the canton of Basel, the Grand Duchy of Baden, the Kingdom of Württemberg, the whole of Bavaria, and I have not met with the smallest difficulty. I had merely to declare my name, and my passport was not even opened. Have you a public character? I have been a minister in France, and his most Christian Majesty's ambassador to Berlin, London, and Rome. I am known personally to your sovereign, and to Prince Metternich. You can't pass. Shall I leave you a security? Will you give me a guard, who will be responsible for me? You can't pass. If I send an express to the Bohemian government? As you please. I lost my patience. I began to wish the Custom House officer the devil. As ambassador of a king on his throne, I should not have minded a few hours wasted, but as ambassador of a princess in irons, I thought myself faithless to misfortune, a traitor to my captive sovereign. The man was writing. The Baselese did not translate my monologue, but there are certain French words which our soldiers have taught Austria, and which she has not forgotten. I said to the interpreter, Explain to him that I am going to Prague to offer my devotion to the King of France. The custom-house officer, without interrupting his writing, answered, Charles X is not King of France for Austria. I retorted, He is for me. These words, flung back to the Cerberus, seemed to make some impression on him. He eyed me up and down. I thought that his long annotation might, in the last result, be a favourable visa. He scrawled something on Iasant's passport as well, and returned the whole to the interpreter. It appeared that the visa was an explanation of the reasons which did not permit him to allow me to continue my road, so that not only was it impossible for me to go to Prague, but my passport was stamped as bad for the other places to which I might repair. I climbed back into the calash and said to the postilion, Waldmunchen. My return did not surprise the landlord of the inn. 
He spoke a little French. He told me that a similar thing had happened before. Foreigners had been obliged to stop at Waldmuchen and to send their passports to Munich to be endorsed at the Austrian legation. My host, a very worthy man, was the postmaster of the village and undertook to forward to the Grand Burgrave of Bohemian, the letter of which the following is a copy. Waldmuchen, 21st May, 1833. Monsieur le Gouverneur. Having the honour to be known personally to His Majesty the Emperor of Austria and to Monsieur le Prince de Metternich, I thought that I could travel in the Austrian state with a passport which, being not yet one year old, was still legally valid, and which had been endorsed by the Austrian ambassador in Paris for Switzerland and Italy. As a matter of fact, Monsieur le Comte, I have travelled through Germany and my name has been sufficient to allow me to pass. Only this morning the gentleman at the head of the Austrian Custom House at Hasselbach did not think himself authorised to be equally accommodating, and this for the reason set forth in his visa on my passport and closed, and on that of Monsieur Pelorge, my secretary. He has compelled me, to my great regret, to retrace my steps to Valmungen, where I await your orders. I venture to hope, Monsieur le Comte, that you will be good enough to remove the little difficulty which stops me, by sending me, by the express which I have the honour of dispatching to you, the necessary permission to go to Prague and thence to Vienna. I am Monsieur le Gouverneur, with high regard, your most humble and most obedient servant, Chateaubriand. Pray pardon, Monsieur le Comte, the liberty which I am taking, of enclosing an open note for Monsieur le Duc de Blacas. Some little pride appears in this letter. I was hurt. I was as much humiliated as Cicero when, on his return in triumph from his government of Asia, his friends asked him if he came from Baie or from his house at Tusculum. What? My name, which flew from pole to pole, had not reached the ears of a custom-house officer in the mountains at Hasselbach, a thing which seems all the more cruel when one thinks of my successes at Basel. In Bavaria I had been addressed as my lord or your excellency. A Bavarian officer at Waldmungen said aloud in the inn that my name required no visa from an Austrian ambassador. Those were great consolations, I admit, but after all, a sad truth remained. The world contained a man who had never heard speak of me. Who knows, however, if the Hasselbach customs officer did not know me a little. The police of all countries are so affectionately related. A politician who neither admires nor approves of the treaties of Vienna, a Frenchman who loves the honour and liberty of France, who remains faithful to the fallen power, might well be on the index in Vienna. What a noble revenge to deal with Monsieur de Chateaubriand as with one of those bagmen so suspicious to the spies. What a sweet satisfaction to treat as a vagabond, whose papers are not in order, an envoy charged to carry traitor-wise to a banished child the ideas of his captive mother. The express left Waldmuchen on the 21st at 11 o'clock in the morning. I calculated that it could be back on the second day, the 23rd, between 12 and 4. But my imagination was at work. What was to be the fate of my message? If the governor was a strong man and a man of the world, he would send me the permit. If he was a timid and unintelligent man, he would reply that my request did not come within his powers. He would hasten to refer it to Vienna. This little incident might at the same time please and displease Prince Metternich. I knew how he feared the newspapers. I had seen him at Verona leave the most important business and lock himself up distractedly with Monsieur de Gens to draft out an article in reply to the Constitutionnel and the Debat. How many days would elapse before the imperial minister's orders were transmitted? On the other hand, would Monsieur de Blacas be glad to see me at Prague? Would not Monsieur de Damas think that I had come to dethrone him? Would Monsieur le Cardinal de Latil be quite free from anxiety? Would not the triumvirate turn my mishap to account to have the doors closed against me instead of open to me? Nothing easier. A word in the governor's ear, a word of which I should never know. In what a state of anxiety would my friends be in Paris? When the adventure was noised abroad, what would not the newspapers make of it? What wild statements would they not indulge in? And, if the Grand Burgrave did not think fit to reply to me, if he were away, if no one dared act in his absence, what would become of me without a passport? Where could I be sure of being recognised? At Munich? In Vienna? What postmaster would give me horses? I should be practically a prisoner at Waldmunchen. Those are the cares that pass through my brain. I thought besides of my remoteness from what was dear to me. I have too short a time to live to waste that little. Horace said, Carpe diem. 
a counsel of pleasure at twenty, of reason at my age. Tired of ruminating on every case in my head, I heard the noise of a crowd outside. My inn stood on the village square. I looked through the window and saw a priest carrying the last sacraments to a dying man. What mattered to that dying man the affairs of kings, of their servants, and of the world? Everyone left his work and started to follow the priest. Young women, old women, children, mothers with their babies in their arms, repeated the prayer for the dying. On reaching the sick man's door, the priest gave the benediction with the holy viaticum. The bystanders knelt down and made the sign of the cross with lowered heads. The passport to eternity will not be disowned by him who distributes bread and opens the hostel to the traveller. Although I had not been to bed for seven days, I was unable to stay indoors. It was only a little past one. Leaving the village on the Ratisbon side, I caught sight of a white chapel on the right, in the middle of a cornfield. I went in that direction. The door was locked. Through a sloping window one saw an altar with a cross. The date of the erection of that sanctuary, 1830, was inscribed on the architrave. A monarchy was being overthrown in Paris while a chapel was being erected at Waldmünchen. The three banished generations were to come to live in a place of exile, within fifty leagues of the new shelter raised to the king crucified. Millions of events are realized at one and the same time. What does a black man sleeping under a palm tree on the bank of the Niger care for the white man who falls at the same moment under the dagger on the shore of the Tiber? What does he who weeps in Asia care for him who laughs in Europe? What did the mason who built this chapel, the Bavarian priest who exalted that Christ in 1830 care for the demolisher of saint germain l'Auxerrois? the fellow of the crosses in 1830. Events count only for those who suffer through them or benefit by them. They are nothing to those who have not heard of them, who are not touched by them. A certain race of herdsmen in the Abruzzi has witnessed, without descending from its mountain, the passage of the Carthaginians, the Gauls, the Romans, the Goths, the generations of the Middle Ages and the men of the present age. That race has not mingled with the successive dwellers in the valley, and religion alone has mounted up to it. Returning to the inn, I flung myself on two chairs in the hope of sleeping, but in vain. The movement of my imagination was stronger than my lassitude. I repeated the contents of my express over and over again. Dinner did not affect the matter. I went to bed amid the lowing of the herds returning from the fields. At ten o'clock a new noise. The watchman sang the hour. Fifty dogs barked after which they went to their kennels as though the watchman had ordered them to be silent. I recognised German discipline. Civilization has made progress in Germany since my journey to Berlin. The beds are now almost long enough for a man of ordinary stature, but the top sheet is still sewn to the blanket and the bottom sheet, which is too narrow, ends by twisting and curling up in such a way as to make you very uncomfortable, and since I am in the country of Auguste Lafontaine, I will imitate his genius. I want to inform the latest posterity of what existed in my time in the room of my inn at Waldmünchen. Know then, grand nephews, that that room was like an Italian room, with bare whitewashed walls, without any woodwork or hangings, a wide-coloured band or skirting at the bottom, a ceiling with a circle of three fillets, a cornice painted with blue roses with a garland of chocolate-coloured laurel leaves, and above the cornice on the wall, foliage painted in red on an American green ground. Here and there, little French and English engravings in frames. Two windows with white cotton curtains. Between the windows, a looking-glass. In the middle of the room, a table for at least twelve people, covered with an oilcloth with a raised ground, stamped with roses and different flowers. Six chairs upholstered in red tartan. A chest of drawers, three bedsteads round the room. In a corner near the door, a stove in black glazed earthenware, of which the sides show the Bavarian arms in relief. It is topped with a receiver shaped like a Gothic crown. The door is furnished with a complicated iron mechanism capable of closing the gates of a jail and baffling the picklocks of thieves or lovers. I describe for the benefit of travellers the excellent room in which I am writing this inventory, which competes with the misers. I recommend it to future legitimists who may be stopped by the red-headed wild goat of Hasselbach. This page of my memoirs will give pleasure to the modern literary school. After counting by the light of the night lamp the astragals of the ceiling, and looking at the engravings of the young Milanese, the beautiful Greeks, the young Frenchwoman, the young Russian, the late king of Bavaria, 
the late queen of Bavaria, who is like a lady whom I know, and whose name I cannot possibly remember, I snatched a few minutes' sleep. I rose from bed at seven o'clock on the twenty-second. A bath took away the rest of my fatigue, and I was interested only in my village, like Captain Cook discovering an islet in the Pacific Ocean. Wagmungen is built on the slope of a hill. It is not unlike a dilapidated village in the Papal States, a few house-fronts painted in fresco, an archway at either end of the main street, no ostensible shops, a dry well in the square, a frightful pavement of large flags, mixed with small pebbles, of the kind which one no longer sees except in the neighbourhood of Campo Corhantin. The people, whose appearance is rustic, wear no special dress. The women go with their heads bare or wrapped in a handkerchief in the manner of the Paris milkmaids. Their skirts are short, they walk with bare legs and feet, as do the children. The men are dressed, some like the men of the people in our towns, some like our old peasants. Heaven be praised, they have only hats and the filthy cotton caps of our burgesses are unknown to them. Every day, utmost, there is a performance at Waldmungen, and I used to assist at it in the front row. At six o'clock in the morning, an old shepherd, tall and lean, goes through the village, stopping at different places. He blows a straight horn, six feet long, which one would take at a distance for a speaking trumpet or a sheep-hook. He first produces three metallic and rather harmonious notes from it, then he sounds the quick tune of a sort of gallop or rince des vaches, imitating the lowing of oxen and the grunting of pigs. The fanfare ends with a long, rising falsetto note. Suddenly, from every gate, debouche cows, heifers, calves, bulls. Bellowing, they flood the village square. They climb up or descend from all the circumjacent streets and, forming into columns, take the accustomed road to the pasturage. Follows the prancing squadron of swine, which look like wild boars and grunt. The sheep and lambs, disposed as a rear-guard, form the third part of the concert, with their bleating. The geese compose the reserve. In a quarter of an hour, all are out of sight. At seven o'clock in the evening, the horn is heard again. It is the herds returning. The order of the march is changed. The pigs form the vanguard, with the same music as before. A few, detached as scouts, run at haphazard or stop at every corner. The sheep defile, the cows with their sons, daughters and husbands bring up the rear. The geese waddle on the flanks. All these animals reach their own homes again, none mistakes its gait. But there are Cossacks that go marauding, madcaps that play about and refuse to go in, young bulls that persist in remaining with a mate which does not belong to their manger. Then come the women and children with their little switches. They compel the stragglers to rejoin the main body and the rebellious recruits to submit to the rules. I delighted in this performance, just as formerly Henry the Fourth at Shoney used to be amused by the cowkeeper called Toulomond, who collected his herds to the sound of the trumpet. Many years ago, staying at the Chateau de Fervac in Normandy at Madame de Custine's, I occupied the bedroom of Henry the Fourth. My bed was enormous. The Bernese had slept in it with some floret or other. I gained royalism there, for I did not have it by nature. Moats filled with water surround the castle. The view from my window spread over meadows edged by the little river Fervac. In those meadows I perceived one morning an elegant sow of extraordinary whiteness. It looked as though it might be the mother of Prince Marcassin. It lay at the foot of a willow, on the cool grass in the dew. A young boar pig gathered a little fine serret moss with its ivory tusks, and came to lay it on the sleeper. It repeated this operation so many times that the white wild sow was entirely hidden. One saw only its black feet stick out from under the downy verdure in which it was buried. Be this told to the glory of an ill-famed beast of which I should blush to have spoken at too great length, if Homer had not sung it, I perceive, in fact, that this part of my memoirs is nothing less than an odyssey. Valmunchen is Ithaca, the shepherd is a faithful Eumaeus with his swine, I am the son of Laertes, returning after wandering on land and sea. I should perhaps have done better to intoxicate myself with the nectar of Evanthes, to eat the flower of the moly plant, to linger in the land of the lotus-eaters, to remain with Zeus, or to obey the song of the siren, saying, Approach, come to us. 22nd May, 1833 If I were twenty years old, I should seek some adventures at Waldmunchen as a means of shortening the hours. But at my age we have no silk ladders left save in our memory, and we no longer scale walls except with the shadows. 
Formerly I was very intimate with my body. I used to advise it to live wisely in order to show itself quite lively and quite jolly in forty years' time. It laughed at the sermons of my soul, persisted in making merry, and would not have given two doits to be one day what is called a well-preserved man. Out upon you, it used to say. What have I to gain by being niggardly with my spring in order to enjoy life's days when there will be none left to care to share them with me? And it steeped itself over head and ears in happiness. I am obliged, therefore, to accept it as it now is. I took it for a walk on the twenty-second to the south-east of the village. We followed through the marshes a little water current which put some works in motion. They manufacture linen at Waldmunken. Breaths of linen were unrolled on the fields. Young girls, whose business it was to damp them, ran barefoot on the white strips, preceded by the water that spouted from their watering pots, just as gardeners would water a border of flowers. Along the stream I thought of my friends. I was touched by their memory. Then I asked what they must be saying of me in Paris. Has he arrived? Has he seen the royal family? Will he come back soon? And I was deliberating as to whether I would not send Eersant to fetch some fresh butter and brown bread, in order to eat cress at the edge of a spring under a tuft of alder shoots. My life was no more ambitious than that. Why has fortune fastened the skirt of my doublet to her wheel with the hem of the mantle of our kings? Returning to the village, I passed near the church. Two outer sanctuaries prop up the wall. One of these shows St. Peter ad vincula, with a poor box for the prisoners. I dropped in a few kreutzers in memory of the Pelico's prison, and of my own cell at the prefecture of police. The other sanctuary showed the scene in the Garden of Olives, a scene so touching and so sublime that it is not destroyed even here by the grotesqueness of the figures. I hurried through my dinner and hastened to the evening prayer, for which I heard them ringing. As I turned the corner of the narrow street in which the church stands, a vista opened out over some distant hills. A little light still lingered on the horizon, and that dying light came from the side of France. A profound feeling gripped my heart. When shall my pilgrimage be over? I passed through Germanic territory very miserably when I was returning from the army of the princes, very triumphantly when, as ambassador of Louis the Eighteenth, I was going to Berlin. After so many and such different years, I was penetrating stealthily into the depths of that same Germany to seek the King of France banished anew. I entered the church. It was quite dark, not even a lighted lamp. Through the blackness I recognised the sanctuary standing in a gothic recess, only through its thicker gloom. The walls, the altars, the pillars, seemed to me laden with ornaments and pictures veiled in crape. The nave was occupied by close-set parallel benches. An old woman was reciting aloud in German the Our Father of the Rosary. Women young and old whom I could not see replied with a Hail Mary's. The old woman spoke her words well, her voice was clear her accent grave and pathetic. She was two benches away from me, her head bent slightly in the dusk each time she uttered the word Christo in some prayer, which she added to the Our Father. The rosary was followed by the litany of the Blessed Virgin. The Ora Pro Nobis, chanted in German by the invisible worshippers, sounded in my ear like a repetition of the word hope. Espérance, espérance, espérance. We left the church promiscuously. I went to sleep with hope. It was long since I had clasped her in my arms. But she does not grow older, and one always loves her, despite her infidelities. According to Tastas, the Germans believe the night to be older than the day. Nox ducre diem videto. Yet I reckon young nights in sempiternal days. The poets tell us also that sleep is the brother of death. I do not know, but old age is certainly its nearest relation. 23rd May, 1833 on the morning of the 23rd, heaven mingled some sweetness with my pains. Baptiste told me that the most eminent man of the place, the brewer, had three daughters and owned my works, set out in a row among his beer jugs. When I went out, this gentleman and two of his daughters watched me go by. What was the third young lady doing? In former days, a letter had come to me from Peru, written with her own hand by a lady, a cousin of the son, who admired Atala. But we know now Waldmunchen, under the very nose of the wolf of Hasselbach, was a thousand times more glorious. It was true that this occurred in Bavaria, at a league from Austria, the curse of my renown. Do you know what would have happened if my trip to Bohemia had been taken out of my own head alone? 
but why should I have wanted to go to Bohemia for myself alone? Once I had been stopped at the frontier, I should have gone back to Paris. If there was a man who contemplated a voyage to Peking. One of his friends met him on the Pont Royal in Paris. Why, I thought you were in China. I have come back. Those Chinamen put difficulties in my way at Canton, so I left them in the lurch. While Baptiste was telling me of my triumphs, the passing bell of a funeral called me to my window. The priest went by, preceded by the cross. Men and women crowded after, the men in cloaks, the women in black gowns and mob caps. The corpse, taken up at the third door from mine, was carried to the graveyard. Half an hour later, the procession goers returned, minus the procession. Two young women held their handkerchiefs to their eyes. One of the two uttered loud cries. They were mourning their father. The deceased was the man who had received the viaticum on the day of my arrival. If my memoirs reach Waldmuchen, when I myself am no more, the family in mourning today will find the date of its sorrow past. Perhaps as he lay on his bed, the dying man heard the noise of my carriage. It is the only noise of me that he will have heard upon earth. After the crowd had dispersed, I took the road which I had seen the funeral take, in the direction of the winter sunrise. I found first a fish pond of stagnant water, beside which a stream flowed rapidly, like life, beside the tomb. Crosses on the other side of a rising ground showed me the position of the cemetery. I crossed a sunk road and made my way through a gap in the wall into the consecrated ground. Clay furrows represented the bodies under the soil. Here and there stood crosses. They marked outlets through which the travellers had entered the new world, even as beacons at the mouth of a river indicate the passages open to ships. A poor old man was digging the grave of a child. Alone, perspiring and bareheaded, he did not sing. He did not jest like the clowns in Hamlet. Further away was another grave, near which one saw a stool, a lever and a rope for the descent into eternity. I went straight up to this grave, which seemed to say, Here is a fine opportunity. At the bottom of the hole lay the recent coffin, covered with a few shovelfuls of white dust, while awaiting the rest. A piece of linen was gleaming upon the grass. The dead took care of their shroud. Far from his country, the Christian has it always in his power suddenly to waft himself there. He has but to visit man's last resting place around the churches. The cemetery is the family field and religion, the universal motherland. It was noon when I returned. By every calculation, the express could not be back before three o'clock. Nevertheless, every stamping of horses made me run to the window. As the hour approached, I grew convinced that the permit would not come. To destroy the time, I asked for my bill. I set myself to reckon up the chickens I had eaten. A greater than I did not disdain this trouble. Henry Tudor, seventh of the name, in whom ended the wars of the roses, red and white, even as I am going to unite the white and the tricolour cockades. Henry the seventh initialled one after the other the pages of a little account book which I have seen. To a woman for three apples, twelve pence. For discovering three hairs, six shillings, eight pence. To Master Bernard, the blind poet, a hundred shillings. This was better than Homer. To a little man at Shaftesbury, twenty shillings. We have many little men today, but they cost more than twenty shillings. At three o'clock, the hour at which the express might be back, I went with Hyacinthe along the road to Hasselbach. It was a windy day. The sky was strewn with clouds that passed across the sun, casting their shadows over the fields and fir groves. We were preceded by a herd of cattle from the village which raised, as it went, the noble dust of the army of the Grand Duke of Kurokia, to which the Knight of the Mancha so valiantly gave battle. A cavalry rose at the top of one of the ascents of the road. From there one discerned a long ribbon of the highway. Seated in a ravine, I questioned Iasant. Sister Anne, seest thou no one coming? Some village carts seen from afar made our hearts beat. As they approached, they proved to be empty, like everything that bears dreams. I had to return home and dine very sadly. A plank offered after the shipwreck. The diligence was to pass at six o'clock. Might it not bring the governor's reply? Six o'clock struck, no diligence. At a quarter past six, Baptiste entered the room. The ordinary post from Prague has just arrived. There is nothing for monsieur. The last ray of hope was extinguished. Scarcely had Baptiste left my room when Schwartz appeared, waving a big letter with a big seal in the air, and shouting, Here is de Bermid. I threw myself upon the dispatch. I tore open the envelope. It contained, together with the letter from the governor, 
the permit and a note from Monsieur de Blacas. Here is Monsieur le Comte de Trotec's letter. Prague, 23rd May, 1833. Monsieur le Vicomte. I much regret that, at your entrance into Bohemia, you should have met with difficulties and a delay in your journey. But in view of the very severe orders prevailing on our frontiers, regarding all the travellers who come from France, orders which you yourself must think very natural in the circumstances, I cannot but approve of the conduct of the head of the customs at Hasselbach. In spite of the quite European celebrity of your name, you must be so good as to excuse this official, who has not the honour to know you personally, if he had doubts as to the identity of your person, the more so as your passport was endorsed only for Lombardy, and not for all the Austrian states. As to your plan for travelling to Vienna, I am writing about it to-day to Prince Metternich, and will hasten to communicate his reply to you immediately after your arrival in Prague. I have the honour to send you herewith the reply of Monsieur le Duc de Blacas, and I beg you to be good enough to accept the assurance of the high regard with which I have the honour to be, etc., the Comte de Chotec. This reply was polite and proper. The government could not abandon the inferior authority which had, after all, done its duty. I had myself in Paris foreseen the cavilling of which my old passport might become the cause. As for Vienna, I had referred to it with a political object, in order to set M. le Comte de Chotec's mind at rest, and show him that I was not trying to avoid the Prince de Metternich. At eight o'clock in the evening, on Thursday the 23rd of May, I drove off. Who would believe it? I left Walmungen with a sort of regret. I had already grown used to my hosts. My hosts had grown accustomed to me. I knew all the faces at the windows and doors. When I walked out, they used to welcome me with a kindly air. The neighbourhood came running up to witness the departure of my calash, as dilapidated as was the monarchy of Hugh Capet. The men took off their hats, the women gave me a little nod of congratulation. My adventure was the subject of the village gossip. Every one took my part. The Bavarians and the Austrians detest one another. The first were proud at having allowed me to pass. I had often noticed, standing on the threshold of her cottage, a young Waldmunchen girl, with a face like a virgin in Raphael's first manner. Her father, with a peasant's civil bearing, used to take off his broad-rimmed felt hat to the ground to me, and give me a greeting in German, which I returned cordially in French. Standing behind him, his daughter used to blush as she looked at me over the old man's shoulder. I caught sight of my virgin again, but she was alone. I waved good-bye to her with my hand. She remained motionless. She seemed astonished. I tried to imagine I knew not what vague regrets in her thought. I left her like a wild flower which one has seen in a ditch by the roadside, and which has scented one's way. I passed the flocks of Eumaeus. He uncovered his head grown grey in the service of the sheep. He had finished his day's work. He was returning to sleep with his ewes, while Ulysses went to continue his wanderings. I had said to myself before receiving the permit, If I get it, I shall crush my persecutor. On arriving at Hasselbach, it happened to me as to Georges Dandin, that my cursed good nature was too much for me. I had no heart for the triumph. Like a real poltroon, I cowered in a corner of the carriage, and Schwartz showed the order from the governor. I should have suffered too much from the customs officer's confusion. He, on his side, did not appear, and did not even have my trunk searched. Peace be with him. Let him pardon me for the insults which I addressed to him, but which, owing to a remnant of spite, I will not erase from my memoirs. As one leaves Bavaria on that side, a vast black forest of pine trees serves as a porch to Bohemia. Mists hovered in the valleys, the light was fading, and the sky towards the west was the colour of peach blossoms. The horizons fell till they almost touched the earth. Light is lacking at that latitude, and with light, life. All is dim, winchy, pale. Winter seems to charge summer to keep the hoar frost for it until its speedy return. A small piece of the moon which shone faintly pleased me. All was not lost since I found a face that I knew. It seemed to say to me, What, are you there? Do you remember how I saw you in other forests? Do you remember the pretty things you used to say to me when you were young? Really, you used to talk very nicely about me. Why are you so silent now? Where are you going alone and so late? Will you never end recommencing your career? O oh, moon, you are right. But if I did speak of your charms, you know the services which you used to do me. You used to light my steps, at the time when I wandered with my phantom of love, 
Today my head is silvered like your face, and you are surprised to find me solitary, and you scorn me. Yet I have spent whole nights wrapped in your veils. Dare you deny our meetings on the lawns and by the seaside? How often have you looked upon my eyes passionately fixed on yours? Ungrateful and mocking planet! You ask me why I am going so late. It is hard to be reproached with the continuation of my journeys. Ah, if I travel as much as you, I do not grow young again as you do, you who return monthly into the brilliant circle of your cradle. I reckon no new moons. My abatement has no limit other than my complete disappearance, and when I go out, I shall not rekindle my torch as you do yours. I travelled all night. I passed through Tainit, Stanka, and Starb. In the morning of the 24th I went on to Pilsen, the beautiful barrack, Homeric style. The town is stamped with that air of melancholy which prevails in this country. At Pilsen, Wallenstein hoped to seize a sceptre. I, too, was in quest of a crown, but not for myself. The country is cut and slashed with heights called Bohemian Mountains, Paps, whose tip is marked by pine trees and whose swelling outlined by the green of the harvests. The villages are scarce. A few fortresses hungering for prisoners roost on the rocks like old vultures. Between Zeditz and Baran, the mountains on the right become bald. One goes through a village, the roads are spacious, the posts well equipped. All points to a monarchy that imitates old France. Johan the Blind, under Philippe of Valois, the ambassadors of George, under Louis XI, by what forest paths did they pass? Of what use are the modern roads of Germany? They will remain deserted, for there is no history, art, nor climate to call foreigners to their lonely causeways. For purposes of commerce, it is unnecessary that the public thoroughfares should be so wide and so costly to keep in repair. The richest trade in the world, that of India and Persia, is conducted on the backs of mules, asses and horses by narrow paths, hardly traced over the mountain chains or sandy zones. The present high roads in unfrequented countries will serve only for war, as vomitories for the use of the new barbarians who, issuing from the north with the immense bustle of firearms, will come to flood regions favoured by intellect and the sun. At Baran passes the little river of the same name, rather spiteful, like all curs. In 1748 it rose to the level marked on the walls of the post-house. After Baran, gorges twist round a few hills and spread out at the entrance to an upland. From this upland the road plunges into a valley with vague lines, the lap of which is occupied by a hamlet. There commences a long ascent which leads to Dushnik, the posting station and the last stage. Soon descending towards an opposite eminence at the top of which stands a cross, one discerns Prague on both banks of the Moldau. It is in that town that the sons of St. Louis are ending a life of exile, that the heir of the house is beginning a life of prescription, while his mother languishes in a fortress on the soil from which she has been driven. Frenchmen, you have sent the daughter of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, her to whom your fathers opened the gates of the temple, to Prague. You have not cared to keep among you that unique monument of greatness and virtue. O oh, my old king, you whom I love to call my master, because you have fallen. O oh, young lad, whom I was the first to proclaim king, what am I to say to you? How shall I dare to appear in your presence, I who am not banished, I who am free to return to France, free to return my last breath to the air which fired my breast when I breathed for the first time, I whose bones may rest in their native land. Captive of Blay, I am going to see your son. End of Book 3, Part 2《Part I of Book IV of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 5 by François René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book IV, Part I. I entered Prague on the 24th of May at seven o'clock in the evening, and alighted at the Bath Hotel, in the old town built on the left bank of the Moldau. I wrote a note to Monsieur le Duc de Blacas, 
to inform him of my arrival and received the following reply if you are not too tired monsieur le vicomte the king will be charmed to receive you this evening at a quarter to ten but if you wish to rest his majesty would see you with great pleasure to-morrow morning at half-past eleven pray accept my sincere compliments friday twenty fourth may seven o'clock blackard dope i did not feel that i ought to avail myself of the alternative offered to me i set out at half-past nine a man belonging to the inn who knew a few words of french led the way for me i climbed up silent gloomy streets without street lamps to the foot of the tall hill which is crowned by the immense castle of the kings of bohemia the building outlined its black mass against the sky no light issued from its windows there was there something akin to the solitude the sight and the grandeur of the vatican or of the temple of jerusalem seen from the valley of jehoshaphat one heard nothing but the sound of my footsteps and my guides i was obliged to stop at intervals on the landings of the steps that formed the roadway so steep was the incline as i climbed i discovered the town below me the links of history the fate of men the destruction of empires the designs of providence presented themselves to my recollection i identified themselves with the memory of my own destiny after exploring dead ruins i was summoned to the spectacle of living ruins when we had reached the platform on which Fradshin is built we passed through an infantry post whose guard room was near the outer wicket gate through this wicket gate we entered a square courtyard surrounded by uniform and deserted buildings on the ground floor on the right we threaded a long corridor lighted at wide intervals by glass lanterns hung on the wall on either side as in a convent or barracks at the end of this corridor was a staircase at whose foot two sentries marched up and down as i was climbing the second flight i met monsieur de blacas who was coming down i entered the apartments of charles x with him there two more grenadiers were standing sentry this foreign guard those white uniforms at the door of the king of france made a painful impression on me the idea of a prison came to me rather than a palace we passed through three pitch-dark and almost unfurnished rooms i felt as though i were wandering once more through the terrible monastery of the escorial m de blacas left me in the third room to inform the king with the same etiquette as at the tuileries he came back to fetch me showed me his majesty's closet and withdrew charles x came up to me held out his hand to me cordially and said good evening good evening m de chateaubriand i am delighted to see you i expected you you ought not to have come this evening for you must be very tired don't stand let us sit down how is your wife side note at Radshin. nothing breaks one's heart so much as simplicity of speech in the high positions of society and the great catastrophes of life i began to cry like a child i found a difficulty in stifling the sound of my sobs with my handkerchief all the bold things which i had resolved to say all the vain and relentless philosophy with which i intended to arm my conversation failed me should i become the pedagogue of misfortune should i dare to remonstrate with my king my white-haired king my king outlawed exiled ready to lay his mortal remains on foreign soil my old sovereign again took my hand on seeing the trouble of that relentless enemy that opponent of the ordinances of july his eyes were moist he made me sit beside a little wooden table on which stood two candles he sat down by the same table leaning his good ear towards me to hear me better thus apprising me of his years which came to mingle their common misfortunes with the extraordinary calamities of his life it was impossible for me to recover my voice at the sight in the residence of the emperors of austria of the sixty-eighth king of france bent under the weight of those reigns and of seventy-six years of those years twenty-four had been spent in exile five on a tottering throne the monarch was ending his last days in a last exile with the grandson whose father had been assassinated and whose mother was a prisoner charles x to break the silence addressed a few questions to me thereupon i briefly explained the object of my journey i said that i was the bearer of a letter from madame la duchesse de berry addressed to madame la dauphine in which the prisoner of blaye confided the care of her children to the prisoner of the temple as to one practised in misfortune i added that i also had a letter for the children the king replied do not give it to them 
they know only a part of what has happened to their mother you must hand me that letter however we will talk of all that at two o'clock to-morrow go to bed now you shall see my son and the children at eleven o'clock and you will dine with us the king rose wished me good night and retired i went out i joined m de blaca in the entrance room the guide was waiting for me on the staircase i returned to my inn descending the streets on their slippery pavements in as short a time as i had taken long to climb them prague twenty fifth may eighteen thirty three the next day the twenty fifth of may i received a visit from m le comte de Cosset, staying at my inn he told me of the disagreements at the castle relative to the education of the duc de bordeaux at half past ten i went up to franchin the duc de guiche took me in to m le dauphin i found him grown old and thin he was dressed in a shabby blue coat buttoned up to the chin it was too wide for him and looked as though it had been bought at a rag fair the poor prince excited a great pity in me m le dauphin has personal courage his obedience to charles x alone prevented him from proving himself at st cloud and rambouillet what he proved himself at chiclana his bashfulness has increased in consequence he finds it difficult to bear the sight of a new face he often says to the duc de guiche why are you here i have no need of any one there is no mouse hole small enough to hide me he has said also repeatedly don't talk about me don't trouble about me i am nobody i don't want to be anybody i have twenty thousand francs a year it is more than i need i have to think only of saving my soul in making a good end again he has said if my nephew had need of me i would serve him with my sword but i sign my abdication against my own feeling out of obedience to my father i shall not renew it i shall sign nothing more let them leave me in peace word is enough i never lie and that is true his mouth has never uttered a lie he reads much he has considerable attainments even in languages his correspondence with m de villele during the spanish war has its value and his correspondence with madame la dauphine which was intercepted and inserted in the monitor makes one love him his probity is incorruptible his religion is profound his filial piety rises to the height of virtue but an unconquerable shyness deprives him of the full use of his faculties to put him at his ease i avoided entering upon politics with him and only inquired after his father's health this is a subject on which he is inexhaustible the difference in climate between edinburgh and prague the king's prolonged attacks of gout the waters of teplitz which the king was going to take the good which they would do him there you have the purport of our conversation Monsieur le dauphin watches over charles x as over a child he kisses his hand when he goes up to him asks how he has slept picks up his pocket handkerchief speaks loud so as to make himself heard by him prevents him from meeting what might disagree with him makes him put on or leave off an overcoat according to the state of the weather takes him out walking and brings him back again i was careful to speak to him of nothing else of the days of july of the fall of an empire of the future of the monarchy not a word it is eleven o'clock he said you are going to see the children we shall meet again at dinner i was taken to the apartment of the governor the doors open i saw the baron de damas with his pupil madame de gonteau with mademoiselle monsieur barand monsieur la villatte and a few other devoted servants all was standing the young prince scared looked at me sideways looked at his governor as though to ask him what he was to do how to act in this danger or as though to obtain permission to speak to me mademoiselle smiled with a half smile and a timid and independent air she seemed to be paying attention to her brother's movements and gestures madame de gonteau looked proud of the education which she had given her pupils after bowing to the two children i went up to the orphan and said will henry v allow me to lay the homage of my respect at his feet when he has ascended his throne perhaps he will remember that i had the honour to say to his illustrious mother madame your son is my king so i was the first to proclaim henry v king of france and a french jury by acquitting me allowed my proclamation to stand good god save the king the child flurried at hearing himself greeted as king at hearing me speak of his mother of whom no one spoke to him now recoiled and took refuge between the baron de damas knees uttering a few emphatic but almost whispered words i said to monsieur de damas monsieur le baron my words seemed to surprise the king 
I see that he knows nothing of his courageous mother, and that he is ignorant of what his servants have sometimes had the happiness to do for the cause of the legitimate royalty. The governor replied, Monseigneur is taught what loyal subjects like yourself, Monsieur le Vicomte. He did not finish his sentence. Monsieur de Dama hastened to state that the moment for study had arrived. He invited me to the riding lesson at four o'clock. I went to pay a visit to Madame la Duchesse de Guiche, who lived at some distance in another part of the castle. It took nearly ten minutes to go to her through corridor after corridor. When ambassador in London, I had given a little fete in honour of Madame de Guiche, then in all the brilliancy of her youth and followed by a host of adorers. In Prague I found her changed, but the expression of her face pleased me more. Her head was dressed in a way that suited her delightfully. Her hair, plaited in little tresses like that of an odalisk or a sabine medal, was festooned in ringlets on either side of her forehead. The Duchesse and Duc de Guiche represented in Prague beauty chained to adversity. Madame de Guiche had heard of what I had said to the Duc de Bordeaux. She told me that they wanted to send away Monsieur Baron, that there was a talk of calling in some Jesuits, that Monsieur de Dama had postponed but not abandoned his plans. A triumvirate existed, composed of the Duc de Blacas, the Baron de Dama, and the Cardinal de Latille. This triumvirate tended to take possession of the coming reign by isolating the young king and bringing him up in principles and under men antipathetic to France. The remainder of the inhabitants of the castle cabaled against the triumvirate. The children themselves headed the opposition. The opposition, however, had different shades. The Gonto party was not quite the same as the Guiche party. The Marquise de Bouillet, a deserter from the Berry party, took sides with the Abbe Moligny. Madame la Dauphine, placed at the head of the impartials, was not exactly favourable to the young France party, represented by M. Baron, but, as she spoiled the Duc de Bordeaux, she often leant towards his side and stood by him against his governor. Madame Dago, devoted body and soul to the triumvirate, had no credit with the Dauphiness other than that which she enjoyed thanks to her presence and importunity. After paying my respects to Madame de Guiche, I went to Madame de Gonteau's. She was expecting me with the Princesse Louise. Mademoiselle somewhat recalls her father. She is fair-haired. Her blue eyes have a shrewd expression. She is short for her age and is not so full-grown as her portraits represent her. Her whole person is a mixture of the child, the young girl and the young princess. She looks up, lowers her eyes, smiles with an artless coquetry mingled with art. One does not know if one ought to tell her fairy stories, make her a declaration, or talk to her with respect as to a queen. The Princess Louise adds to the agreeable accomplishments a good deal of information. She speaks English and is beginning to know German well. She even has a little foreign accent, and exile is already marking itself in her language. Madame de Gonteau presented me to my little king's sister, Innocent fugitives, they were like two gazelles hiding among ruins. Mademoiselle Vachon, the under-governess, an excellent and distinguished spinster, arrived. We sat down and Madame de Gonteau said to me, We can speak, Mademoiselle knows all. She deplores with us what we see. Mademoiselle said to me at once, Oh, Henry was very silly this morning. He was frightened. Grandpapa said to us, Guess whom you will see tomorrow. It's one of the powers of the earth. We said, Well, it's the emperor. No, said Grandpapa. We tried again. We could not guess. He said, It's a Vicomte de Chateaubriand. I hit myself on the forehead for not guessing. The princess struck her forehead, blushing like a rose, smiling bitterly through her moist and gentle eyes. I was dying with a respectful longing to kiss her little white hand. She continued, You did not hear what Henry said when you asked him to remember you. He said, Oh, yes, always. But he said it so low. He was afraid of you and afraid of his governor. I was making signs to him, did you see? You will be more pleased this evening. He will speak. Wait. This solicitude of the young princess on her brother's behalf was charming. I was almost committing a crime of lèse majesté. Mademoiselle remarked it, and this gave her a bearing of conquest that was captivating in its grace. I put her mind at rest as to the impression which Henry had made upon me. I was very glad, she said, to hear you speak of Mamma before Monsieur de Nama. Will she soon have left prison? My readers know that I had a letter from Madame la Duchesse de Berry for the children. I did not tell them of it, because they did not know of the details subsequent to the captivity. The king had asked me for this letter. I considered that I was not at liberty to give it to him, and that I ought to take it to Madame la Dauphine, to whom I was sent, and who was then taking the waters at Carlsbad. 
Madame de Gonteau repeated what Monsieur de Cossé and Madame de Guiche had already told me. Mademoiselle groaned with childish seriousness. Her governess, having spoken of Monsieur Baron's discharge and the probable arrival of a Jesuit, the Princess Louise crossed her hands and said with a sigh, That would be very unpopular. I could not help laughing. Mademoiselle began to laugh also, still blushing. A few moments remained before my audience of the king. I got into my calash and went to call on the Grand Burgrave, Count Chotek. He lived in a country house half a league from the town, on the side of the castle. I found him at home and thanked him for his letter. He invited me to dinner for Monday, the 27th of May. On returning to the castle at two o'clock, I was introduced to the king's presence, as on the preceding day, by Monsieur de Blacas. Charles X received me with his customary kindness and with that elegant ease of manner which the years render more perceptible in him. He made me sit again at the little table. Here is a detailed account of our conversation. Sire, Madame la Duchesse de Berry commanded me to come to see you and to hand a letter to Madame la Dauphine. I do not know what the letter contains, although it is open. It is written in invisible ink, as is the letter for the children. But in my two letters of credence, one intended to be shown, the other of a confidential character, Marie Caroline explains to me what is in her mind. During her captivity she commits her children, as I told your majesty yesterday, to the special protection of Madame la Dauphine. Madame la Duchesse de Berry charges me besides to report to her on the education of Henry V, whom they here call the Duc de Bordeaux. Lastly, Madame la Duchesse de Berry declares that she has contracted a secret marriage with Count Hector Lucchese Pali, a member of an illustrious family. These secret marriages of princesses, for which there are many precedents, do not deprive them of their rights. Madame la Duchesse de Berry asked to preserve her rank as a French princess, the regency and the guardianship. When she is free, she proposes to come to Prague to embrace her children and lay her respects at your majesty's feet. The king answered with severity. I made the best reply that I could, out of a recrimination. I beg your majesty to pardon me, but it seems to me that you have been prejudiced. Monsieur de Blacas is no doubt an enemy of my august client. Charles X interrupted me. No, but she has treated him badly, because he prevented her from committing follies, from embarking on mad enterprises. It is not given to everybody, I said, to commit follies of that kind. Henry the Fourth fought like Madame la Duchesse de Berry, and, like her, he was not always sufficiently strong. Sire, I continued, you do not wish Madame de Berry to be a princess of France. She will be so in spite of you. The whole world will always call her the Duchesse de Berry, the heroic mother of Henry V. Her dauntless courage and her sufferings overtower everything. You cannot, like the Duc d'Orléans, wish to brand at one blow the children and the mother. Is it so difficult for you, then, to forgive a woman's glory? Well, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, said the King, with good-natured emphasis, let Madame la Duchesse de Berry go to Palermo. Let her there live with Monsieur le Cazy, as husband and wife, in sight of all the world. Then her children shall be told that their mother is married. She shall come to embrace them. I felt that I had pushed the matter far enough. The principal points were three-fourths obtained, the preservation of the title, and the admission to Prague at a more or less distant period. Feeling sure of completing my task with Madame la Dauphine, I changed the conversation. Obstinate minds jib at persistency. One spoils everything with such minds when one tries to carry everything by main force. I passed to the prince's education in the interest of the future. On this subject I was not clearly understood. Religion has made a solitary of Charles X. His ideas are cloistered. I slipped in a few words on the capacity of Monsieur Baron and the want of capacity of Monsieur de Damas. The king said, Monsieur Baron is a man of attainments, but he takes too much upon himself. He was chosen to teach the Duc de Bordeaux the exact sciences, but he teaches everything, history, geography, Latin. I have sent for the Abbe McCarthy to share Monsieur Baron's labours. He will be here soon. These words made me shudder, for the new tutor could evidently be only a Jesuit, replacing a Jesuit. The fact that, in the present state of society in France, the mere idea of attaching a disciple of Loyola to the person of Henry V had entered into the head of Charles X was enough to make one despair of the house. When I had recovered from my astonishment, I asked, Is not the king afraid of the effect upon public opinion of a tutor taken from the ranks of a famous but calumniated society? 
the king exclaimed, Pooh! Are they still at the Jesuits? I spoke to the king of the elections and the desire of the royalists to know his wishes, the king replied. I cannot say to a man, take an oath against your conscience. Those who think that they ought to take it are doubtless acting with good intentions. I have no prejudice, my dear friend, against men. Their past lives matter little when they are sincerely anxious to serve France and the legitimacy. The Republicans wrote to me in Edinburgh. I accepted, as concerns them personally, all that they asked of me, but they wanted to impose conditions of government upon me. I rejected them. I will never yield on matters of principle. I want to leave my grandson a more solid throne than mine was. Are the French happier and freer today than they were with me? Do they pay less taxes? What a milk cow France is! If I had allowed myself to do a quarter of the things that Monsieur le Duc d'Orléans has done, what outcries, what curses! They plotted against me. They have owned it. I wanted to defend myself. The king stopped, as though embarrassed by the number of his thoughts, and by the fear of saying something that might hurt me. All this was well and good. But what did Charles X understand by principles? Had he accounted for the cause of the real or imaginary conspiracies hatched against his government? After a moment of silence, he resumed. How are your friends, the Bertins? They have no reason to complain of me, as you know. They are very severe upon a banished man who has done them no harm, at least as far as I know. But, my dear fellow, I bear no one ill will. Let everybody behave as he thinks right. This sweetness of temperament, this Christian meekness on the part of an expelled and slandered king, brought tears to my eyes. I tried to say a few words about Louis-Philippe, Ah, said the king, Monsieur le Duc d'Orléans, he judged. What do you expect? Men are like that. Not a bitter word, not a reproach, not a complaint could escape from the mouth of the thrice-banished old man. And yet French hands had cut off his brother's head and pierced his son's heart. To such an extent have those hands been mindful and implacable towards him. I praised the king with all my heart, and in a voice broken with emotion. I asked him if it was not part of his intention to put a stop to all that secret correspondence, to dismiss all those commissaries who, for forty years, have been deceiving the legitimacy. The king assured me that he was resolved to put an end to that impotent mischief. He had already, he said, named a few serious persons, including myself, to compose a sort of council in France, competent to keep him informed of the truth. Monsieur de Blacas would explain all that. I begged Charles X to assemble his servants and hear me. He referred me to Monsieur de Blacas. I called the King's attention to the time of the majority of Henry V. I spoke to him of a declaration as a necessary thing to be made. The King, who inwardly would have nothing to say to this declaration, invited me to draft the model for him. I replied respectfully but firmly that I would never formulate a declaration at the foot of which my name should not appear below the King's. My reason was that I did not wish to have put to my account the eventual changes introduced into any deed by Prince Metternich and Monsieur de Blacas. I pointed out to the King that he was too far from Paris, that one would have time to make two or three revolutions before he was informed of it in Prague. The King replied that the Emperor had left him free to choose his place of residence in all the Austrian states, the Kingdom of Lombardy excepted. But, added His Majesty, the towns in Austria that one can live in are all at more or less the same distance from France. In Prague I am lodged for nothing, and my position obliges me to make that calculation. A noble calculation for a prince who had for five years enjoyed a civil list of twenty millions, without counting the royal residences. For a prince who had left to France the colony of Algiers and the ancient patrimony of the Bourbons, valued at twenty-five to thirty millions per annum. Sire, your loyal subjects have often thought that your royal indigence might have some needs. They are ready to club together, each according to his means, in order to make you independent of foreigners. I believe, my dear Chateaubriand, said the king, laughing, that you are not much richer than myself. How have you paid for your journey? I said, Sire, it would have been impossible for me to come to you if Madame la Duchesse de Berry had not instructed her banker, Monsieur Jogues, to pay me six thousand francs. "'That's very little,' exclaimed the king. "'Do you want any more?' "'No, sire, I ought, even by careful management, "'to be able to return something to the poor prisoner. "'But I am not good at bargaining.' "'You were a magnificent lord in Rome. 
I always conscientiously squandered what the king gave me. I did not have two sous left. You know that I still have your peer's salary at your disposal. You refused it. No, sire, because you have more unfortunate servants than myself. You helped me out of my difficulty for the twenty thousand francs of debts that remained over from my Roman embassy, after the ten thousand which I borrowed from your great friend, Monsieur Lafitte. I owed them to you, said the king. It did not even amount to what you sacrificed in salary when sending in your resignation as ambassador, which, by the way, hurt me not a little. However that may be, sire, whether it was due to me or not, your majesty, by coming to my assistance, did me a service at the time, and I will pay you back your money when I can. But not at present, for I am as poor as a rat. My house in the Rue d'Enfer is not paid for. I live promiscuously with Madame de Chateaubriand's poor, while waiting for the lodging which I have already visited, for your majesty's sake, and Monsieur Gisquet's. When I pass through a town, I first inquire if there is an almshouse. If there is, I sleep peacefully. Board and lodging, who asks for more? Oh, it won't end like that. How much would you want, Chateaubriand, to be rich? Sire, you would be wasting your time. If you gave me four millions this morning, I should not have a farthing to-night. The king shook my shoulder with his hand. Capital! But what the devil do you throw away your money on? Faith, sire, I don't know, for I have no tastes and no expenses. It's incomprehensible. I am such a fool that, when I went to the foreign office, I would not take the twenty-five thousand francs allowed for the expenses of installation, and that, when leaving, I scorn to purloin the secret service money. You are talking to me of my fortune to avoid talking to me of your own. That is true, said the king. Here is my confession in my turn. By spending my capital in equal portions from year to year, I have calculated that at my age I can live till my last day without needing anybody. If I found myself in distress, I should prefer, as you suggest, to apply to Frenchmen rather than foreigners. They have offered to raise loans for me, among others, one of thirty millions, which would have been subscribed in Holland. But I knew that that loan, when quoted on the principal exchanges in Europe, would send down the French funds. This prevented me from adopting that plan. Nothing that would affect the public fortune in France could suit me. A sentiment worthy of a king. In this conversation the reader will have remarked the generous character, the gentle manners, and the good sense of Charles X. It would have been a curious sight for a philosopher to see the subject and the king questioning each other as to their fortunes, and making mutual confidences as to their poverty, inside a castle borrowed from the sovereigns of Bohemia. Prague, 25th and 26th May, 1833. At the end of this conference I attended Henry's riding lesson. He rode two horses, the first without stirrups, the horse being led, the second with stirrups, performing vaults without his holding the reins, with a stick passed between his back and arms. The child is daring, and nothing less than elegant in his white trousers, his short coat, his little ruff, and his cap. Monsieur O'Hegarty, the elder, the teaching equerry, shouted, "'What's that leg doing? It's like a stick. Let your leg go. Good. Awful. What's the matter with you today?' And so on. The lesson over, the young page king pulled up on horseback in the middle of the riding-school, took off his cap, suddenly, to salute me in the gallery, where I was standing with the Baron de Dama and some French people, and sprang from his horse as nimbly and gracefully as the little Jean de saint -Tray. Henry is slender, agile, well-built. He is fair. He has blue eyes with a trait in the left eye which reminds one of his mother's look. His movements are sudden. He accosts you frankly. He is curious and asks questions. He has none of the pedantry which the newspapers ascribe to him. He is a genuine little boy, like any little boy of twelve. I complimented him on his good appearance on horseback. You have seen nothing, he said. You ought to see me on my black horse. He's as vicious as a demon. He kicks, he throws me. I get up again, we jump the gate. The other day he hit himself. He's got a leg as thick as that. Isn't the last horse I was riding a pretty one? But I was not in form. Henry at present detests the Baron de Damas, whose appearance, character, and ideas are repellent to him. He frequently loses his temper with him. In consequence of these rages, the prince must needs be punished. He is sometimes condemned to stay in bed, a stupid punishment. Next comes an Abbe Moligny, who confesses the rebel and tries to frighten him out of his wits. The obstinate one will not listen and refuses to eat. Then Madame la Dauphine decides in favour of Henry, 
who eats and laughs at the baron the education proceeds in this vicious circle what monsieur le duc de bordeaux ought to have is a light hand which would lead him without making him feel the bit a governor who should be his friend rather than his master if the family of st louis were like that of the stuarts a kind of private family expelled by a revolution confined within an island the destiny of the bourbons would in a short time be foreign to the new generations our old royal power is more than that it represents the old royalty the political moral and religious past of the people is born of that power and grouped around it the fate of a house so closely intertwined with the social order that was so nearly allied to the social order that is can never be indifferent to mankind but destined though that house be to live the condition of the individuals composing it with whom a hostile fate had not made a truce would be deplorable in perpetual misfortune those individuals would march forgotten on a parallel line along the glorious memory of their family there is nothing sadder than the existence of fallen kings their days are no more than a tissue of realities and fictions remaining sovereigns by their own firesides among their people and their memories they have no sooner crossed the threshold of their house than they find the ironical truth at their door james the second or edward the seventh charles the tenth or louis the nineteenth behind closed doors become with open doors james or edward charles or louis without numerals like the labourers their neighbours they suffer the twofold drawbacks of court life and private life the flatterers the favourites the intrigues the ambitions of the one the affronts the distress the gossiping of the other it is a continual masquerade of menials and ministers changing clothes the mood sours in this situation hopes weaken regrets increase one recalls the past one recriminates one exchanges reproaches which are the more bitter inasmuch as the utterance ceases to be confined within the good taste of a high origin and the proprieties of a superior fortune one becomes vulgar through vulgar sufferings the cares of a lost throne degenerate into domestic worries popes clement the fourteenth and pius the sixth were never able to restore peace in the pretender's household those discrowned aliens remain under supervision in the middle of the world repelled by the princes as infected with adversity suspected by the peoples as smitten with power i went to dress i had been informed that i might keep on my frock and my boots but misfortune is too high in station to be approached with familiarity i reached the castle at a quarter to six the dinner was laid in one of the entrance rooms i found the cardinal de la tille in the drawing-room i had not met him since he had dined with me in rome at the embassy palace at the time of the meeting of the conclave after the death of leo the twelfth what a change of destiny for me and for the world between those two dates he was still the hedge priest with the plump belly the pointed nose the pale face just as i had seen him in the chamber of peers with an ivory paper knife in his hand people asserted that he had no influence and that he was put in a corner and received more kicks than halfpence perhaps but there are different sorts of credit the cardinal's is none the less sure because it is secret he derives his credit from the long years spent beside the king and from his priestly character the abbe de la tille has been an intimate confidant the remembrance of madame de polastron hangs about the confessor's surplice the charm of the last human frailties and the sweetness of the first religious sentiments are prolonged as memories in the old monarch's heart there arrived in succession m de blacas m a de damas the baron's brother m o'hegarty the elder m and madame de cosset at six o'clock precisely the king appeared followed by his son we hurried in to dinner the king put me on his right he had m le dauphin on his left m de blacas sat down opposite the king between the cardinal and madame de cosset the other guests were placed at random the children dined with their grandfather on sundays only this is to deprive oneself of the only happiness that remains in exile family life and intimacy it was a fish dinner and none too good at that the king extolled to me the merits of a fish from the moldau which possessed none at all four or five footmen in black roamed like lay brothers about the refectory there was no house steward every one helped himself and offered to help others from the dish before him the king ate well asked to be served and himself served what he was asked for he was in a good humour the fear which he had had of me was past 
the conversation turned within a circle of commonplaces on the bohemian climate the health of madame la dauphine my journey the wit sunday ceremonies which were to take place to-morrow not a word of politics monsieur le dauphin after sitting with his nose deep in his plate would sometimes emerge from his silence and addressing the cardinal de la tille said prince of the church the gospel of this morning was according to st matthew was it not no monseigneur according to st mark what st mark a great dispute followed between st mark and st matthew and the cardinal was beaten dinner lasted nearly an hour the king rose and we followed him to the drawing-room the newspapers lay on a table we all sat down and began to read then and there as if in a cafe the children came in the duke de bordeaux escorted by his governor mademoiselle by her governess they ran up to kiss their grandfather and then rushed to me we ensconced ourselves in the embrasure of a window overlooking the town and commanding a splendid view i renewed my compliments on the riding lesson mademoiselle hastened to tell me again what her brother had already told me that i had seen nothing that one could not form an opinion while the black horse was lame madame de gonteau came to sit near us monsieur de dama a little further away giving an ear in an amusing state of anxiety as though i were going to eat his pupil or drop a few words on the liberty of the press or the glory of madame la duchesse de berry i would have laughed at the fears with which i inspired him if i had been able to laugh at a poor man after monsieur de polignac suddenly henry said to me have you ever seen a constrictor a boa constrictor monseigneur means there are none either in egypt or at tunis the only places in africa at which i have touched but i have seen many snakes in america oh yes said the princess louise the rattlesnake in the genie du christianisme i bowed to thank mademoiselle but you have seen plenty of other snakes asked henry are they very vicious some of them monseigneur are exceedingly dangerous others have no venom and one makes them dance the two children came close up to me with delight keeping their four beautiful eyes fixed on mine and then there is the glass snake i said he is splendid to look at and does you no harm he is as transparent and brittle as glass you break him as soon as you touch him can't the pieces come together again asked the prince no no dear mademoiselle answered for me you went to the falls of niagara henry resumed they roar terribly don't they can you go down in a boat monseigneur one american amused himself by sending a great barge down another american they say himself jumped into the cataract he was not destroyed the first time he tried again and was killed at the second attempt the two children lifted up their hands and said oh madame de gonteau joined in the conversation monsieur de chateaubriand has been to egypt and jerusalem mademoiselle clapped her hands and came still closer to me monsieur de chateaubriand she said do tell my brother about the pyramids and our lord's sepulchre i told them a story as best i could of the pyramids the holy sepulchre the jordan the holy land the children were marvellously attentive mademoiselle took her pretty face in her two hands with her elbows almost resting on my knees and henry perched on a high armchair swung his legs to and fro after that fine talk about serpents cataracts pyramids and the holy sepulchre mademoiselle said will you put me a question in history how in history yes ask me about a year the least important year in the whole history of france except the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries which we have not yet begun oh i exclaimed henry i prefer a famous year ask me something about a famous year he was not so sure of his facts as his sister i began by obeying the princess and said well then will mademoiselle tell me what happened and who was reigning in france in a thousand and one and the brother and sister began to try henry pulling at his forelock mademoiselle shading her face with her two hands a familiar trick with her as though she were playing at hide-and-seek and then she suddenly reveals her young and merry countenance her smiling mouth her limpid look she was the first to say robert was reigning gregory v was pope basil the second emperor of the east and otto the third emperor of the west cried henry hurrying so as not to remain behind his sister and added vermin the second in spain mademoiselle interrupting him said ethelred in england no no said her brother it was edmund ironside mademoiselle was right henry was a few years out in favour of ironside 
who had fascinated him, but it was none the less prodigious. And my famous year? asked Henry in a half vexed tone. That's true, Monseigneur. What happened in the year fifteen ninety three? Pooh! exclaimed the young prince. The abjuration of Henry the Fourth. Mademoiselle turned red at not having been able to answer first. Eight o'clock struck. The Baron de Damas' voice cut short our conversation, just as when the hammer of the clock striking ten used to arrest my father's steps in the great hall at Combourg. Dear children, the old crusader has told you his adventures in Palestine, but not by the fireside in the castle of Queen Blanche. To find you he came knocking with his palmer's staff and his dusty sandals at the foreigner's icy threshold. Blondel has sung in vain at the foot of the tower of the dukes of Austria. His voice could not open the road to the motherland for you. Young outlaws, the traveller to distant lands has concealed a part of his story from you. He has not told you that, a poet and prophet, he dragged through the forests of Florida and on the mountains of Judea as much despair, sadness and passion as you have hope, gladness and innocence. That there was a day when, like Julien, he threw his blood at heaven, blood of which God, in his mercy, has preserved a few drops for him, so that he may redeem those which he gave up to the God of curses. The prince, taken away by his governor, invited me to his history lesson, fixed for next Monday at eleven o'clock in the morning. Madame de Gonteau withdrew with Mademoiselle. Then began a scene of another kind. The future royalty, in the person of a child, had just drawn me into its games, and now the past royalty, in the person of an old man, made me assist at its diversions. A rub of whist, lighted by two candles in the corner of a dark room, began between the king and the dauphin and the duc de blacas and the cardinal de la tille i was the only onlooker with o'hegarty the equerry through the windows whose shutters were not closed the twilight came to mingle its pallor with that of the candles the monarchy was dying out between those two expiring lights profound silence reigned but for the shuffling of the cards and a few exclamations from the king who was angry cards were renewed after the latins in order to solace the adversity of charles the sixth but there is no ogier nor la hire nowadays to give his name under charles the tenth to those distractions of misfortune when the cards were over the king wished me good night i went through the deserted and gloomy rooms through which i had passed on the previous evening the same stairs the same courtyards the same guards and descending the slope of the hill i returned to my inn after losing my way in the streets and the dark Charles X remained shut up in the black mass which I had just left. Nothing can equal the sadness of his forlornness and of his years. Prague, 27th May, 1833. I had great need of my bed, but the Baron Capel, newly arrived from Holland, was lodged in a room next to mine and came hurrying to me. When the torrent falls from on high, the abyss which it hollows out and in which it is swallowed up fixes one's gaze and leaves one dumb but i have neither patience nor pity to waste on the ministers whose feeble hands let the crown of st louis fall into the whirlpool as though the waves would carry it back those of his ministers who claim to have opposed the ordinances are the most guilty those who say that they were the most moderate are the least innocent if they saw so clearly why did they not resign they did not want to abandon the king Monsieur le Dauphin treated them as cowards. A poor evasion. They were unable to tear themselves from their portfolios. Whatever they may say, there is nothing else at the bottom of that immense catastrophe. And what a fine composure after the event. One is scribbling about the history of England, after bringing the history of France to so pretty a plight. The other laments the life and death of the Duc de Reichstadt, after sending the Duc de Bordeaux to Prague. I knew Monsieur Capel. It is only fair to remember that he had remained poor. His pretensions did not exceed his value. He would very readily have said, with Lucian, If you come to listen to me in the hope of smelling amber and hearing the song of the swan, I call the gods to witness that I have never spoken of myself in terms so magnificent. At the present day, modesty is a rare quality, and the only wrong that Monsieur Capel did was to allow himself to be appointed a minister. I received a visit from Monsieur le Baron de Damas. The virtues of that brave officer had flown to his head. A religious congestion was puzzling his brain. There are some associations which are fatal. The Duc de Riviere, 
when dying, recommended M. de Damas as governor to the Duc de Bordeaux. The France de Polignac was a member of that set. Incapacity is a form of Freemasonry which has its lodges in every country. That secret society has oubliettes of which it opens the plugs, and in which it causes states to disappear. The domestic condition came so naturally to the court that Monsieur de Damas, when choosing Monsieur Laviette, would never grant him any title other than that of first groom of the bedchamber to Monseigneur le Duc de Bordeaux. I took a liking at first sight to this grey moustachioed soldier whose business it was, like a faithful dog, to bark round his sheep. He belonged to those loyal grenade-throwers whom the terrible Maréchal de Montluc used to esteem, saying, they have no back shop in them. Monsieur Laviat will be dismissed because of his sincerity, not because of his bluntness. One can put up with barren bluntness. Often adulation in camp imparts an air of independence to flattery. But with the brave old soldier of whom I am speaking, it was all frankness. He would have taken off his mustachios with honour to himself if he had borrowed thirty thousand piastres on them, like Joao de Castro. His crabbed face was only the expression of liberty. He merely informed one by his appearance that he was ready. Before taking the field with their army, the Florentines used to warn the enemy of their intention by the sound of the bell Martinella. Prague, 27th May, 1833 I had intended to hear Mass at the cathedral within the castle precincts, but being detained by visitors, I had time only to go to what was formerly the Jesuit church. They were singing to an organ accompaniment. A woman near me had a voice which made me look round at her. At the communion she covered her face with her two hands and did not approach the holy table. Alas, I have already explored many churches in the four quarters of the globe without being able to lay aside, even at the tomb of the Saviour, the rough hair cloth of my thoughts. I have depicted Aben Hamet wandering in the Christian mosque at Cordoba, he caught a glimpse at the foot of a pillar of a motionless figure which he took at first sight for a statue on a tombstone. The original of that night of whom Aben Hamet caught sight was a religious whom I had met in the church of the Escorial and whom I had envied his faith. Who knows, however, the storms deep down in that contemplative soul or what entreaty ascended towards the holy and innocent pontiff? I had been admiring in the unfrequented sacristy of the Escorial one of Murillo's most beautiful virgins. I was with a woman. It was she who first showed me the monk deaf to the sound of the passions that passed through the formidable silence of the sanctuary around him. After mass in Prague, I sent for a calash. I took the road laid out along the old fortifications by which carriages drive up to the castle. They were busy marking out gardens on the ramparts. The euphony of a forest will take the place here of the noise of the Battle of Prague. The whole will be very handsome in forty years or so. God grant that Henry V may not stay here long enough to enjoy the shade of a leaf as yet unborn. Having to dine at the governor's tomorrow, I thought that it would be polite to go to call on Madame la Comtesse de Chotec. I should have thought her amiable and pretty, even if she had not quoted passages from writings to me from memory. I went to Madame de Guiche's evening, where I met General Skritznecki and his wife, he told me the story of the Polish insurrection and the Battle of Ostrolenka. When I rose to go, the general asked me to permit him to press my venerable hand and to embrace the patriarch of the liberty of the press. His wife wished to embrace in me the author of the Genie du Christianisme. The monarchy accepted with all its heart the fraternal kiss of the Republic. I felt an honest man's satisfaction. I was glad to rouse noble sympathies on different scores in two foreign hearts to be pressed in turn to the breast of husband and wife, through liberty and religion. On Monday the 27th, in the morning, the opposition came to tell me that I could not see the young prince. Monsieur de Damas had tired his pupil by dragging him from church to church to the stations of the Jubilee. This weariness served as a pretext for a holiday and was made to justify a trip to the country. They wanted to hide the child from me. I spent the morning in visiting the town. At five o'clock I went to dine at Count Chotek's. The house belonging to Count Chotek was built by his father, who was also Grand Burgrave of Bohemia, and presents externally the form of a Gothic chapel. Nothing is original nowadays, everything is copied. The drawing-room gives a view over the gardens, they slope down into a valley. 
the light is always dull the soil greyish as in those many cornered recesses of the mountains of the north where gaunt nature wears the hair shirt the table was laid under the trees in the pleasure ground we dined without our hats my head which so many storms have insulted by carrying off my hair was sensitive to the breath of the wind while i strove to keep my mind on my dinner i could not help watching the birds and clouds that flew over the banquet passengers embarked on the breezes and having secret relations with my destinies travellers the objects of my envy whose aerial course my eyes cannot follow without a sort of emotion i was more at home with those parasites wandering in the sky than with the guests seated near me on the earth happy those anchorites who had a raven for dapifer i cannot speak to your prague society because i met it only at that dinner there was a woman present who was very much in the fashion in vienna and very witty i was told she seemed to me an acrimonious and foolish person although she still had a certain youthfulness like those trees which keep in summer the dried clusters of the flower which they have borne in spring i know therefore of the manners of this country only those of the sixteenth century as told by bassompierre he loved anna esther eighteen years of age and six months a widow he spent five days and six nights in disguise and hidden in a room with his mistress he played tennis in Schradschin with wallenstein being neither wallenstein nor bassompierre i laid claim to neither empire nor love the modern esters ask for asuruses who are able disguised though they be to get rid of their dominoes at night one does not lay aside the mask of the years prague twenty seventh may eighteen thirty three after the dinner was over at seven o'clock i waited on the king i there met the same persons as before excepting m le duc de bordeaux who was said to be ailing from his stations on the sunday the king was half reclining on a sofa and mademoiselle sitting on a chair right up against the knees of charles x who was stroking his granddaughter's arm and telling her stories the young princess listened attentively when i appeared she looked at me with the smile of a reasonable person who should say i must do something to amuse my grandpapa chateaubriand exclaimed the king i did not see you yesterday sire i was told too late that your majesty had done me the honour to name me for your dinner party also it was whit sunday a day on which i am not allowed to see your majesty how is that asked the king sire it was on whit sunday nine years ago that when i came to pay my court to you they forbade me your door charles x seemed touched they won't drive you away from the castle of prague no sire for i do not see those good servants here who showed me out on the day of prosperity the whist playing began and the day came to an end after the rubber i returned the duc de blacas visit the king he said has told me that we were to have a talk i replied that as the king had not thought it expedient to summon his council before which i could have set forth my ideas regarding the future of france and the majority of the duc de bordeaux i had nothing more to say his majesty has no council rejoined the duc de blacas with a tremulous laugh and a self-satisfied look in his eyes he has no one but me absolutely no one the grand master of the wardrobe has the highest opinion of himself a french complaint to hear him speak he does everything he is equal to everything he married the duchesse de berry he does what he pleases with the kings he leads metternich by the nose he has nestle road under his thumb he reigns in italy he has carved his name on an obelisk in rome he has the keys of the conclaves in his pocket the three last popes owe their elevation to him he knows public opinion so well he measures his ambition so well by his strength that when accompanying madame la duchesse de berry he had himself given a diploma appointing him head of the council of regency prime minister and minister of foreign affairs and that is how those poor people understand france and the times nevertheless m de blacas is the most intelligent and the most moderate of the band in conversation he is reasonable he always agrees with you is that what you think it is just what i was saying yesterday we have absolutely the same ideas he bemoans his slavery he is tired of business he would like to live in an unknown corner of the earth to die there in peace far from the world as to his influence with charles x don't speak of it to him they think that he sways charles x they are wrong he can do nothing with the king the king refuses a thing in the morning 
at night he grants the same thing and nobody knows why he has changed his mind and so on when monsieur de blacas tells you these tales he is telling the truth because he never thought the king but he is not sincere because he inspires charles x only with those wishes which are in accordance with that prince's inclinations for the rest monsieur de blacas possesses courage and honour he is not without generosity he is devoted and faithful by rubbing himself against the high aristocracy and acquiring wealth he has caught the ways of both he is very well born he comes of a poor but ancient house known in poetry and arms his stiff and formal manners his assurance his strictness in matters of etiquette preserve for his masters an air of nobility which one loses too easily in misfortune at least in the museum in prague the inflexibility of a suit of armour holds erect a body which would fall without it m de blacas does not lack a certain energy he dispatches ordinary affairs quickly he is orderly and methodical a fairly enlightened connoisseur in some branches of archaeology a lover of the arts without imagination and an icy libertine he does not grow excited even over his passions his coolness would be a statesmanlike quality if his coolness were other than his confidence in his genius and his genius betrays him one feels in him the abortive great lord even as one feels it in his fellow countryman la valette duc de pernon either there will or there will not be a restoration if there is a restoration m de blacas will come back with places and honours if there is no restoration the fortune of the grand master of the wardrobe is almost all invested out of france charles x and louis the nineteenth will be dead he m de blacas will be very old his children will remain the companions of the exiled prince illustrious foreigners at foreign courts praise god for all things thus the revolution which exalted and ruined bonaparte will have enriched m de blacas that makes amends m de blacas with his long impassive colourless face is the monarchy's undertaker in ordinary he buried it at hartwell he buried it at ghent he buried it again in edinburgh and he will bury it again in prague or elsewhere always attending to the remains of the high and mighty defunct like those peasants on the coasts who pick up the wreckage which the sea casts up on its shores end of book four part one Part two of Book four of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume five by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book four, Part two. Prague, twenty eighth and twenty ninth May, eighteen thirty three. On Monday, the 28th of May, as the history lesson at which I was to have been present at eleven o'clock did not take place, I found myself free to go through, or rather to revisit the town, which I had already seen and seen again in coming and going. I do not know why I had imagined that Prague was nestled in a gap of mountains, that threw their black shadow over a huddled kettle full of houses. Prague is a bright city, in which twenty-five or thirty graceful towers and steeples rise up to the sky. Its architecture reminds one of a town of the Renaissance. The long sway of the emperors over the Cisalpine countries filled Germany with artists from those countries. The Austrian villages are villages of Lombardy, Tuscany, or the Venetian mainland. One would think oneself under the roof of an Italian peasant if, in the farmhouses with their great bare rooms, a stove did not take the place of the sun. The view enjoyed from the windows of the castle is agreeable. On one side you see the orchards of a cool valley with green slopes enclosed by the denticulated walls of the town, which run down to the Moldau, almost as the walls of Rome run from the Vatican down to the Tiber. On the other side you perceive the city, cut in two by the river, which is beautified by an island set upstream, and embraces another island downstream, after leaving the northern suburb the moldau flows into the elbe a boat might have taken me on board at the bridge of prague and landed me at the pont royal in paris 
I am not the work of the ages and kings. I have neither the weight nor the duration of the obelisk which the Nile is now sending to the Seine. The girdle of the vestal of the Tiber would be strong enough to tow my galley. The Moldau Bridge, which was first built in wood in 795 by Manata, has been rebuilt at different times in stone. While I was taking the measure of this bridge, Charles X was walking on the pavement. He carried an umbrella. His son accompanied him like a paid cicerone. I had said in the conservateur that men would go to the window to see the monarchy pass. I saw it pass on the bridge of Prague. In the constructions of which Franschin is composed, one sees historic halls, museums hung with the restored portraits and the furbished arms of the dukes and kings of Bohemia. Not far from the shapeless masses, there stands detached against the sky, a pretty building decked with one of the graceful porticos of the Cinquecento. This architecture has the drawback of being out of harmony with the climate. I was always preoccupied with the thought of the cold which they must feel at night. If at least one could, during the Bohemian winter, put those Italian palaces in the hothouse with the palm trees, Prague, often besieged, taken and retaken, is known to us, in a military respect, by the battle called after it, and by the retreat, in which Vauvenargue took part. The bulwarks of the town are demolished. The moat of the castle, on the side of the high plain, forms a deep and narrow groove, now planted with poplars. At the time of the Thirty Years' War, this moat was filled with water. The Protestants, having penetrated into the castle on the 23rd of May, 1618, threw two Catholic lords, together with the Secretary of State, out of window. The three divers saved their lives. The Secretary, like a well-bred man, begged a thousand pardons of one of the lords for his rudeness in falling on his head. In this present month of May, 1833, we are no longer so polite. I am not sure what I should say in a similar case, although I have been a Secretary of State myself. Tycho Brahe died in Prague. Would you, for all his knowledge, have a false nose in wax or silver as he did? Tycho consoled himself in Bohemia like Charles X by contemplating the heavens. The astronomer admired the work, the king adores the workman. The star which appeared in 1572 and died out in 1574 and which passed successively from dazzling white to the red-yellow of Mars and the leaden-white of Saturn, presented to Tycho's observations the spectacle of the conflagration of a world. What is the revolution whose breath blew the brother of Louis XVI to the tomb of the Danish Newton beside the destruction of a globe, accomplished in less than two years? General Moreau came to Prague to concert with the Emperor of Russia a restoration which he, Moreau, did not live to see. If Prague were by the seaside, nothing would be more charming, and Shakespeare, striking Bohemia with his wand, turns it into a shipping country. Thou art perfect, then, says Antigonus to a mariner in the winter's tale. Thou art perfect, then, our ship hath touched upon the deserts of Bohemia. Antigonus lands, charged to abandon a little girl, to whom he addresses these words. Blossom, speed thee well. The storm begins. Thou art like to have a lullaby too rough. Does not Shakespeare seem to have told in advance the story of the Princess Louise, that young blossom, that new perdita, transported to the deserts of Bohemia? Prague, 28th and 29th May, 1833. Confusion, blood, catastrophes, composed the history of Bohemia. Her dukes and kings, in the midst of civil wars and foreign wars, fight with their subjects or come to loggerheads with the dukes and kings of Silesia, Saxony, Poland, Moravia, Hungary, Austria, and Bavaria. During the reign of Wenceslas the Sick, who spitted his cook for roasting a hare badly, arose John Huss, who, having studied at Oxford, brought back the doctrine of Wycliffe. The Protestants, who were looking for ancestors everywhere, without being able to find any, report that, from the top of his funeral pile, John sang and prophesied the coming of Luther. The world filled with acidity, says Bossier, gave birth to Luther and Calvin, who canton Christendom. From the Christian and pagan struggles, the precocious heresies of Bohemia, the importation of foreign interests and foreign manners, resulted a state of confusion favourable to lying. Bohemia passed as the native land of the sorcerers. Some old poems discovered in 1817 by Monsieur Hanker, the librarian of the Prague Museum, 
in the archives of the church at Königinhof, have become famous. A young man whom I have pleasure in naming, the son of an illustrious scholar, M. Ampère, has made known the spirit of those lays. Tchelakovsky has spread popular songs in the Slav idiom. The Poles think the Bohemian dialect effeminate. It is the quarrel of the Doric and Ionic. The Lower Breton of Van treats the Lower Breton of Treguier as a barbarian. Slav, as well as Magyar, lends itself to the translation of all languages. My poor Atala has been rigged out in a robe of Hungarian point lace. She also wears an Armenian dolman and an Arab veil. There is another literature that has flourished in Bohemia, the modern Latin literature. The prince of this literature, Boislas Hassenstein, Baron Lobkowitz, born in 1462, took ship in 1490 in Venice and visited Greece, Syria, Arabia and Egypt. Lobkowitz preceded me in those celebrated places by 316 years and, like Lord Byron, sang his pilgrimage. With what a difference in mind, heart, thoughts, manners have we, at an interval of over three centuries, meditated on the same ruins and under the same sun, Lobkowitz the Bohemian, Byron the Englishman, and I the child of France. At the time of Lobkowitz's voyage, wonderful monuments since overthrown were standing. It must have been an astonishing spectacle, that of barbarism in all its strength, holding civilization on the ground under its feet, the janissaries of Mohammed the Second drunk with opium, victories in women, scimitar in hand, their foreheads girt with the blood-stained turban drawn up in line for the assault on the rubbish of Egypt and Greece. And I have seen the same barbarism among the same ruins, struggling under the feet of civilization. As I surveyed the town and suburbs of Prague, the things which I have just told came to apply themselves on my memory, like transfers on a canvas. But in whatever corner I happened to be, I saw Hradchin and the King of France leaning on the windows of that castle, like a ghost overtowering all those shades. Prague, 29th May, 1833 Having finished my review of Prague, I went, on the 29th of May, to dine at the castle at six o'clock. The king was in high spirits. When we left the table, sitting down on the sofa in the drawing-room, he said, Chateaubriand, do you know that the National, which arrived this morning, declares that I had the right to issue my ordinances? Sire, I replied, your majesty is making innuendos against me. The king, undecided, hesitated, then, taking his resolution, I have something on my mind. You dealt me devilish hard measure in the first part of your speech in the House of Peers. And at once the king, without giving me the time to answer, cried, Oh, the end, the end, the empty grave at Saint-Denis. That was admirable, that was very fine, very fine. Do not let us talk of it any more. I did not want to keep that. It's done with, it's done with. And he excused himself for venturing to risk those few words. I kissed the royal hand with pious respect. And let me tell you, Charles X resumed, perhaps I was wrong not to defend myself at Rambouillet. I still had great resources, but I did not want blood to flow for me. I retired. I did not combat this noble excuse. I replied, Sire, Bonaparte retired twice like your majesty in order not to prolong the ills of France. I thus put the weakness of my old king under the shelter of Napoleon's glory. The children arrived and we went up to them. The king spoke of Mademoiselle's age. What, you little doll, he exclaimed. Are you fourteen already? Oh, when I'm fifteen, said Mademoiselle. Well, what will you do then? Mademoiselle stopped short. Charles X was telling something. I don't remember that, said the Duc de Bordeaux. I should think not, said the king. It happened on the very day when you were born. Oh, replied Henry, so it's very long ago. Mademoiselle, leaning her head a little on one shoulder, lifting her face towards her brother while casting a glance aslant at me, said, with an ironical little look, Is it so very long, then, since you were born? The children retired. I took leave of the orphan. I was to start during the night. I said good-bye to him in French, English, and German. How many languages will Henry learn in which to tell his wandering miseries, to ask for bread and a shelter from the stranger? When the rubber began, I took His Majesty's orders. You will see Madame la Dauphine at Carlsbad, said Charles X. A good journey, my dear Chateaubriand. 
we shall read about you in the papers. I went from door to door to pay my last respects to the inhabitants of the castle. I saw the young princess again at Madame de Gontaut's. She gave me a letter for her mother, at the foot of which were a few lines from Henry. I was to have left at five o'clock on the morning of the 30th. Count Chotek had had the goodness to order horses along the road. A jobbing transaction detained me till noon. I was the bearer of a letter of credit for two thousand francs payable in Prague. I had called upon a fat little monkey of a Jew who uttered cries of admiration when he saw me. He summoned his wife to his aid. She ran, or rather rolled up to my feet. She sat down opposite me, quite short, fat and black, with two arms like fins, staring at me with her round eyes. If the Messiah had come in by the window, this Rachel would not have appeared more delighted. I thought myself threatened with an alleluia. The broker offered me his fortune, letters of credit for the whole extent of the Israelitish dispersion. He added that he would send me my two thousand francs to my hotel. The money was not paid on the evening of the twenty-ninth. On the thirtieth, in the morning, when the horses were already put to, came a clerk with a parcel of bills, paper of different sources, which loses more or less on change and which is not current outside the Austrian states. My account was made out on a bill which said, in discharge, good money. I was astounded. What good is this to me? I asked the clerk. How am I to pay the posting and my hotel bills with this paper? The clerk ran off in search of explanations. Another clerk came and made me endless calculations. I sent back the second clerk. A third brought me cash in the form of Brabant crowns. I set out thenceforth on my guard against the affection with which I might inspire the daughters of Jerusalem. My calash was surrounded under the gateway by the people of the hotel, among whom squeezed a pretty Saxon servant girl, who used to run off to a piano every time she could snatch a moment between two rings at the bell. Just ask Leonard of Limousin, or Fanchon of Picardy, to sing or play Tanti Papiti to you on the piano, or Moses' Prayer. Prague, and on the road, 29th and 30th May, 1833. I had come to Prague with the greatest apprehension. I had said to myself, to ruin us, it is often enough for God to place our own destinies in our hands. God works miracles in men's favour, but he leaves the conduct of these to them, but for which it would be he that would govern in person. Now men make the fruits of those miracles abortive. Crime is not always punished in this world, mistakes always. Crime is part of the infinite and general nature of men. Heaven alone knows the depth of it and sometimes reserves its punishment to itself. The mistakes of a limited and accidental nature come within the scope of the narrow justice of the earth. That is why it would be possible for the last mistakes of the monarchy to be rigorously punished by men. I had said to myself also, royal families have been seen to fall into irreparable errors by becoming infatuated with a false idea of their own nature. At one time they look upon themselves as divine and exceptional families, at another as mortal and private families. They set themselves above the common law, or within that law, as the case may require. When they violate political constitutions, they cry that they have the right to do so, that they are the fount of the law, that they cannot be judged by ordinary rules. When they want to make a domestic mistake, to give a dangerous education, for instance, to the heir to the throne, they reply to the protest made, A private person can act towards his children as he pleases, and we cannot. Well, no, you cannot. You are neither a divine family nor a private family. You are a public family. You belong to society. The mistakes made by royalty do not affect royalty alone. They are detrimental to the whole nation. A king trips and goes away. But does a nation go away? Does it suffer no hurt? Are not those victims of their honour who have remained attached to the absent royalty interrupted in their careers, persecuted in the persons of their kin, trammelled in their liberty, threatened in their lives. Once more, the royalty is not a private possession. It is a public property, held in joint tenancy, and third parties are involved in the fortune of the throne. I feared that, in the confusion inseparable from misfortune, the royalty had not perceived these truths, and had done nothing to come back to them at the expedient time. On the other hand, while recognising the immense advantages of the Salic law, I did not conceal from myself the fact that the duration of a house has some serious drawbacks for both nations and kings. For the nations, because it blends their destiny too closely with that of the kings, 
for the kings because permanent power intoxicates them they lose earthly notions all that is not a part of their altars prostrate prayers humble vows profound abasement is impiousness misfortune teaches them nothing adversity is but a coarse plebeian who fails to show them respect and catastrophes are for them but so many displays of insolence i had fortunately deceived myself i did not find charles x in those high errors which take their rise at the pinnacle of society i found him only in the common illusions of an unexpected accident which are more easily explained everything serves to console the self-esteem of the brother of louis the eighteenth he sees the political world falling into decay and with some justice he attributes this decay to his epoch not to himself did not louis says perish did not the republic fall was not bonaparte compelled twice to forsake the scene of his glory and did he not go to die a captive on a rock are not the thrones of europe threatened what then could he charles x do more than those overthrown powers he wanted to defend himself against his enemies he was warned of the danger by his police and by public symptoms he took the initiative he attacked so as not to be attacked did not the heroes of the three riots admit that they were conspiring that they had been playing a part for fifteen years well then charles thought that it was his duty to make an effort he tried to save the french legitimacy and with it the european legitimacy he gave battle and lost he sacrificed himself to save the monarchies that is all napoleon had his waterloo charles x his days of july this is the light in which things present themselves to the unfortunate monarch he remains immutable leaning upon events which wedge in and fasten down his mind by dint of his immovability he achieves a certain greatness a man of imagination he listens to you he does not get angry with your ideas he appears to enter into them and does not enter into them at all there are certain general axioms which a man puts in front of himself like gabions taking up his position behind that shelter he takes shots from there at intellects which march ahead the mistake of many is to persuade themselves according to events repeated in history that mankind is always in its primitive place they confound passions and ideas the first are the same in every century the second change in successive ages if the material effects of certain actions are alike at different periods the causes which have produced them vary charles x looks upon himself as a principle and in fact there are men who by dint of living with fixed ideas alike from generation to generation are no longer more than so many monuments certain individuals through the lapse of time and their own preponderance become things transformed into persons those individuals perish when those things come to perish brutus and cato were the roman republic incarnate they could not survive it any more than the heart can beat when the blood ceases to flow in former days i drew this portrait of charles x you have seen him for ten years that loyal subject that respectful brother that tender father so greatly afflicted in one of his sons so greatly consoled by the other you know him this bourbon who was the first to come after our misfortunes a worthy herald of old france to throw himself between you and europe with a branch of lilies in his hand your eyes are fixed with love and gladness on this prince who in the fullness of age has preserved the charm and the noble elegance of youth and who now adorned with the diadem is still but one frenchman the more in the midst of you you repeat with emotion so many happy phrases escaped from this new monarch who derives from the loyalty of his heart the grace of speaking well where is that one among us who would not trust him with his life his fortune his honour that man whom we would all wish to have as our friend we have to-day as our king ah let us try to make him forget the sacrifices of his life may the crown lie light upon the whitened head of that christian knight pious as louis the twelfth courteous as francis the first frank as henry the fourth may he be happy with all the happiness which he has lacked during so many long years may the throne on which so many monarchs have encountered storms be to him a place of rest elsewhere i have again celebrated the same prince the model has only grown older but one recognises it in the youthful touches of the portrait age withers us by taking from us a certain truth of poetry 
which gives colour and bloom to our faces, and yet one loves, in spite of oneself, the face which has faded at the same time as our own features. I have sung hymns to the house of Henry the Fourth. I would begin them again with all my heart, while combating anew the mistakes of the legitimacy, and bringing down upon myself anew its disgraces, if it were destined to rise again. The reason of this is that the constitutional legitimate royalty has always appeared to me the gentlest and safest road to entire liberty. I believed, and I should still believe, that I was playing the part of a good citizen, even when exaggerating the advantages of that royalty, in order to give it, if so much should depend on me, the duration necessary for the accomplishment of the gradual transformation of society and manners. I am doing a service to the memory of Charles X, by opposing the pure and simple truth to what will be said of him in the future. The hostility of parties will represent him as a man faithless to his oaths, and the violator of the public liberties. He is nothing of the sort. He acted in good faith in attacking the Charter. He did not, nor did he need to think himself forsworn. He had the firm intention of restoring the Charter after he had saved it, in his own way and as he understood it. Charles X is what I have described him to be, mild, although subject to anger, kind and affectionate to his intimates, lovable, easy-going, free from malice, having all the knightly qualities, devotion, nobleness, and elegant courtesy mixed, however, with weakness, which does not exclude passive courage and the glory of a fine death, incapable of carrying out to the end a good or bad resolution, built up of the prejudices of his century and his rank, in ordinary times a proper king, in extraordinary times a man of perdition, not of misfortune. As for the Duc de Bordeaux, they would like, at Fratchin, to make of him a king ever on horseback, ever flourishing his sword. It is necessary, no doubt, that he should be brave, but it is a mistake to imagine that in these times the right of conquest will be recognised, that it would be enough to be Henry the Fourth to reascend the throne. Without courage one cannot reign, but one no longer reigns with courage alone. Bonaparte has killed the authority of victory. An extraordinary part might be conceived by Henry V. I will suppose that, at the age of twenty, he feels his position and says to himself, I can no longer remain inactive. I have the duties of my blood to fulfil towards the past. But am I then obliged to trouble France because of myself alone? Must I weigh upon centuries yet to come with all the weight of the centuries that are done with? Let us solve the question. Let us inspire with regrets those who unjustly outlawed me in my childhood. Let us show them what I could be. It but depends on me to devote myself to my country by consecrating anew, whatever be the issue of the contest, the principle of the hereditary monarchies. Then the son of St. Louis would land in France with a double idea of glory and sacrifice. He would descend upon it with the firm resolve to remain there with a crown upon his head or a bullet in his heart. In the latter case, his inheritance would go to Philip. The triumphant life or the sublime death of Henry V would restore the legitimacy, stripped only of that which the century no longer understands and which no longer suits the times. For the rest, supposing the sacrifice of my young prince made, he would not have made it for me. After the death of Henry V without children, I should never recognise a monarch in France. I have abandoned myself to these dreams, but what I suppose in relation to the resolution to be taken by Henry is impossible. By arguing in this wise, I place myself in thought in an order of things above us, an order which would be natural at a time of elevation and magnanimity, but which would today look like the exaltation of romance. It is as though I were to speak at the present time in favour of going back to the Crusades, whereas we have become commonplace in the sad reality of a deteriorated human nature. Such is the disposition of men's souls that Henry V would encounter invincible obstacles in the apathy of France within and in the royalties without. He will therefore have to submit, to consent to await events, unless indeed he decided on a part which men would not fail to brand as that of an adventurer. He will have to enter into the sequence of ordinary facts and see the difficulties which surround him without, however, allowing them to overwhelm him. The Bourbons held good after the empire because they were succeeding an arbitrary government. 
Can one see Henry transported from Prague to the Louvre, after men have grown used to the most complete liberty? The French nation does not at bottom love that liberty, but it adores equality. It admits absolutism only for and through itself, and its vanity commands it to obey only what it imposes upon itself. The Charter made a vain attempt to cause two nations which had become foreign to one another to live under the same law, ancient France and modern France. How would you make the two Frances understand one another, now that prejudices have increased? You would never appease men's minds by placing incontestable truths under their eyes. To listen to passion or ignorance, the Bourbons are the authors of all our misfortunes. To reinstate the elder branch would mean to restore the domination of the castles. The Bourbons are the abettors and accomplices of those oppressive treaties of which, with good reason, I never cease to complain. And yet nothing could be more absurd than all those accusations in which both dates are forgotten and facts grossly distorted. The Restoration exercised no influence in diplomatic acts, except at the time of the first invasion. It is admitted that men did not want that restoration, because they were treating with Bonaparte at Châtillon, and that, had he pleased, he could have remained Emperor of the French. When his genius proved obstinate for want of anything better, they took the Bourbons, who were on the spot. Monsieur, as Lieutenant-General of the Kingdom, then took a certain part in the transactions of the day. We have seen in the life of Alexander what the Treaty of Paris of 1814 left to us. In 1815 there was no longer any question of the Bourbons. They had nothing to do with the predatory contracts of the second invasion. Those contracts were the result of the escape from Elba. In Vienna, the Allies declared that they were only uniting against one man, that they did not intend to impose any sort of master nor any kind of government upon France. Alexander even suggested to the Congress another king than Louis the Eighteenth. If the latter had not, by coming to seat himself in the Tuileries, hastened to snatch his throne, he would never have reigned. The treaties of 1815 were abominable, for the very reason that men refused to hearken to the voice of the legitimacy, and it was in order to destroy those same treaties that I wanted to rebuild our power in Spain. The only moment at which we again find the spirit of the Restoration is at the Congress of Aix-la-Chapelle. The Allies had agreed to take from us our northern and eastern provinces. Monsieur de Richelieu intervened. The Tsar, touched by our misfortune, and influenced by his leanings towards fairness, handed to Monsieur le Duc de Richelieu the map of France, on which the fatal line had been drawn. I have, with my own eyes, seen that map of sticks in the hands of Madame de Montcalm, the sister of the noble negotiator. With France occupied as she was, our fortified towns garrisoned by foreign troops, could we have resisted? Once deprived of our military departments, how long should we have groaned under conquest? If we had had a sovereign of a new family, a prince at second hand, he would never have been respected. Among the Allies, some bowed before the illusion of a great house, others thought that, under a worn-out authority, the kingdom would lose its energy and cease to be an object of anxiety. Cobbett himself agrees to this in his letter. It is therefore a monstrous piece of ingratitude to refuse to see that, if we are still old Gaul, we owe it to the blood which we have cursed most loudly, that blood which since eight centuries had flowed in the very veins of France, that blood which made her what she is, saved her once more. Why persist in eternally denying the facts? They took advantage of victory against us, even as we had taken advantage of it against Europe. Our soldiers had gone to Russia. They brought after them, upon their footsteps, the soldiers who had fled before them. After action, reaction. That is the law. That makes no difference to the glory of Bonaparte, an isolated glory which remains complete. That makes no difference to our national glory, all covered as it is with the dust of Europe, whose towers have been swept by our flags. It was unnecessary in a moment of but too justifiable spite to go in search of any cause for our misfortunes other than the real cause. So far from there being that cause, had we not had the Bourbons in our reverses, we should have been portioned out. Appreciate now the calumnies of which the restoration has been made the object. Examine the archives of the Foreign Office, and you shall be convinced of the independence of the language 
held to the powers under the reigns of Louis the Eighteenth and Charles the Tenth. Our sovereigns had the sentiment of the national dignity. They were kings above all to the foreigner, who never frankly wanted the re-establishment, and who witnessed the resurrection of the elder monarchy with regret. The diplomatic language of France at the time of which I am speaking is, it must be said, peculiar to the aristocracy. The democracy, full of broad and prolific virtues, is nevertheless arrogant when it governs, capable of incomparable munificence when there is a need for immense devotion. It splits on the rock of details. It is rarely elevated, especially in prolonged misfortunes. Part of the hatred of the courts of England and Austria for the legitimacy is due to the firmness of the Bourbon cabinet. Instead of throwing down that legitimacy, it would have been better policy to shore up its ruins. Sheltered inside it, one would have erected the new edifice, as one builds a ship that is to brave the deep, under a covered dock hewn out of the rock. In this way English liberty took its form in the breast of the Norman law. It was wrong to repudiate the monarchic phantom. That centenarian of the Middle Ages, like Dandolo, had fine eyes in his head, and, if it could not see out of them, was an old man who could guide the young crusaders, and who, adorned with his white hair, still vigorously printed his ineffaceable footsteps in the snow. It is conceivable that, in our prolonged fears, we should be blinded by prejudice and vain and ridiculous shame. But distant posterity will not fail to see that, historically speaking, the Restoration was one of the happiest phases of our revolutionary cycle. Parties whose heat is not extinguished may cry, We were free under the Empire, slaves under the monarchy of the Charter. But future generations, going beyond this mock praise, which would be ludicrous if it were not a sophism, will say that the recall Bourbons prevented the dismemberment of France, that they laid the foundations of representative government among us, that they brought prosperity to our finances, discharged debts which they had not contracted, and religiously paid the pension even of Robespierre's sister. Lastly, to make good our lost colonies, they left us in Africa, one of the richest provinces of the Roman Empire. Three things remained standing to the credit of the restored legitimacy. It entered Cadiz. At Navarino it gave Greece her independence. It freed Christianity by seizing Algiers. Enterprises in which Bonaparte, Russia, Charles V and Europe had failed. Show me a power of a few days, and a power so much disputed, which has accomplished such things as these. I believe, with my hand on my heart, that I have exaggerated nothing and set forth nothing but facts in what I have just said of the legitimacy. It is certain that the Bourbons neither would nor could have restored a castle monarchy or canton themselves in a tribe of nobles and priests. It is certain that they were not brought back by the Allies. They were the accident, not the cause of our disasters. The cause is evidently due to Napoleon. But it is certain also that the return of the Third Dynasty unfortunately coincided with the success of the foreign arms. The Cossacks appeared in Paris at the moment when Louis the Eighteenth returned there, Hence for France humiliated for private interests, for all excited passions, the restoration and the invasion are two identical things. The Bourbons have become the victims of a confusion of facts, of a calumny changed, like so many others, into a truth lie. Alas! It is difficult to escape those calamities produced by nature and the times. Fight them as we may, right does not always carry victory with it. The Scilly, a nation of ancient Africa, had taken up arms against the south wind. A whirlwind arose and swallowed up those brave men. The Nasamonian, says Herodotus, seized upon their abandoned country. When speaking of the last calamity of the Bourbons, I am reminded of their commencement. An indescribable omen of their grave made itself heard in their cradle. Henry the Fourth no sooner saw himself master of Paris then he was seized with a fatal presentiment. The repeated attempts at assassination without alarming his courage had an influence on his natural gaiety. In the procession of the Holy Ghost on the 5th of January, he appeared clad in black, wearing a plaster on his upper lip, on the wound which Jean Chatel had given him when aiming at his heart. He wore a gloomy visage, Madame de Balagny asking him the reason. How, he said, could I be pleased to see a people so ungrateful that, while I have done and am still doing daily what I can for it, 
and for whose safety I would sacrifice a thousand lives, if God had given me so many, it daily prepares new attempts on me, for, since I am here, I here speak of naught else. Meantime the people cried, Long live the king! Sire, said one of the court lords, see how all your people rejoices to see you. Henry shaking his head. What a people it is! If my greatest enemy were here where I am, and it saw him pass, it would do for him as much as for me, and would shout still louder. A leaguer, seeing the king huddled at the back of his carriage, said, There he is already at the cart's tail. Does it not seem to you as though that leaguer was speaking of Louis XVI, going from the temple to the scaffold? On Friday the 14th of May, 1610, returning from the Fuyon with Bassompierre and the Duc de Guise, the king said to them, You do not know me now, none of you, and when you have lost me, you will then know what I was worth, and the difference between me and other men. My God, sire, answered Bassompierre, will you never have done troubling us by telling us that you will soon die? And then the marshal recounts to Henry his glory, his prosperity, his good health, which was prolonging his youth. My friend, said the king, I must leave all that. Ravaillac was at the gate of the Louvre. Bassompierre withdrew, and did not see the king again except in his closet. He was stretched out, he says, on his bed, and M. de Vic, sitting on the same bed as he, had laid his cross of the order on his mouth and reminded him of God. M. Le Grand, on arriving, knelt down between the bed and the wall, and held one of his hands which he kissed, and I had flung myself at his feet which I held clasped, weeping bitterly. That is Bassompierre's story. Pursued by these sad memories, it seemed to me that, in the long halls of Hradshin, I had seen the last Bourbons pass, sad and melancholy, like the first Bourbon in the gallery of the Louvre. I had come to kiss the feet of the royalty after its death. Whether it die for ever or be resuscitated, it will have my last oaths. The day after its final disappearance, the Republic will commence for me. In the case that the fates, who are to edit my memoirs, do not publish them forthwith, you will know when they appear, when you have read all, weighed all, how far I was mistaken in my regrets and in my conjectures. Respecting misfortune, respecting that which I have served and will continue to serve, at the cost of the repose of my last days, I am writing my words, true or deluded, on my falling hours, dry and light leaves which the breath of eternity will soon have blown away. Supposing the high dynasties to be nearing their limit, omitting, however, the possibilities of the future, and the lively hopes that spring incessantly at the bottom of men's hearts, would it not be better that they should make an end worthy of their greatness, and withdraw with the centuries into the night of the past? To prolong one's days beyond a dazzling illustriousness is good for nothing. The world tires of you and your fame. It is angry with you for being still there. Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon have disappeared in accordance with the rules of fame. To die beautiful, one must die young. Do not make the children of spring say, What, is that the genius, the person, the dynasty that the world applauded, for a hair of whose head, a smile, a glance, one would have thrown away one's life? How sad it is to see old Louis XIV find no one near him, to talk to him of his century, except the old Duc de Villeroy. It was the last victory of the great Condé to have met Bossuet by his graveside. The orator revived the mute waters of Chantilly. Out of the old man's childhood he needed again the young man's adolescence. He made brown again the hair on the forehead of the victor of Roqua, while bidding an undying farewell to his white hairs. You who love glory, look to your tomb. Lie down comfortably in it. Try to cut a good figure in it, for you will remain there. The road from Prague to Karlsbad stretched us out through the tedious plains which the Thirty Years' War stained with blood. As I crossed those battlefields at night, I humbled myself before the God of Armies, who bears the sky on his arm like a buckler. One can see at some distance the wooded hillocks at whose foot the waters lie. The wits among the doctors at Karlsbad compare the road to Esculapia Snake, which came down the hill to drink of Hygieia's cup. On the top of the tower of the town, the Stadturm, a tower mitred with a steeple, watchmen blow the horn, so soon as they perceive a traveller. 
I was greeted by the joyous sound like a dying man, and every one in the valley began to say with delight, Here's a gouty man, here's an hypochondriac, here's a myopic subject. Alas, I was better than all that. I was an incurable. At seven o'clock on the morning of the thirty-first, I was installed at the Golden Shield, an inn kept for the benefit of Count Bolzona, a very high-born, ruined man. In the same hotel were staying the Comte and Madame la Comtesse de Corset, who had gone before me, and my fellow-countryman, General de Trogoff, formerly governor of the Chateau de Saint-Cloud, born long ago at Landivisio, within the rays of the moon at Landonneau, and, a squatter figure though he be, a captain of Austrian grenadiers in Prague during the Revolution. He had just been to see his banished lord, the successor of St. Clodald, a monk in his time at St. Cloud. Trogoff, after his pilgrimage, was returning to Lower Brittany. He was taking with him an Hungarian nightingale and a Bohemian nightingale, which prevented everybody in the hotel from sleeping, so loudly did they complain of Therese's cruelty. Trogoff used to cram them with grated bullock's heart, without being able to get the better of their sorrow, at Mestis Latte Loca Questibus Implet. Trogoff and I embraced like two Bretons. The general, short and square like a Celt of Cornouaille, has a certain shrewdness under an air of candour, and an amusing way of telling a story. Madame la Dauphine was inclined to like him, and as he knows German, she used to walk with him. On hearing of my arrival from Madame de Cosset, she sent to me to propose that I should go to see her at half-past nine or at twelve. I was with her at twelve. She occupied a house standing by itself at the end of the village on the right bank of the temple, the little river which rushes from the mountain and flows through Carlsbad from one end to the other. As I climbed the stairs to the princess's apartment, I felt perturbed. I was going almost for the first time to see that perfect model of human suffering, that Antigone of Christendom. I had not talked for ten minutes with Madame la Dauphine in my life. She had addressed scarcely two or three words to me during the rapid course of her prosperity. She had always shown herself at a loss in my presence. Though I had never written or spoken of her except in terms of profound admiration, Madame la Dauphine was necessarily bound to entertain towards me the prejudices of that antechamber gang in whose midst she lived. The royal family used to vegetate isolated in that citadel of stupidity and envy to which the young generations laid siege, without being able to force their way in. A man-servant opened the door to me. I saw Madame la Dauphine seated at the further end of a drawing-room, on a sofa between two windows, embroidering a piece of tapestry work. I entered feeling so agitated that I did not know whether I should be able to reach the princess. She raised her head, which she had kept lowered right against her work, as though herself to hide her emotion, and addressing me said, I am glad to see you, Monsieur de Chateaubriand. The king wrote to me that you were coming. You travelled at night. You must be tired. I respectfully handed her Madame la Duchesse de Berry's letters. She took them, laid them on the table beside her, and said, Sit down, sit down. Then she began her embroidery again, with a quick, mechanical, and convulsive movement. I did not speak. Madame la Dauphine kept silence. I could hear the pricking of the needle and the drawing of the wool. As the princess passed it smartly through the canvas, on which I saw some tears fall, the illustrious victim of misfortune wiped them from her eyes with the back of her hand, and without raising her head said, How is my sister? She is very unhappy, very unhappy. I am very sorry for her. I am very sorry for her. These brief and repeated phrases failed to open a conversation for which neither of the two interlocutors could find the necessary expressions. The redness of the Dauphine's eyes, caused by the habit of tears, gave her a beauty which made her look like the Spazimo Virgin. Madame, I replied at last, Madame la Duchesse de Berry is very unhappy without a doubt. She has charged me to come to place her children under your protection during her captivity. It is a great relief to think that Henry V finds a second mother in your majesty. Pascal was right to connect the greatness and wretchedness of man. Who would have believed that Madame la Dauphine attached any value to those titles of queen, of majesty, which were so natural to her, and of which she had known the vanity? Well, the word majesty was nevertheless a magic word. It beamed upon the princess's forehead, from which for a moment 
it removed the clouds. They soon returned to place themselves there like a diadem. Oh, no, no, Monsieur de Chateaubriand, said the princess, looking at me and ceasing her work. I am not queen. You are, madame, you are, by the laws of the realm. Monseigneur le Dauphin was able to abdicate only because he was king. France looks upon you as her queen, and you will be the mother of Henry V. The Dauphiness discussed no longer. This little weakness, by making her a woman again, veiled the glamour of so many different greatnesses, gave them a sort of charm and brought them into closer connection with the human condition. I read out my credentials in which Madame la Duchesse de Berry declared her marriage to me, ordered me to go to Prague, asked to be allowed to keep her title as a French princess, and placed her children in her sister's care. The princess resumed her embroidery. When I finished reading, she said to me, Madame la Duchesse de Berry does well to rely on me. That's quite right, Monsieur de Chateaubriand, quite right. I am very sorry for my sister-in-law, you must tell her so. This persistency on the part of Madame la Dauphine in saying that she was sorry for Madame la Duchesse de Berry, without going further, showed me how little sympathy there was at bottom between those two souls. It also seemed to me as though an involuntary impulse had stirred the saint's heart, a rivalry in misfortune. Nevertheless, the daughter of Marie Antoinette had nothing to fear in this struggle. The palm would have remained hers. If Madame, I resume, would like to read the letter which Madame la Duchesse de Berry sends her, and that which she addresses to her children, she will perhaps find some new explanations there. I hope that Madame will give me a letter to take back to Blay. The letters were written in invisible ink. I don't understand this at all, said the princess. What are we to do? I suggested the expedient of a chafing dish with a few sticks of white wood. Madame pulled the bell, the rope of which hung down behind the sofa. A footman came, took the order, and set up the apparatus on the landing, at the door of the drawing-room. Madame rose, and we went to the chafing dish. We put it on a little table standing against the stair rail. I took one of the two letters and held it parallel to the flame. Madame la Dauphine watched me and smiled, because I did not succeed, she said. Give it to me, give it to me. Let me try my hand. She passed the letter over the flame. Madame la Duchesse de Berry's large round handwriting appeared. The same operation was performed for the second letter. I congratulated Madame on her success. It was a strange scene, the daughter of Louis says, deciphering with me, at the top of a staircase at Carlsbad, the mysterious characters which the captive of Blay was sending to the captive of the temple. We went back to our seats in the drawing-room. The Dauphiness read the letter which was addressed to her. Madame la Duchesse de Berry thanked her sister for the concern she had shown in her misfortune, recommended her children to her, and specially placed her son under the guardianship of his aunt's virtues. The letter to the children consisted of a few loving words. The Duchesse de Berry invited Henry to make himself worthy of France. Madame la Dauphine said to me, my sister does me justice. I have been very much concerned at her troubles. She must have suffered much, suffered much. You must tell her that I will look after Monsieur le Duc de Bordeaux. I am very fond of him. How did you find him? His health is good, is it not? He is strong, although a little nervous. I spent two hours in private conversation with Madame, an honour rarely granted. She seemed satisfied. Having never known anything about me except from hostile reports, she no doubt believed me to be a violent man, puffed up with my own merits. She was pleased with me for having a human aspect and being a good fellow. She said to me cordially, I am going out walking. I am keeping to the regiment of the waters. We shall dine at three. You must come, if you do not want to go to bed. I want to see you, so long as it does not tire you. I do not know to what I owed my success, but certainly the ice was broken, the prejudice wiped out. That glance which had been fixed in the temple on the eyes of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette had rested kindly upon a poor servant. At the same time, though I had succeeded in putting the Dauphiness at her ease, I felt myself exceedingly constrained. The fear of passing a certain level took from me that faculty for everyday intercourse which I had with Charles X. Whether it was that I did not possess the secret of drawing what was sublime from the soul of Madame, whether it was that my feeling of respect closed the road to the intercommunication of thought, I felt a distressing sterility which came from within myself. At three o'clock I was back at Madame la Dauphine's. 
I there met Madame la Comtesse Esterhazy and her daughter, Madame Dagou, Messieurs O'Hegarty the Younger and de Trogoff, who had the honour of dining with the princess. Countess Esterhazy, once a beautiful woman, is still good-looking. She had been intimate with Monsieur le Duc de Blacas in Rome. They say that she meddles in politics, and tells Monsieur le Prince de Metternich all that she hears. When, on leaving the temple, Madame was sent to Vienna, she met Countess Esterhazy, who became her companion. I noticed that she listened attentively to what I said. She had the simplicity, the next morning, to tell me that she had spent the night in writing. She was preparing to leave for Prague. A secret interview was arranged at a spot agreed upon with Monsieur de Blacas. From there she was going to Vienna. Old attachments made young again by espionage. What a business, and what pleasures! Mademoiselle Esterhazy is not pretty. She looks witty and mischievous. The Vicomtesse d'Agou, a devotee to-day, is an important person of the class which one finds in all princesses' closets. She has pushed on her family as much as she could by applying to everybody, especially to myself. I have had the satisfaction of placing her nephews. She had as many as the late Arch-Chancellor Cambacérès. The dinner was so bad and so scanty that I rose, dying of hunger. It was served in Madame la Dauphine's own drawing-room, for she had no dining-room. After the meal, the table was cleared. Madame went back to sit on the sofa, took up her work again, and we formed a circle round. Trogoff told stories. Madame likes them. She interests herself particularly in women. The Duchesse de Guiche was mentioned. Her tresses do not suit her, said the Dauphiness, to my great surprise. From her sofa, Madame saw through the window what was happening outside. She named the ladies and gentlemen walking came two little horses with two grooms dressed in the scotch fashion madame ceased working looked long and said it is madame i forget the name going into the mountains with her children mary therese curious knowing the habits of the neighbourhood the princess of thrones and scaffolds descending from the heights of her life to the level of other women interested me singularly i watched her with a sort of philosophic tenderness at five o'clock the Dauphiness went out driving. At seven I was back for the evening gathering. The same arrangement, Madame on the sofa, the guests of the dinner and five or six young and old water drinkers enlarged the circle. The Dauphiness made touching but visible efforts to be gracious. She addressed a word to everyone. She spoke to me several times, making a point of calling me by my name to make me known. But she became absent-minded again after each sentence. Her needle multiplied its movements, her face drew nearer to her embroidery. I saw the princess's profile and was struck by a sinister resemblance. Madame has begun to look like her father. When I saw her head lowered under the blade of sorrow, I thought that I saw Louis Cesar's head awaiting the fall of the blade. At half-past eight the evening ended. I went to bed, overcome by sleep and lassitude. On Friday the 31st of May I was up at five o'clock. At six I went to the Moulinbard. The men and women water-drinkers crowded round the spring, walked under the gallery of wooden pillars, or in the garden next to the gallery. Madame la Dauphine arrived, dressed in a shabby grey silk gown. She wore a threadbare shawl on her shoulders, and an old hat on her head. She looked as though she had mended her clothes, as her mother did at the conciergerie. Monsieur O'Hegarty, her equerry, gave her his arm. She mixed with the crowd and handed her cup to the women who draw the water from the spring. No one paid any attention to Madame la Comtesse de Marne. Maria Theresa, her grandmother, in 1762, built the house known as the Moulinbard. She also presented Carlsbad with the bells which were to call her granddaughter to the foot of the cross. Madame, having entered the garden, I went up to her. She seemed surprised at this courtier-like flattery. I had seldom risen so early for royal personages except, perhaps, on the 13th of February, 1820, when I went to look for the Duc de Berry at the opera. The princess allowed me to take five or six turns round the garden by her side, talked kindly and told me that she would receive me at two o'clock and give me a letter. I left her out of discretion. I breakfasted hurriedly and spent the time remaining to me in visiting the valley. End of Book 4, Part 2
Part three of Book four of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume five, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book four, Part three. Carlsbad, first June, eighteen thirty three. As a Frenchman, I found none but painful memories at Carlsbad. The town takes its name from Charles the Fourth, King of Bohemia, who came here to be cured of three wounds received at Crecy, while fighting beside his father John. Lobkowitz pretends that John was killed by a Scotchman, a circumstance not known to the historians. Sed cum galorum fines et anica tuetio, ava, Caledonia cuspide fossus, obit. Cannot the poet have written Caledonia for the sake of the quantity? In 1346, Edward was at war with Robert Bruce, and the Scotch were Philip's allies. The death of the blind John of Bohemia at Cressy is one of the most heroic and touching adventures of chivalry. John wanted to go to the assistance of his son Charles. He said to his companions, My lords, you are my friends. I call upon you to lead me so far forwards that I may strike a blow with my sword. They replied that gladly would they do so. The king of Bohemia went so far forwards that he struck a blow with his sword, indeed more than four, and combated most vigorously, and so did they of his company, and so much forward they pushed against the English that all remained there, and were on the morrow found on the field around their lord, and all the horses tied together. Few people know that John of Bohemia was buried at Montagis, in the church of the Dominicans, and that on his tomb one used to read this remnant of an obliterated inscription. He died at the head of his attendants, together recommending them to God the Father. Pray to God for that sweet king. May this remembrance of a Frenchman expiate the ingratitude of France when, in the days of our new calamities, we appalled heaven by our sacrilege and cast out of his tomb a prince who died for us in the days of our old misfortunes. At Carlsbad, the chronicles relate that Charles IV, the son of King John, having gone out hunting one of his hounds, darting after a deer, fell from the top of a hill into a basin of boiling water. Its howls caused the huntsman to hurry in its direction, and the source of the sprudel was discovered. A hog which scalded itself in the waters of Teplitz showed them to the herdsman. Such are the traditions of Germania. I have been to Corinth. The ruins of the temple of the courtesans were dispersed over the ashes of Glycera. But the fountain of Pyrene, which sprang from the tears of a nymph, still flowed among the oleanders through which Pegasus flew in the times of the Muses. The waters of a port without ships bathed fallen columns, whose capitals lay steeped in the sea like heads of drowned girls stretched upon the sands. The myrtle had grown in their hair and replaced the acanthus leaves. There you have the traditions of Greece. Carlsbad numbers eight springs. The most celebrated is the sprudel, discovered by the staghound. This spring issues from the ground between the church and the temple with a hollow sound and a white steam. It leaps up with irregular bounds to a height of six or seven feet. The hot springs of Iceland are superior to the sprudel, but none goes to seek health in the deserts of the Hecla, where life expires, where the summer's day, issuing from the day, knows neither sunset nor sunrise, where the winter's night, born again of the night, is without dawn or twilight. The water of the sprudel boils eggs and serves to wash plates and dishes. This fine phenomenon has entered the service of the Carlsbad housewives, an image of genius which degrades itself by lending its power to vile works. Carlsbad is the meeting place in ordinary of sovereigns. They ought surely to get cured there of the crown for themselves and for us. A daily list is published of the visitors to the sprudel. On the old rolls we find the names of the poets and the most enlightened men of letters of the north. Gorovsky, Dunker, Weisser, Herder, Goethe. I should have liked to meet with that of Schiller, my favourite. In the sheet of the day, among obscure arrivals, one observes the name of the Comtesse de Marne. It is only printed in small capitals. In 1830, at the very moment of the fall of the royal family at St. Cloud, the widow and daughters of Christophe were taking the waters at Carlsbad. The Haitian Majesties have retired to Tuscany, near the Neapolitan Majesties, King Christophe's youngest daughter, very well educated and exceedingly pretty, has died at Pisa. Her ebon beauty rests free under the porticos of the Campo Santo, far from the cane fields and mangrove trees beneath whose shade she was born a slave. 
In 1826, an Englishwoman from Calcutta was seen at Carlsbad, passing from the Banyan fig tree to the Bohemian olive tree, from the son of the Ganges to the son of the Tettle. She died away like a ray from the Indian sky lost in the cold and the darkness. The sight of cemeteries in places consecrated to health is a melancholy one. There young women sleep, strangers to one another. On their tombs are carved the number of their days and the place of their birth. One seems to be going through a hot house in which flowers are cultivated of every climate, whose names are written on a label at the foot of the flowers. The native law has anticipated the requirements of exotic death. Foreseeing the decease of the travellers far from their country, it permits the exhumations beforehand. I might then have slept half a score of years in the cemetery of St. Andrew, and nothing would have hindered the testamentary dispositions of these memoirs. If Madame la Dauphine were to expire here, would the French laws permit the return of her ashes? That would be a controversial point between the Sorbonnizers of doctrine and the casuists of prescription. The Carlsbad waters are stated to be good for the liver and bad for the teeth. I know nothing about the liver, but there are many toothless people at Carlsbad. Perhaps the years are responsible for this rather than the waters. Time is an arrant liar and a great tooth drawer. Does it not seem to you as though I were recommencing the chef d'oeuvre d'un inconnu? One word leads me to another. I go from Iceland to India. Voilà les Apennins, et voici le Caucase. And nevertheless, I have not yet left the Teplitz Valley. To obtain a view of the whole of the valley of the Tepel, I climbed a hill through a wood of pine trees. The perpendicular columns of these trees formed an acute angle with the slanting rays of the sun. Some had their tops, two-thirds, one-half, a quarter of their trunks, where the others had their feet. I shall always love the woods, the flora of Carlsbad, whose breath seemed to have embroidered the grass under my footsteps, seemed charming to me. I met again the fingered sedge, the common nightshade, the small loose drive, the perforated St. John's wort, the hardy lily of the valley, the white willow, sweet subjects of my early anthologies. See my youth coming to hang its reminiscences on the stalks of those plants which I recognised in passing. Do you remember my botanical studies among the Seminoles, my Kenetheras, my Nymphaeus, with which I deck my Floridans, the garlands of Clematis with which they entwine the tortoise, our sleep on the island by the lake side, the shower of roses from the magnolia tree that fell upon our heads? I dare not calculate the age which my fickle painted girl would have reached by now. What should I gather on her brow to-day? the wrinkles that lie on my own. She is no doubt sleeping for ever beneath the roots of a cypress grove of Alabama, and I, who bear in my memory those distant unknown recollections, I am alive, I am in Bohemia, not with Atala and Saluta, but near Madame la Dauphine, who is going to give me a letter for Madame la Duchesse de Berry. At one o'clock I was at Madame la Dauphine's orders. You wish to leave today, Monsieur de Chateaubriand, if Your Majesty will permit me. I shall try to find Madame de Berry in France, otherwise I should be obliged to make the journey to Sicily, and Her Royal Highness would be kept too long waiting for the answer which she expects. Here is a note for her. I took care not to mention your name, so as not to compromise you if anything happened. Read it. I took the note. It was written entirely in Madame la Dauphine's hand. I have taken an exact copy of it. Carlsbad, 31st May, 1833. It was a genuine pleasure for me, my dear sister, at last to hear from you direct. I pity you with all my soul. Reckon always on my constant concern for you, and especially for your dear children, who will be more precious to me than ever. My existence, as long as it endures, shall be consecrated to them. I have not yet been able to execute your commissions as regards our family, my health having required that I should come here to take the waters. But I shall discharge it immediately on my return to them. They and I, believe me, will never have any but the same sentiments on everything. Farewell, my dear sister, I pity you from the bottom of my heart, and embrace you fondly. M.T. I was struck by the reserve of this note. A few vague expressions of attachment but poorly covered the dryness of its substance. I respectfully said as much, and again pleaded the cause of the unfortunate prisoner. Madame answered that the king would give his decision. She promised me to interest herself on behalf of her sister, but there was no cordiality either in the voice or tone of the Dauphiness. One perceived rather a restrained irritation. The game seemed to me lost as far as my client's person was concerned. 
I fell back upon Henry V. I thought that I owed to the princess the sincerity which I had always employed at my risk and peril to enlighten the Bourbons. I spoke to her frankly and without flattery of the education of Monsieur le Duc de Bordeaux. I know that Madame has read in a kindly spirit the pamphlet at the end of which I expressed a few ideas relating to the education of Henry V. I fear lest the child's surroundings should injure his cause. Messieurs de Damas, de Blacas and Latille are not popular. Madame agreed with this. She even quite threw over Monsieur de Damas while saying two or three words in honour of his courage, his probity and his religion. In the month of September, Henry V will be of age. Does not Madame think that it would be a good thing to establish a council around him to which one would summon men upon whom France looks with less prejudice? Monsieur de Chateaubriand, by multiplying councillors, one multiplies opinions, and then whom would you propose to the king's choice? Monsieur de Villers. Madame, who was embroidering, stopped her needle, looked at me in surprise, and surprised me, in my turn, by giving a pretty judicious criticism of the mind and character of Monsieur de Villers. She regarded him only as an able administrator. Madame is too severe, said I to her. Monsieur de Villers is a man of method, of accounts, of moderation, of composure, of infinite resource. If he had not had the ambition to fill the first place, he would have been a man to keep everlastingly in the king's council. He will never be replaced. His presence with Henry V would have the best effect. I thought that you did not like Monsieur de Villers. I should despise myself if, after the fall of the throne, I continued to cherish the sentiment of some petty rivalry. Our royalist divisions have already done too much harm. I forswear them with all my heart, and am ready to beg pardon of those who have offended me. I entreat your majesty to believe that this is neither a display of false generosity, nor a stone laid by way of provision of a future fortune. What could I ask of Charles X in exile? If the restoration were to come about, should I not be at the bottom of my grave? Madame looked at me with kindness. She had the goodness to praise me in these simple words. That is very well said, Monsieur de Chateaubriand. She seemed to be still surprised to find a Chateaubriand so different from the one who had been described to her. There is another person, madame, I resumed, whom one might send for, my noble friend, Monsieur Lenné. There were three of us in France who ought never to take the oath to Philip, myself, Monsieur Lenné, and Monsieur Royer Collard. Outside the government, and in different positions, we should have formed a triumvirate of some value. Monsieur Lenné took the oath from weakness, Monsieur Roy Collard from pride. The first will die of it, the second will live by it, because he lives by all that he does, being incapable of doing anything that is not admirable. Were you pleased with Monsieur le Duc de Bordeaux? I thought him charming. They say that your majesty spoils him a little. Oh, no, no. Were you satisfied with his health? He seemed to me to be wonderfully well. He looks delicate and a little pale. He often has a nice colour, but he is nervous. Monsieur le Dauphin is very much esteemed in the army, is he not? Very much esteemed? They remember him, do they not? This abrupt question, which had no connection with what we had just been saying, revealed to me a secret wound which the days of St. Cloud and Rambouillet had left in the heart of the Dauphiness. She brought up her husband's name in order to reassure herself. I hastened to anticipate the thought of the princess and wife. I declared, and with truth, that the army had never forgotten the impartiality, the virtues, the courage of its commander-in-chief. Seeing that the hour for walking had come, Your Majesty has no more orders to give me. I am afraid of being troublesome. Tell your friends of the love I bear to France. Let them well understand that I am a Frenchwoman. I charge you particularly to say that. You will do me a pleasure in saying it. I regret France much. I regret France very much. Ah, madame, what has that France not done to you? How can you, who have suffered so much, continue to feel homesick? No, no, Monsieur de Chateaubriand, do not forget it. Be sure to tell them all that I am a Frenchwoman, that I am a Frenchwoman. Madame left me. I was obliged to stop on the staircase before going out. I would not have dared to show myself in the street. My tears still moisten my eyelids as I retrace this scene. On returning to my inn, I resume my travelling dress. While the carriage was being got ready, Trogoff let his tongue run on. He told me again and again that Madame la Dauphine was very pleased with me, that she made no attempt to conceal her satisfaction, that she spoke of it to anyone who was willing to listen to her. 
"'It's an immense thing, this journey of yours,' shouted Trogoff, trying to drown the voices of his two nightingales. "'You will see some results from it.' I did not believe in any result. I was right. They were expecting Monsieur le Duc de Bordeaux that same evening. Although everybody knew of his arrival, they had made a mystery of it to me. I was careful not to show that I was informed of the secret. At six o'clock in the evening, I was rolling towards Paris. Whatever may be the greatness of misfortune in Prague, the pettiness of the life of princes reduced to itself is difficult to swallow. To drink the last drop of it, one must have burnt one's palate and intoxicated oneself with a glowing faith. Alas, a new Symmachus, I bewail the abandonment of the altars. I raise my hands towards the Capitol. I invoke the majesty of Rome. But if the god should have turned into wood, and Rome failed to come to life again in its dust? End of Book 4, Part 3 Appendix The Royal Ordinances of July 1830 Charles, etc. To all to whom these presents shall come, health. On the report of our Council of Ministers, we have ordained and do ordain as follows. Article 1. The liberty of the periodical press is suspended. 2. The regulations of Articles 1, 2 and 9 of the first section of the law of the 21st of October 1814 are again put in force, in consequence of which no journal or periodical or semi-periodical writing established or about to be established without distinction of the matters therein treated, shall appear in Paris or in the departments, except by the virtue of an authority first obtained from us by the authors and printer respectively. This authority shall be renewed every three months. It may also be revoked. 3. The authority shall be provisionally granted and provisionally withdrawn by the prefects from journals and periodicals or semi-periodical works published or about to be published in the departments. 4. Journals and writings published in contravention of Article 2 shall be immediately seized. The presses and types used in the printing of them shall be placed in a public depository under seal or rendered unfit for use. 5. No writing of less than 20 printed pages shall appear except with the authority of our Minister, the Secretary of State for the Interior in Paris and of the prefects in the departments. Every writing of more than 20 printed pages which shall not constitute one single work must also be published under authority only. Writings published without authority shall be immediately seized. The presses and types used in printing them shall be placed in a public depository under seal or rendered unfit for use. 6. Minutes relating to legal process and minutes of scientific and literary societies must be previously authorised, if they treat in whole or in part of political matters, in which case the measures prescribed by Article 5 shall be applicable. 7. Every regulation contrary to the present shall be without effect. 8. The execution of the present ordinance shall take place in conformity with Article 4 of the Ordinance of 27th November 1816 and of that which is prescribed by the Ordinance of 18th January 1817. 9. Our Secretaries of State are charged with the execution of this ordinance. Given at the Palace of St. Cloud, this 25th day of July in the year of Grace 1830 and the 6th of our reign. Signed, Charles. Countersigned, Prince de Polignac, President. Chantelot, Keeper of the Seals. Baron d'Orsay, Minister of Marine. Montbel, Minister of Finance. Comte de Guéron-Ronville, Minister of Ecclesiastical Affairs. Baron Capel, Secretary of State for Public Works. Charles, to all to whom these presents shall come, etc. Having considered Article 50 of the Constitutional Charter, being informed of the manoeuvres which have been practised in various parts of our kingdom to deceive and mislead the electors during the late operations of the electoral colleges, having heard our counsel, we have ordained and do ordain as follows. Article 1. The Chamber of Deputies of Departments is dissolved. 2. Our Minister, the Secretary of State of the Interior, is charged with the execution of the present ordinance. Given at St. Cloud this 25th day of July in the year of Grace 1830, and the sixth of our reign, signed Charles. Countersigned, Comte de Peronet, Peer of France, Secretary of State for the Interior. Charles. To all who shall see these presents, health. Having resolved to prevent the return of the manoeuvres which have exercised a pernicious influence on the late operations of the electoral colleges, and wishing, in consequence, to reform, according to the principles of the Constitutional Charter, the rules of election, 
of which experience has shown the inconvenience, we have recognised the necessity of using the right which belongs to us to provide, by acts emanating from ourselves, for the safety of the State, and for the suppression of every enterprise injurious to the dignity of our Crown. For these reasons, having heard our counsel, we have ordained and do ordain. Article 1. Conformably with Articles 15, 36 and 30 of the Constitutional Charter, the Chamber of Deputies shall consist only of deputies of departments. 2. The electoral rate and the rate of eligibility shall consist exclusively of the sums for which the elector and the candidate shall be inscribed individually as holders of real or personal property in the role of the land tax or of personal taxes. 3. Each department shall have the number of deputies allotted to it by Article 36 of the Constitutional Charter. 4. The deputies shall be elected and the chamber renewed in the form and for the time fixed by Article 36 of the Constitutional Charter. 5. The electoral colleges shall be divided into colleges of arrondissement and colleges of departments, except the case of those electoral colleges of departments to which only one deputy is allotted. 6. The electoral colleges of arrondissements shall consist of all the electors whose political domicile is established in the arrondissement. The electoral colleges of departments shall consist of a fourth part of the most highly taxed of the electors of departments. 7. The present limits of the electoral colleges of arrondissement are retained. 8. Every electoral college of arrondissement shall elect a number of candidates equal to the number of departmental deputies. 9. The college of arrondissement shall be divided into as many sections as candidates. Each division shall be in proportion to the number of sections, and to the total number of electors, having regard as much as possible to the convenience of place and neighbourhood. 10. The sections of the Electoral College of Arrondissement may assemble in different places. 11. Each section of the Electoral College of Arrondissement shall choose a candidate and proceed separately. 12. The presence of the sections of the Electoral College of Arrondissement shall be nominated by the prefects from among the electors of the Arrondissement. 13. The College of Departments shall choose the deputies. Half the deputies of departments shall be chosen from the general list of candidates proposed by the colleges of arrondissement. Nevertheless, if the number of deputies of the department is uneven, the division shall be made without impeachment of the right reserved by the college of department. 14. In cases whereby the effect of omissions or void or double nominations, the list of candidates proposed by the college of arrondissement shall be incomplete. If the list is reduced below half the number required, the College of the Department shall choose another deputy not in the list. If the list is reduced below a fourth, the College of the Department may elect the whole of the deputies of the Department. 15. The prefects, the sub-prefects and the general officers commanding military divisions and departments are not to be elected in the departments where they exercise their functions. 16. The list of electors shall be settled by the prefect in the Council of Prefecture. It shall be posted up five days before the assembling of the colleges. 17. Claims regarding the power of voting which have not been authorised by the prefects shall be decided by the Chamber of Deputies, at the same time that it shall decide upon the validity of the operations of the colleges. 18. In the electoral colleges of departments, the two oldest electors and the two electors who pay the most taxes shall execute the duty of scrutators. The same disposition shall be observed in the sections of the College of Arrondissement, composed at most of only fifty electors. In the other sections, the functions of scrutators shall be executed by the oldest and the richest of the electors. The secretary of the College of Section shall be nominated by the president and the scrutators. 19. No person shall be admitted into the college or section of college if he is not inscribed in the list of electors who compose it. This list will be delivered to the President and will remain posted up in the place of the sitting of the College during the period of its proceedings. 20. All discussion and deliberation whatever are forbidden in the bosom of the Electoral Colleges. 21. The police of the College belongs to the President. No armed force without his order can be placed near the hall of its sittings. The military commandant shall be bound to obey his requisitions. 22. The nomination shall be made in the colleges and sections of colleges by the absolute majority of the votes given. Nevertheless, if the nominations are not finished after two rounds of scrutiny, the Bureau shall determine the list of persons who shall have obtained the greatest number of suffrages at the second round. 
it shall contain a number of names double that of the nominations which remain to be made at the third round no suffrages can be given except to the persons inscribed on that list and the nomination shall be made by a relative majority twenty three the electors shall vote by bulletins every bulletin shall contain as many names as there are nominations to be made twenty four the electors shall write their vote on the bureau or cause it to be written by one of the scrutators twenty five the name qualification and domicile of each elector who shall deposit his bulletin shall be inscribed by the secretary on a list destined to establish the number of the voters twenty six every scrutiny shall remain open for six hours and the result shall be declared during the sitting twenty seven there shall be drawn up a process verbal for each sitting this process verbal or minute shall be signed by all the members of the bureau twenty eight conformably with article forty six of the constitutional charter no amendment can be made upon any law in the chamber unless it has been proposed and consented to by us and unless it has been discussed in the bureau twenty nine all regulations contrary to the present ordinance shall remain without effect thirty our ministers the secretaries of state are charged with the execution of the present ordinance given at st cloud this twenty fifth day of july in the year of grace eighteen thirty and the sixth of our reign signed charles countersigned by all the ministers end of appendix end of volume five